Hey, what is happening, YouTube? We are back with another deep dive on gas masks and hand grenades. I'm your host, Jeff, and tonight we got an esteemed panel of cynic fans, I think, I hope, I believe we are all cynic fans. What's a cynic? And it's one of those people that Ooh, doesn't believe question, what they're being told. So, like, right now, I could be telling you something and you could be a cynic. I don't believe you. I, I wouldn't believe me either. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna jump into this thing, and it's good to have Jimmy back. He was uh, traveling the high. What are they over there? The high what? The high country. The highlands. The Highlanders. He was with the Highlanders over there, and uh, we're gonna talk about that in a sec here, real quick. But let me introduce everybody. I got below me. I got Jimmy from Future Ruins back for uh, and really Jimmy. This kind of we're doing this on your behest a lot. I mean, I love Cynic, and I really realized after doing this how much I really love Cynic, but I hadn't listened to him in a long while. And I know you and I kicked this and Alces, which we're going to try to do, and a few other bands around. I was like, you know, we got to get we got to get Cynic out of the way. We got to do that, especially yeah, with the, yeah. With the I think it's pretty out. fitting to do them right now, just because you know, like they're fixing to do the U.S. tour, and yep. I don't know. It kind of feels to me like this is sort of the end. Uh, so could you know, be. Why not? Could be, yeah. maybe, who knows, hard to know. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll talk about that at the end there. But, um, yeah, so we're kind of doing it uh, at Jimmy's best. He's from Future Ruins. Uh, next to me, that way, hey, I got it. Look at that. Hey. Uh, Necrotic Nick from Thralls of Metal. Yeah. And down, up, below, down below him in this corner, ah, whatever. Uh, we got yeah. Jeremy John from Thralls of Metal, too. It's your first time with me, right, John? At least for something like this, yeah. Doing, I know we've yeah, done doing a deep dive? Like, yeah. live streams, but yeah, it's my nice. first deep dive. Nice. So, um, real quick, obviously, John and Nick are from uh, Thralls, so they, they kind of got a combo stuff there. Let's talk to Jimmy first and find out what's going on. Jimmy, you were over in Scotland, and you put up a really cool video a few days ago that was, wow, man, just, oh, man, just mind-blowing. That, uh, you know, what do you say? It's like... The fact that you got to see some of that stuff had to be absolutely kind of life-changing in a weird way, right? Yeah, it was my first time overseas and uh, spent two weeks uh, all in Scotland. And uh, we basically, it was kind of a trip my father-in-law put together and was uh, really great to just like, uh, you know, include me and the wife and uh, just, you know, take care of everything. And all we had to really do was just kind of show up. So it was kind of amazing. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it's two weeks, uh, just went all over the country, really. <clears throat> Spent a lot of time in uh, Edinburgh, the, the the main city, and then kind of went up north and went, you know, out into the rural areas, into the national park, and uh, just you really saw the saw the whole thing. And uh, uh, shot, you know, a lot of video. And coming back home, it took me like a lot, a lot of late nights to put that thing together. So kind of like trying to get better at the editing stuff. And uh, but I thought I was, I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, oh, so great. that uh, you know checks this out. Go go check it out. It's it's up. I put it up this past weekend and. Uh, about 30 minutes, just kind of more vlog style kind of thing. And I didn't really do like a lot of hiking per se, but it was, uh, you know, just the sightseeing and the different really just cool places that my father-in-law got for us to stay, like sort of like Airbnbs. But Yeah, those were uh, awesome, man. Yeah, you know, but totally like out in the sticks and uh, just really felt like I got to experience the place as a whole. I mean, for me, like, you know, being the first time going to another country, it's pretty surreal. I don't know how much you guys have traveled, but, um, you know, it's just uh, it's, it's such a different feeling uh, over there. And uh, yeah, man, it's just like, it's, it just feels smaller than being in the States and they just feel like they do shit a lot smarter than we do here. I mean, everything's clean and uh, just uh, the people are really cool. The food's really good. I mean, I didn't really have a bad thing to say about that, uh, but you know, the video kind of chronicles all that and shows kind of the different places we checked out. So yeah, highly recommend it. If you have 30 minutes to waste, um, I, I worked my ass off on it. So hopefully well, it's not a waste. First right of all, on. second of all, um, everybody's channels are linked down below so check it out get the future runes through uh that link i didn't link the video itself but i linked your channel and um you uh, i also did like a deep dive of like a lot of the scottish bands as well yeah and i was so gonna say i wanted to yeah. ask you about that did you get any copyright strikes no no it, it, it just said uh basically that the the artist allows uh the music to be played on youtube oh. so I mean, it's, i'm not big enough that i really worry you know it's I mean, it's not like i'm monetizing so i i uh put you know i used uh, uh sayor or sore and uh winter five left uh primarily for the music and um yeah man just checking out some of the other black metal bands that are from there <laughs> and uh just was kind of cool to see kind of their their country and kind of you know hear you know hear where they live in their music and whatnot so 
Yeah, I, I uh, it's it's funny, man. I did that little tribute to Gordon Lightfoot a couple weeks ago when he passed away, and within an hour or so, I got the the video was blocked, and I'm like, what the fuck? And I I get the 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 because I'm like, how is it blocked since I showed videos that were up on other people's channels of his songs, like a uh, Edmund Fitzgerald and Carefree Highway, and I'm like, what the fuck? Here it turns out, I showed maybe six or seven different songs, right? The songs that you would think, Carefree Highway, Sundown, uh, Edmund Fitzgerald, perfectly fine. There was a song there called Don Quixote. It's this little thing. That was the block song. All I had to do was, like, put – they gave me the option of trimming it out or or they would block it for, like, the 37 seconds. I'm like, fuck that, just block it. But the song you'd least expect, like the one that was kind of like the deep cut and, like – who the fuck owes that that they're trying to get money off of that little tiny little bit of thing that, you know, on a tribute video of all things. Anyway, just kind of bizarre. But uh, so you got anything planned other than me uh, keep, keeping you captive for a couple more uh, deep dives? No, I mean, uh, that that last video took it out of me. So hopefully we've got some stuff planned for the summer, but it's going to be a little bit. Uh, I've got lots of, you know, shows coming up, going to L.A. to see Emperor in uh, yeah, June. and. Word. I uh, can't wait for that. Uh, I got the obviously the cynic tours coming, and uh, yeah. there's I'm gonna go see Halloween in a couple weeks. And uh, oh, dude, uh, I saw some clips of that. That mm-hmm. actually looks good, and I'm not a big Halloween. Fan. I'm, I'm not That's a big good. Halloween fan, and I've seen pictures, and I was like, dude, that looks like a fucking fun stage looks show. Like a fun show. Yeah, well, just I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a late convert to Halloween. <laughs> I was just like I'm kind of new to them, but I've, I've been I've been digging a lot of their stuff, especially the new one. Um, but uh, yeah, man, just a lot of shows coming up, and just a uh, big hiking season, hopefully. Uh, things have been kind of rough, you know, just like getting back to work and work's been like taking a lot of my time. So we'll see how things go, but yeah, that's, that's about it right now. Cool. 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 Uh, Nick and John, what do you guys got going? Anything pretty major? I mean, you always have something going, but do you have any big, big uh, items? immolation ranking? Uh, we're kind of having to move back the recording date cause you know, like schedules and such, but, uh, I'm, I'm good to go on it. It's going to. It's going to suck because yep. no matter what I pick, <laughs> someone's going to be like, I can't fucking believe you put that out. And like, because I get it. You know, they're like damn near perfect in my sure. mind. Um, I was outside of that, that last night to the, that guy we were talking to at the show, he was like, yeah, emulation dude. rank coming on. I was like, yeah. <laughs> How are you going to do that? Very Painful. carefully. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, outside of that, Andrew. Reviews, um, um, our 15,000 subscriber yeah. giveaway. Yeah, we got a giveaway for a stack of 10 CDs and Congrats, guys. a lot of good Thank stuff. You. Thank you, man. It's it's been a it's been a fun fucking ride. It's, it's yeah. kind of crazy. Um, I still can't believe we're here. To be yeah, it, yeah it's, it's it's weird, but uh, yeah, kind of the kind of the usual stuff. And then I mean, there'll probably be a bit of a space between immolation and the next ranking because Judas Priest will take forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah block out a whole day. Uh, Jimmy, we got to talk about Al says too. I want to try to knock that out soon. Um, yeah. that's one that we kind of planned on, so we got to we got to work on that. But, um, cool. I mean, you guys always have something going over there, it's like a day you got daily drops, so I'm yep. feeling like I'm doing daily drops anymore. It seems like it anymore, but uh, real quick on my end, a couple things firmed up today and all of it's really based i got something in my eye sorry guys uh hair i think i uh firmed up two interviews today that are going to be kind of unique and off the uh charts not metal dudes not rock dudes not, not kind of not technically even musicians well they are the one guy's definitely a musician but a kind of a different type of musician so saturday at i believe it's 3 p.m <clears throat> Pretty sure 3 p.m. I have Daniel Mensch coming on. Daniel Mensch has done about 120 some albums, no joke. Uh, he's yeah. worked with people like Aaron Turner, uh, Mersbau, uh, Lustmord, you name it, man. He's worked with all kind of found sound people. I don't have a list in front of me. That's why you watch the interview. Uh, very, very cool. He's out in the Pacific Northwest, so we're going to do this on a Saturday afternoon. It could turn into a pretty interesting interview. I don't think it'll just be all about music, so to speak. Uh, John Holm. Okay, yeah, John Holm, that's right. Um, very <laughs> Seems like a really, really cool dude. Check him out, Daniel Mensch. It's, uh, I'll be dropping a, a, a thing on that tomorrow. 
And then this happened very quickly. I'm kind of blown away by it. Um, also in the found sound experimental drone category, I've got Andrew Lyles coming on. Andrew Lyles, I've been into this guy since the early 2000s. He's, again, 81 releases, I believe. He works with Nurse with Wounds, Stephen Stapleton, uh, Hathler Trio, uh, Irrational Expression, uh, fuck, man, Colin Potter, all kind of drone artists. And hmm. I want to talk to these people because it's a different sort of vibe than talking to joe guitar player or joe death metal singer or sure. whatever you know what i mean i want to i want to <clears> do some interesting stuff so that's going to be monday i don't have a time yet on that probably monday probably about five o'clock his time which means probably about noon my time uh i, I haven't firmed that up yet so we're doing that uh the other thing that's coming up i want to hold off on the jethro tall thing till next week um sunday i have the hawk wind thing with uh the hawk, first 10 years of hawk wind First nine albums plus space space ritual for Hawkwind with my friend Melinda. We're doing that uh, at yeah, I want to say eight thirty on Sunday night. I think seven thirty, eight thirty Sunday night. Um, and then the other one that's coming up that I've been there's two that are coming up, two biggies. So we're gonna do this massive panel death fest, which Nick is involved in. I don't think Jimmy, you're gonna be able to do that one, right? It's a Saturday night. What? Yeah, I think oh. that date was bad. Yeah, 27th. <laughs> 27. That's when I'm – when was it? June 27th? 20, no, May 27th. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll be out that weekend. Yeah. So we got Nick, me, my daughter Lauren, Devin, Rick, Dreadful Minutes, Kevin Huffnagel from Gorguts, uh, possibly um, two other sort of luminaries that I don't want to disclose as yet. Because I haven't gotten any 100% firm commitment. Uh, we may also have Chris. Now seems like he's back in. Chris, Metalomania Chris. Oh, nice. And I think maybe Eric Berg. I'm not sure. I, I If I miss somebody, don't worry. I'm working on it. That's the 27th <laughs> of May. And then on the 30th, Tuesday night, I'm finally, finally, finally doing, I think, we're finally doing Boards of Canada. And I'm stoked. So stoked to do Boards of Canada. I'm doing that with my new friend, Ben. Ben, uh, uh, I'm not going to, Steiner, I think is his last name. I'm pretty sure it is. And uh, he and I, and then also my friend Melinda are going to do that. So I think that's kind of what's in the works. And I think that's enough. We need to get into this deep dive, right? I do have one more thing to plug. Exactly. Since, oh, can, since we just got the promotional material for today, um, Miller and I started booking shows after the success of Denver death fest, we figured, fuck it, let's try it here on cool. our own home front. And August 20th, at least the, the two bands I can announce right now, uh, narcotic wasteland and axioma. Sweet. Nice. Yeah. And I think mutilator is going to get on the bill at, uh, Howard's in Bowling Green, Ohio, 15 bucks. So awesome, dude. Yep. Oh, dude. Cheap show. Yeah. Wish I yeah. Could make it out yep. that way. Um, dude, yeah. axioma's, amazing live i've seen them twice three times uh yeah incredible ex-members of a uh, keel hall in there yeah i want someone to do me a little bit of a favor here remember this we start getting into the albums anyone ever heard of i mother earth heard the name but the band no. name no. remind me of that <clears throat> yeah okay. somewhere when we get into uh, i want to say like the eps Remind me of that because I want to go back to it. Uh, I don't want to forget. It's, I'm going to get past my notes on it. So, all right, guys. So, uh, Cynic, I'm going to do a little history here in a sec, but let's first talk about where we came into this band. Jimmy, why don't you go first? Oh, I go way back. I mean, I got Focus uh, when I was in ninth grade, I think 90, the year, what did Focus? Let's see. Focus 93. Was 93. 93. 93. Yeah, I'd have been tenth grade actually, and uh, I yeah I came early on because like when I was you know in high school I was getting uh, you know into death metal, uh, just you know obviously into to the thrash stuff. And a friend of mine uh, let lent to me his uh, three cassette tapes. He lent to me uh, Death Human, uh, Carcass Necroticism, and Deicide Legion. Uh, no, the, the, uh, the deep the debut, not Legion. Uh, that was the first death metal I ever heard was those three. And uh, I mean, changed my, my life pretty much in terms of those three records. I mean, all three of them uh, were really huge for me, but death human especially was, uh, was just, uh, I mean, massive for me. And, you know, looking at the, uh, I ended up going and buying my own cassettes 
at the uh, the Camelot and looking at the the you know the J card and learning about Reiner and uh, Masvidal and seeing that they were in another band called Cynic. And sometime later, I don't exactly remember what it was, but I I found the cassette tape when it had come out. So okay, well, this is gonna have to be good. And uh, yeah, you know, like I, I I pretty much liked it right off the bat. Where a lot of people like you know maybe maybe weren't ready for it. Uh, it took me a lot. Well, I don't want to get too 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 into the focus talk, but um, yeah, man. I mean, just since then, uh, they were a huge band for me. And uh, you know, going through all those years where they were inactive was like kind of one of those things where it's just like, well, they just what they were what what they were at that time, and um, you know, and that's that's what it was, you know. But um, yeah, man. I mean, just very. Uh, very, very big for me at a very early age and uh, shaped my sort of musical perspective of, of uh, you know, kind of, I think a lot, a lot had, had a lot to do with me, like kind of jumping forward a little bit too much being young, like where I was like really into the more experimental advanced stuff. I was skipping a lot of, you know, other great stuff that was coming out that later in life, I would go back to kind of rediscover, you know, in terms of like, you know, the explosion of, of music, uh, you know, and death metal, uh, thrash metal in the nineties that, uh, you know, uh, you know, all the classic stuff now. So, but yeah, I go back pretty far with it. Cool. Cool. Yeah. 10th grade. I keep forgetting. I'm such an old fucking man. I was like out of college already. <laughs> this album came out. <laughs> Almost actually, that's not true. I went, I took a five year hiatus and went back to college and graduated uh, 94. So worked in a factory building model T's. I, I, I actually, <laughs> fuck off, man. not that I'm old, man. Well, close. <laughs> 1960 Corvairs. <laughs> That's close. All right. Yeah. So, um, Nick, what, how about you? Actually, I took a very strange path to this band. Um, I didn't really like find out about them until the uh, Roadrunner United album, and they actually had some members of Cynic on there with you know all the different people that are on there. And I remember reading a review that. Uh, kind of just shit on the fact that they had a cynic member. I think it was Sean Malone played bass in it. I think he was the only one. It might have been some other dudes in there, but I, I think it was just Sean Malone. And I was like, why are they why are they shitting on this band so much? And, you know, like, I was just kind of curious because like that, that seemed like a direct shot. So I checked it out. I checked out uh Focus and I was like, what are they shitting on? This is fucking amazing. And luckily by then they had reissued uh focus i picked it up it was like dude wow this is really different like it, it was like even kind of outside of the scope of stuff i listened to as far as like prog metal too like i i really don't think i'd listened to anything that was uh very jazz fusion before right. like that and right. yeah it was a completely different sound and i was completely into it and then you know you know so they were kind of defunct but then slowly but surely i started hearing that they were coming back and yeah, uh, my interest was peaked, and I was definitely a fan right there. But yeah, I completely missed them in the '90s. I was after everything insanely heavy uh, in the '90s, like you know, give me all the thrash and death metal possible. But like prog metal bands didn't necessarily interest me as much. But yeah, uh, that's that was my weird path to becoming a fan of Cynic. How about you, John? Oh, let's see. I got into Cynic around probably like 2010. Um, it, so it was probably even a little bit later on than most people. I was in a band with uh, Shredlord and uh, from Thralls of Metal. And then uh, Joe, as you may know him. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I was in a band with him. And then uh, a guy that we had on Thralls early on, the Tommy. And we were a three-piece instrumental band who were based on like mastodon and primus and like james brown um okay right <laughs> and, right and it's not like a like an instrumental like prog funk band you know and i wasn't really too big into prog at the time and so to kind of get prepared more for writing songs for the record um shred joe uh said hey man you gotta hear cynic he was like i think you'll really dig it just check it out and so he and our, our buddy Will played Trace and Air for me. And while I won't get too much into that record, I mean, it was just, I was hooked immediately. I was like, this is fucking sweet because I'd never heard the mixture of, you know, say metal with jazz per se. And I didn't know that that was like a possible thing. But I mean, I mean, I was hooked instantaneously. 
Nice, nice. Real yeah. quick, we'll say hi to everybody. Andrew, Cosmic, uh, Paul Bear, what's up? Evan, what's up? Tyler, what's up? Oreo Mixtape, don't know your name, what's up? <laughs> Somebody earlier, N. Martinez asked, will you be including the demos and singles as well? Well, the demos for sure. I told him single, I, they only have one single that I know of. Um, yeah, they, oh yeah, the humanoid one. Fuck. Yeah, I didn't yeah. listen to that. I didn't either. That was a, that was a good the song. song on Carbon Based Anatomy is based on that song. So, hmm. um, Alakazam, I forget your name, dude. You told me, but I forget what it is. What's up, dude? Anyway, so let's get into this. Um, let's talk. Oh, me. Yeah. So, yeah, I got the original Senate, the original 93 Roadrunner issue. Wow. I, um, I don't, <laughs> honestly, I don't, I don't really know. You know, you guys know my story. Well, John, you might not, but I think you, Jimmy and, and Nick do that. I didn't really get into death metal. Until about 2001 with Blackwater Park. That's when it started. That said, I knew about Atheist. I knew about Deicide. I knew about Death. I knew about Cannibal. I knew all the Florida stuff. Uh, I knew about Destruction, you know, Sodom, all that stuff. I knew these. Hey, Bailey, what's up? Sorry, Jordan. Okay. What's happening, guys? Um, I knew these bands, but I just couldn't get past the vocals back then. Back in the 90s. I just couldn't do it. I was like, man, you know, I'm listening to fucking Chris Cornell. I'm listening to Lane Staley. I'm like, yeah, fuck that shit, man. Like, what is this? I just didn't get it. I couldn't get it. So it really took Blackwater Park for me to suddenly go, wait a minute. I'm, I'm shutting out all this great music for the vocal thing. Maybe I'll get used to it. And I did. I got very used to it. Got used to it quick. And I tend to favor it a lot of the time. Interestingly enough, a lot of the music we're going to talk about tonight doesn't have a lot of death metal vocals on it after a certain point. So, um, But Cynic was one of the bands that because I was a Dream Theater guy, because I was a Fates Warning guy, because I was a Rush guy, a Watchtower guy, I, I, everyone's like, no, dude, you got to check out uh, this band Cynic and the album Focus. And so I got it. I don't even remember where I got it. <laughs> doesn't matter. Probably Camelot Music out at the mall. And I threw it in, and I'm like, yes, music is killer, but God, these vocals, what is up with that robot voice thing? What is going on with that, man? That is truly goofy, man. And I, I couldn't, and keep in mind, this is before I started getting into, like, Frontline and Skinny Puppy, which was around 2002, 2003, so I was not, I was not digging it, man. I just, and this one went on the shelf, man, and it stayed there, despite me liking the music. I was like, yeah, vocals always make an album for me usually. So I didn't, I didn't dig it for a while, but I always loved the artwork. I thought that the, the musical approach was fucking amazing, but I just didn't get it. I, I just wasn't smart enough. I know you find that hard to believe. No, that's no. I, <laughs> you're, you're just, no. no. What's that? Go ahead. Hi, you're, guys. You're, you're, yeah. You're just, no, no, you're no. Get your dig in. No. Come on, get your dig in. Anyway, <laughs> all right, so moving on here. So let me give you some quick – That's so like I said, I had this pretty much 90 – probably bought this 2001, so it wasn't when it came – so I didn't get into them in 2001. So this was an original, but I didn't get into them until – this was like after Blackwater Park, this might have been the third. I remember buying Coroner Mental uh, Vortex – and I think I got a creator CD that I don't ever, I, I lost somewhere. And this one. So that's, you know, that's kind of where, that was my death metal education right there. So Cynic is an American progressive metal band formed in Miami in 1987. Later reformed in Los Angeles, California in 2007, where the sole surviving me member, Paul Mas, and this is, by the way, straight out of uh, Wikipedia, so it could be mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, Paul Masvidal re remains to this day. Cynic incorporates elements of progressive rock, alternative, and metal. Their first album, Focus, was released in 93. Cynic then disbanded in 94, but they reunited in 06 and released their second album in 08 called Traced in Air. That was released on the French label season of Mist. The first one was released on Roadrunner Records. They got a seven-album deal, which is kind of fucking crazy. And there's a little story we'll get into about how that all came about in a minute. Uh, they followed that up by an EP called retraced in 2010 and an ep entitled carbon based anatomy in 2011 the third studio album kindly bent to free us was released in 2014 in december 2017 after two years of uncertain future founding member sean reiner confirmed his split from cynic 
Reiner then unfortunately passed away at the age of 48 in January of 2020. Longtime cynic bass player Sean Malone, who was not an original member, by the way, uh, died at the age of 50 11 months later. Mm-hmm. He took his own life, sadly, and uh, leaving just Paul Masvidal as the only remaining original core member. Uh, it was formed, Cynic was formed by frontman Paul Masvidal, drummer Sean Reiner. In 88, the band made their first recording, simply called 88 Demo. After the demo, Masvidal took over vocal duties while continuing to play guitar. The band also added a second guitarist, Jason Goebel, who's a monster, by the way. Uh, another demo followed in 89, titled Reflections of a Dying World in 89. Also brought the addition of bassist Tony Choi. In, 90, in 1990, the group went to the studio to record their third demo, plainly titled 90 Demo, in 91, setting side with Roadrunner and recorded their fourth and final demo known as 91. Um, I think we'll stop there with all that stuff. Yeah, I think we're good there. I did want to note before we dig into this right deeply, because there is some lineup stuff to talk about. Currently, the band consists of Paul, Masvidal on guitar, guitar since lead vocals, vocal order. Uh, Matt Lynch on drums. He's been there since 2015. Dave McKay on keyboards and synthesizer. He's been there since 21. Live, they have Max Phelps from Exists, who plays guitar and lead guitar and, and you know, co-lead guitars and does the backing vocals. He also does the harsh vocals. Uh, also live is Brandon Giffen, who plays bass. And they also... I don't know if this is another, if they have two keyboardists, but there's another guy listed as Ezekiel Kaplan who does backing guitars, additional guitars, backing vocals, and keyboards. I'm not sure about that. I thought they were a five piece, but maybe they're, maybe they're six. I don't, I'm not sure of that stuff. So. Okay, guys, we ready to jump into this? All right. Yep. So the demos, all those demos came out throughout those years, obviously, 88 through 91. But they were released in 2017, I believe, through, is it Seasons? Uh, I think it's Season I missed. Hold on. I don't have it, so. Yeah, I season. got it. Seasons? Okay. Yeah. Uh, that came yep. out. No, before. Century Media. Century Media. Right. Oh, Century that. Media, okay. Uh, that came out in 2017, and that includes all of the demos, plus two alternative versions of Euboric Forms and the Eagle Nature with a different vocalist on. So let's kind of talk. I found one thing interesting about this demo, it, at least – and I'm pretty sure this is right. Does that start with uh, Euboric Forms, Nick? Yep. And it's the 91 demo version, it's right? the 91 demo. Yeah. Then... They go backwards. They start, yeah, they yeah. backwards. Yep. Mm-hmm. yeah, they start with the newest and go to the oldest, which is kind of odd. You'd think it'd be the other way around. Maybe that's on purpose. Um, they sound very different, obviously, in the, the older demo. So who wants to go first? I, I mean, I'm holding it. Why you're not? Holding it. You're, you're, holding it. <laughs> you're holding yours like you always are. So hang on. Let me do this. <sighs> Whoop. That's the wrong guy. There, we there go. he is. <laughs> well, if you want really super attractive older man. Then we'll flip it right back. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. All right. Euboric Forms. Euboric Forms. Um, oh. I bought this demo uh, set when it came out, and I really had never listened to their demos at all like at pretty much it started at you know focus for me and this is vastly different strip out almost all of the spacey effects and all of the clean vocorder vocals and you have almost what i would call like a combination of like jazz fusion and techie death thrash because there's a lot of thrash metal that is mixed in in this like the first set of you know what's right would be the 91 demo the first ones to show up in here of course, you can hear like the more stripped down versions of, you know, at least two of the songs on Focus and hear how outright fucking heavy they are. Uh, Paul doing harsh vocals all pretty much throughout these first 10 tracks near the uh, 90 and 91 demo, vastly different. Like these songs are explosive. And that isn't something I would say to describe Cynic in general. These are riffy, heavy, just. Uh, I don't know, just aggressive as hell. And again, a lot of thrash influence, especially on the 90 demo, which honestly is probably my favorite. That has some flat out just vicious songs and elements you just don't hear, uh, honestly, at any point of their career after this. Like, they are absolutely gnarly. The 89 demo is interesting with the different vocalist. I think his name was Jack Kelly. 
Well, Jack um, Kelly was the original vocalist. Yeah. Yep. He he kind of sounds be, like Kurt Breck from um, DRI. That would be 88. That yeah. would be 88, not 89. 88 or – yeah, there yeah. we go. Sorry, 88. Yeah, he sounds like Kurt Brecht from uh, yeah. DRI. Yeah, and, exactly. And honestly, it's almost like technical crossover thrash or like a bit of death metal mixed in. Like there's some breakdowns that are heavier and chuggier, it's, but – It's very punky and crusty. Yeah, yeah. fast-paced and uh, energetic, like – Honestly, if this didn't say Cynic on it, well, at least like the pictures of it and the disc says Cynic, you know, you got some pretty cool sprawling artwork there that would scream Cynic. Yeah. Uh, I would never guess that this was Cynic. Uh, it's it's that far removed. And honestly, it's fucking awesome. Um, I, I love all this super riffy stuff on here. I love, of course, their proggy stuff, which we'll get into. And this definitely has progressive elements to the songwriting. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, these songs are absolute bangers on here. Uh, especially got pleading for preservation, thinking being cruelty. Uh, what's it? Uh, cruel genility, uh, denaturalized yeah. leaders. Yeah, gentility. That one is the one oh, that uh, Kelly sings on. That he does the back and screams on it. Crushing. Yeah, th this is this is absolutely awesome. And honestly, <laughs> like if they had taken that direction and continue with it, I still think they would have been absolutely excellent. But I'm kind of glad they, you know just kind of retooled it and uh did what they did because yeah the, the next stuff's brilliant too but we ought to talk about that real quick um the the when they okay so when they came out the 88 and 89 demo very crust punky very punky um i hear some thrash in there i don't really hear death metal the vocalist doesn't sound deathy at all no until the, until the 89 one a little bit paul takes over Myself and, and Jimmy were kind of talking about this, man. Both of us kind of speculate. We're like, man, I, I, can that really be Paul on vocals? Like, can it really be? It just doesn't have any sound like it's possibly him. But who knows? You know, he says it's him. I wouldn't think he would lie. And I actually was talking to Kelly today. And I'm like, dude, is that really Kelly on there? He's like, yeah, dude. I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> He's like, yeah, dude. So it was just kind of funny. And we should also mention Kelly Schaefer actually introduced the guys in Cynic. Because remember, they were in Miami. They weren't up in Tampa. They got introduced to the death guys, the atheist guys. They became friends with those guys. Even though, quite frankly, the atheist guys weren't super good friends with the death guys. We already know, as you know, Kelly's talked about that in his interview, that Chuck was really rough on them. Um uh, Kind of territorial and a bit of a, a bit of a prima donna. No offense, Chuck. You, you kind of were, but um, anyway, that Kelly was pretty instrumental in introducing them to the Mars Brothers at Mars Sound, where they ended up recording all all their demos and up until their first album. And then he also introduced them to Monty Connor and Bori Borij. Can't say this guy's name. Borij John Kurjiv, I think it is. Bori Bori Kurgan. What is it? Boyer Kurgan? That's it. Yeah, yeah, he's the dude that owns Blabbermouth. And he's and he was an AR guy for Roadrunners. So he signed a lot of these bands. And it was because of Kelly's pretty much his introduction that the band ended up being signed to Roadrunner. Um, so hails to Kelly. Um, and it should also be noted that Atheist uh, kind of borrowed. Tony Choi at a certain point once they did. Unfortunately, once Roger Patterson died, there was kind of a <laughs> Tony was the only guy that could really fill Roger's space. And at that point in time, yet the guy the the, the atheist or I'm sorry, the Senate guys were not yet at a point that they were going to be able to they weren't signed and they weren't recording the way that Atheist was already on the ascent ascension. So that's kind of the pretty much the story there. And I am going to show something uh, real quick before we get rolling here. Uh, once we get into the, uh, we finish up the demos. I want to show something real quick. Uh, John, how about you, buddy? What's uh, what's your opinion on the uh, the demos? <laughs> well, uh, I'll be fully honest. Up until today, actually, I hadn't even really listened to them before. Okay, um, it, it just it they they skipped me a lot. It skipped me with cynic, um, and uh, like I was saying before the stream started, I might have been a little bit more prepared to fully talk about everything had I not been in a car accident last week. <laughs> so um, that's cool. So no thoughts but, on them then. But yeah, I mean, no big thoughts other than the fact that it doesn't sound like cynic. And had I not, you know, had I not uh, when I looked him up, had I not, you know, made sure that it was cynic, I wouldn't have known it was cynic. 
Yeah, I, that's not hard to disagree with that. Jimmy, what do you got on that, them? I know you had some thoughts. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, it's – it's for anybody that says, like, they're never really – I mean, they've always, like, had some sort of, like, ties into the metal scene with, with you know, where they went from here, even though they've never really quite been a me metal band. But this kind of shows you that they really truly had roots in metal and, uh, and like, really awesome roots. I mean, it obviously shows that these guys were – I mean, monster musicians from the start. I mean, they must have been 16, you know, on 89 for that yep. demo. And yep. there's kind of a clear evolution between 89 and 91 demos. Like you kind of see just a little bit difference as it goes. Um, I mean, to me, like it's, it's, I think it's essential. Uh, it sounds, you know, best, best way to describe it is a, is a, you know, uh, mix of death and atheist with like some thrash influence. And, uh, you know, like, yeah, spot on on the uh, the DRI vocal style. Yes. It's just like, wow, this is, you know, I, I hadn't even heard that in a while. But um, I always kind of more questioned if it was Paul on the uh, the 90, uh, the 91 demo, which yeah. is kind of like the closest thing that you see as that's the stepping stone to focus. Yes. Because there's your bark forms. There's the eagle nature, uh, which both appear on that record. And I, I thought that vocalist sounded a lot more like the guy who was on focus, which I thought was Tony T garden. I could be completely wrong about that, but I thought, I didn't think Paul ever did heavy vocals, but if you look at the liner notes in this, uh, it appears that he did. So I, I don't know, but um, yeah, it just, it just shows you how badass they were just from the start. And like, they mm -hmm. just, it, they, they advanced as musicians so quickly at a young age that uh, it, it kind of makes sense that they just really were thirsting for more as they like developed the band. Uh, this pressing, yeah, uh, I was wrong. I thought it was season of mess at Century Media, but I feel like I read a review with Reinhardt saying that this was not uh, a sanctioned uh, release. This and what the CD that Nick has, which is kind of crazy because mm. I don't think it's really seen any kind of good, you know, releases other than if you got the demos back in the day. Um, it's got the four, you know, the four demos, and uh, the, the I don't know if yours has this, uh, Nick, but the vinyl came with uh, this little seven inch, and this is uh, the demo ninety one with a different vocalist that they had tried out, uh, Brian Deneff. Deneff, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's really, it's hardly essential. I mean, it's kind of clear why they didn't pick him as the vocalist. Uh, not that he was a bad vocalist. He just didn't really fit with the music. I didn't, yeah. didn't sound like, uh, but um, yeah. And then there's the, the pleading for preservation. Like that's the one track on 91 that didn't actually, you know, uh, feature in, in focus. And if anything, it was really kind of, uh, you know, not quite, you know, towards the sound of that, because I mean, you know, when we get into focus, uh, most of the songs in that are really quite far removed from any of these demos. So, um, but I mean, any, any cynic fan, I mean, I don't even think they've pressed this again since they did these. Um, I think not. it's actually a little bit harder to find. Let's show you what a nerd I am. Like, I don't know if you guys remember like back in the Opeth stream, but I used to make my own CDs like back in the late night. Yeah, I remember you showing I, I had all this like live Opeth, CDs yeah. that I made because I had all the, the, the software. So I, back in the day, you know, late nineties, there was no way to find, find these demos. So I, I, you know, you just had to get everything on uh, Napster or, or mm -hmm. audio galaxy or whatever. So I made my own uh, demo CD with uh, all the, all the demos and the live, live songs uh, nice. so that I could have like some sort of copy. I kind of like went all out and dorked out. Oh, oh dude, yeah. that's, that's, that's some nerd. premium dorkage. That's yeah, all totally dork. Dork. <laughs> it looks legit. Total dorkism. I just I had to have some kind of like physical copy of it, and then this didn't come out until what 2016. This this pressing of it, but um, yeah, man. I mean, it's 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 badass, and it shows you that these guys were true metal guys to start with, even though you know where they went was pretty far removed from metal. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, man, it's fun stuff too. Yeah, I got a couple quick notes. Um, your work starts off sounding deathy, atheist, dream theaterish at the same time. Lots of cool guitar chords and textures. Smoking almost holds worthy in solos. The vocals are harsh. The vocals, if this is Paul, he's channeling Chuck as best he can. It's very yeah. Chuckish, yes. okay? Uh, and I'm not saying he's ripping him off. He's just doing his best to get there. It's very thrilling. Yeah. Like, yeah. A lot of that. It's a little bit growlier. Well, that's that's a pure opening track. Eagle Nature, uh, crushing complex drum and bass interplay. Again, this is not uh, Sean Malone at this point, uh, I believe. Can you look this up? Hold on here. Jimmy, look up who played on the 91 demos. Was it Choi? Uh, it's Tony Choi. Tony Choi, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know yep. there's a guy named 
K- Kringle or something like that. Chris Chris Kringle. Yeah. Uh, Chris Kringle. <laughs> Great name, right? <laughs> What's I love the name? cover art too, like the the old the old logo and like. Oh yeah. Like, you DIY. know, you know, we don't even have to ask. We know somebody that has them. I'm sure. We probably know two people. OG Press. OG Press and fucking Ken. I'm sure they own them. Um, Ken probably has them for sure. I'm sure he does. Yeah. So was it Choi? It was Choi. Yeah, okay. Choi was on two. And what was the other dude's name, though? Seriously, what was the other bass player's name? Uh, Mark Van Erp was on Van the Erp. Reflections of a Dying World one. Okay, and that was the uh, 89 one, I believe. Right? Yep. And then, yeah, oh, Mark Van Erp was, was on the original first one guy. Too. Was he the yep. original guy? Yep. Oh, he was. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Eagle Nature. Again, complex drum bass interplay, snaking guitar lines. Solos are insanely techy, but very melodic. Pleading for, uh, what's it? Pleading for, don't tell me, preservation. Really cool. Intro to that is very prog sounding. It's very prog rock sounding. Um, nice. Chris Kringle jamming. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I fucked up. All right. I, I don't know. I thought his last name was Kringle. Van Erp, Kringle, who you would you would make that, you know, mistake. Um, yeah, I really like that one. Again, it's very Chuck-like vocals, ripping track solos, insane. The 90s demos have a slightly thrashier and less techy feel, but lots of crazy guitar and soloing, plus lots of double bass and, and bass drum craziness. Paul's vocals are, again, Chuck-like, deathy, but mixed with a good bit of punkiness, too. There's a little bit of punk element to all this. Oh, I guess I'm up, aren't I? Sorry, Jimmy. <laughs> he's, he's got some good pictures there. Yeah, Dude, you did a good job with this. Yeah, kind of went all right because I had all the Photoshop stuff, and you know, kind wow. of nerd out. You well, know. How old were you when this was happening? Uh, I was probably like, it was like ninety nine. I guess I'd probably been in my early twenties. Were you getting laid around this time? Like seriously? Can't man. He was making cynic <laughs> shit. <laughs> this, this means it got me late, man. You know? Oh my god. Okay. Well, we won't go there. But anyway, um, let's see where I was at. Oh yeah, all three tracks on the '90 demo are really pretty solid. But like I said, there's a a little bit more punkiness than that than '91. Then, then you uh, cruel gentility. I wanted to know because it has a real punk vocal with thrashy angular guitar riffs, and Kelly Schaefer sings the backing vocals on that. 89 demo sound quality dips a bit here. The drums are a bit more boxy at times. In specific, the snare and the bass toms they have a bit of a flat effect. The vocals are again more punk like than death like. 88 demos different vocals. Jack Kelly again kind of more punk. Lots of solid playing here, but a vast different, vastly different sounding band. The vocals aren't even really death metal at all. Like uh, like you said, they're punky, crust punky. Dri drumming most uh, mo- the drumming's the most significant thing at that noticeable. Bass playing is really solid. Guitar is kind of average. It, I mean, it's not where Paul where Paul goes once Goebbels joins, and the next couple years from '88 to '93 is you know light years. Uh, the only song that had a real memorable course was "Weak Reasoning." That has a solid memory oh, yeah. sort of course for me. Um, the un- other thing to notice too is the final two with Brian and F. They're okay. They're from '92. They sound a lot like Matt Harvey to me. <laughs> they just have a real Matt Harvey rasping, sort of horsey, sort of like, ah, you know, that Chuck-like thing on steroids. You know what I mean? I mean, I love that. So <laughs> the ninety ninety one demos are worth owning, but the other stuff is kind of mad to me, just to me. I'd give it a 6 out of 10. It's not critical owned, but I think they're definitely worth grabbing. And, and like, I would want to own this. I just wouldn't spend a crazy amount of money on it because I'd probably only listen to it occasionally i don't think it's something that i would throw in a lot um anybody else graden or you guys um i mean uh i i would honestly give it like for me like three and a half close to four i i love these demos i mean i i well i like death and thrash metal and hearing the side of uh cynic which you never do again uh, it really stands out. I, mean, I think the demos are pretty excellent. You get a good, clear evolution. I'm, I'm talking about like you know the collection as is. I bought yeah. it new. I don't know what it's going yeah. for now, but uh, it's worth it. It's so worth it to hear a completely can, different side of the band. I think you can still get it on. Um, I think I saw it on on Seasons of Mist. I think uh, even though it's not on them, I think I saw it there as listed under Cynic. I could be wrong. Um, no, I think they have copies. I know they had cassette tapes uh, for it. But I don't know if you can still get the vinyl or the CD. I mean, I'm sure it'll get. Probably the vinyl might be a rough, a rough go. But but the CD, I think you can. Um, 
Yeah, so there you go. That, there you have it. I mean, are they critical to own? For me, no. But for the other guys, sounds like, yeah. Uh, well, Johnny's kind of decided he hasn't had a chance to listen to him. But sounds like right. Jimmy and both Jimmy and uh, uh, You'd like it. Nick are on board with uh, owning them. So, yeah, okay. like I said, I skimmed through it today. I mean, it was cool. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, de- and the other thing to note, too, about them is they sound pretty good as demos. They, they don't, yeah. especially the mm-hmm. 90, 91, 92. I'm sorry, the 91, 90, and 89 ones. The 88 ones, again, the drums are probably the only thing that's a little bit sort of not great on it, but they still I mean, sound really tight. They're well done. Yeah. Yeah, I would really say the 1990 demo is the one to listen to to really get a feel for what they were like in their metal years. You know, the right. one leading up, the one leading up to, you know, the, the focus stuff is, is yeah. really like, and that's where they really had kind of honed their technical chops. I mean, Reinhardt's got the double bass, like screaming on that thing. Mm-hmm. It's just like, he was already a killer, yes. you know, yeah. but very tasteful. I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's blast beats though. It's yeah, more, it's more like deep, no, like yeah, thrashy. It's more, finessed. It's more yeah. finessed for sure. Okay. So we're moving on to this one right here. I'm just going to show you that that this is an OG roadrunner. I, again, I don't know where the hell I got it or when I got it. Very early 2000s, probably. Um, that came out September 14, 1993. Recorded at Morris Sounds. Uh, the last one they would do there, I believe. And labels Roadrunners. Uh, producer Scott Burns. Everybody should know who Scott Burns is, man. He's done, you know, legendary recordings. Atheist, Obituary, Cannibal, all those dudes. Um, after years of being hailed as a promising act in Florida's death metal scene, Cynic recorded Focus. Result was an album combining their love of death metal with other influences, notably jazz. Instead of choosing the brutal, hard hitting approach to metal like most of their contemporaries, Focus takes an experimental stance to music. Music features a hoarse, guttural, growling vocal style provided by keyboardist Tony Teagarden. Lead singer Paul Masvidal said he was in danger of losing his voice at the time and thus did not perform the harsh vocals himself. As a result, Masvidal recorded his own vocals using a vocoder giving his voice a synthesized robotic quality. Um, the I just want to double-check one thing here. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it's a short album, man. It's only 35 minutes, 57 seconds. Do you have the reissue with the bonus tracks, Nick? Uh, you, have the, <laughs> you have the bonus tracks? Yep. Uh, it's Well, the bonus tracks are uh, the 2004 remixes of Vail yeah. Uh, I'm but a wave to, and how could I? And then you have that one long uh, song. Cosmos, Circles Gone, and Endless Endeavors, which would end up being uh, Portal tracks. Right, Portal tracks, yeah. So we'll talk about Portal in a minute here. Um, I guess, uh, Nick, we'll let you go first since we were doing that. <clears throat> um, legit, I don't think anything in 1993 sounded like this. This is such a wild album just in terms of like venturing out into kind of uncharted territory. Again, you have like, you know, some death metal influences, you know, definitely still there, but the progressive elements with the sweeping synths and the vocal order vocals and the, honestly, one of the best rhythm sections in metal uh, with Sean Reinhardt and Sean Malone doing these amazing fucking drum fills and accents and the, just otherworldly bass playing from Sean Malone. Like, honestly, that's surprisingly one of the things that stood out to me even more coming back to this is how much Sean Malone just accents everything. His bass playing is absolutely beautiful. But song construction is wild. It's very fluid, though. And that's kind of the thing I love about this. It's, you know, Sean Reinhardt's playing kind of, it's crazy and kind of hard to follow sometimes, but it's very fluid. Like, when it transitions over... You kind of just move over with it, but just how unique this sounds, even in terms of like prog, even yeah. in terms of like a lot of stuff that comes out now, because there's definitely a you know a fuck ton of cynic worship bands out there, but very few sound exactly like this. The riff work is great; it has good heavy moments in here. Like I really dig. Um, God, was it uh, the Eagles' nature? I thought was a bit heavier track, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, you broke forms, of course. You broke forms just absolutely rips. And, oh, uh, God, what was the other one I had listed here? Oh, uh, I'm But a Wave. Love the clean to heavy dynamics on there. There's really cool, like, just flat-out jazzy breakdowns that just kind of yeah. swell in and swell out. It's just, I don't know, how this album flows is 
absolutely remarkable and legit. Nothing sounded like this. And I don't think Roadrunner really promoted this very well. Like this came, kind of came at a time where they were kind of like shuffling off a lot of uh, more extreme bands for like, you know, the groove metal trend and what would follow that. And I think despite them being signed to a seven album deal, I think they didn't have much stock in them just because they could kind of sense the, you know, tide was changing, changing in terms tide, of metal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like, I mean, at this point, like what, um, immolation had already been shuffled off. Uh, <laughs> DSI was dreading their decision, signing a seven album contract too. So it was a weird point and Gore uh, got, got blown out. Yeah. And honestly, there really wasn't like a place for this yet. It was kind of that unique. So, you know, it, it may have taken a lot of, you know, some people, some more time to get into like, you know, the weird vocals, the strange music, but this is a fucking stone cold classic in my mind, in terms of uh, progressive metal. Like this is, I would say a landmark album uh, just in terms of like uh, the fusion of different styles, the playing, it's all fucking next level. Like there's still shit in here. I don't fucking understand, but I know <laughs> I dig it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's well, absolutely amazing. It's like you said, I think Jeff Wagner, you guys know who Jeff Wagner is um, from metal maniacs. And he wrote uh, destination onward. And he's written the book, you know, of, boy, he's writing a boy Bob book right now. Uh, Radical research. He, he said, like you did, Nick, nothing sounded like that then. And really, in a lot of ways, nothing sounds like this band even currently. There's a lot of imitators, but nobody's really, especially that album focus, nobody really nailed what was going on there. Except I would say the only band that was in the neighborhood was Atheist. And yep. Atheist was a little different unto itself. And granted, they were first. They were there before Cynic, but they weren't doing... I don't think they were doing as good as the drummers were for, for Atheist. Steve, uh, what's his name? Flynn? I think it's uh, Flynn. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, they they aren't Sean Reiner. That's number one. Number two, um, I think that that obviously they, they weren't mixing any clean vocals in with anything either, What which Paul was doing. There was just something about this album that was wholly unique, and that – you know, you said basically what 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 Jeff Wagner said, which was nothing sounded like that then, and nothing really still sounds like it. Like that was the first thing that struck me was this: the, the they they took none of the real death metal tropes of the cannibals and the deaths and all that stuff. They yes, could you say? Well, I hear a little bit of human there. Well, of course, because those guys yeah. play on human. Yeah. In a, in a, well, I mean, even like thematically. Like their imagery is different, right? Uh, their uh, lyrical themes are more like almost like existential, existential, cosmic, AC, cosmos yeah. stuff. Like you know, it, it it wasn't like even in terms of extreme metal in general, whether you know your death metal, grindcore, black metal, etc. They weren't like the negative, dark sounding ones. They were more mystifying, Mystif mystical. Yeah, Jimmy, you ready to jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, oh, wait, I mean, uh, was that you and John or? Sorry about that. Oh, you're good, buddy. Um, so yeah, I didn't because of the way I was introduced to Cynic when I first heard this album, I was like, I don't really like this. Like, I I I didn't because it was missing so many elements of the, the things I liked about the progression of this band that I was like, what is it? So I threw it down and then I didn't touch it again until we did the death ranking. Because wow. <laughs> Because when we were going through, you know, human and stuff like that, I was like, well, maybe I should go back. And, you know, now that my tastes have changed and now that I'm more into different kinds of music, I was like, maybe I'll like this more. And when I went back to it, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> um, it was just such a, a, a perfect mixture of, of heaviness. And the man, I love I, I will always absolutely love Cynic's like spacey fucking jazzy type music like it just flows like fucking butter um and i know we commented on sean malone's bass playing style holy shit that guy could play fucking bass goodness gracious yeah. and like nick said there was just nothing like this at the time like if you you know if i went back to the 90s like i didn't know anything like this even existed back then 
Um, and it's such a, a, a stark contrast to what else was available. Like there's just nothing, there's nothing that sounds like this record. No, and I mean, now, if you, if you want to compare, I mean, you know, erosion of sanity is pretty fucking wild and out there, but mm -hmm. it's, it's far more angular and dissonant. This is a lot more flowing. Yeah. Melodic. Not that erosion doesn't have its moments of melodic melodicism, but focus is extremely melodic throughout. Yet, yeah. It's still this miasma of weirdness that yeah. shouldn't yep. work together. These things shouldn't go together, but they do. And they, they create this. I mean, they really, they kind of created their own genre. They created their own mm -hmm. thing. You yeah. know? Yeah. Like, and, and that was another question. Like, is this when, when fusion became like mainstream, I guess. Well, there was always jazz fusion and metal before. Right. I mean, there, you know, yeah. But like, but you like had, done with this level of technicality and precision. I, I'll tell you what this, like. and I don't know if you guys know this band much, but, um, oh, God damn it. Now I'm fucking right. But Maha Vishnu, okay. Maha Vishnu Orchestra was kind of the, the melding with John McLaughlin and um, Tony. Um, oh, shit. I'm forgetting his last name, the drummer. You know who the drummer is, Jimmy? Oh, he dipped out. Oh, he's there. No, I forgot the name. Yeah, McLaughlin's the only guy I know from. from oh, from shit. Him. I'm forgetting their name. Some, one of the guys in here will tell me. Um, hmm. But that was kind of the first me me mixing and melding of jazz, fusion, and even a bit of metal or hard yeah, rock. rock. Yeah. Yeah. And and they were kind of Billy Cobham. Thank Billy you. Billy Cobham. Yeah. Uh, um, I forget that. Shit. I said Tony. I was thinking Tony Williams, but it's Billy Cobham. Um, and so you had this kind of, you have a lot of Mahavishnu and Holdsworth and, you know, pro progressive stuff like UK and stuff like that in the, the recipe for focus, but it doesn't really sound like any of those things. It's just, you can tell they're borrowing a little bit from it if you know that style of music. So that was what was so unique about this. And like, as far as bringing fusion into metal though, John, yeah. As far as like death metal or more extreme metal, that's certainly a possibility. I would, I would think. Yeah. 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 Cause man. And then, you know, of course now you can hear so many bands that have drawn from this. Oh like, yeah. Oh man. Obscura, so many people. Alkaloid, yep. all those, all oh, those yeah. back that bands. Yep. Yep. Origin. I mean, there's so many of them, you know, Yep. Um, yeah, dude, the uh, Eagle Nature, again, being a little bit heavier. And um, I'm I'm but a wave, too. I really, really, really just like that track in its entirety. That dreamy intro. Yep. Um, it gets a little primacy, and then it gets heavier. And then they just fucking jam. I love it. Um, and the instrumental textures, I think, is a, a great offering. Yeah, when the band yeah. Pictures got yep. their name. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I was it's, forgetting. Uh, um, good band too. Jimmy, yeah, right. Uh, oh, I love Textures. Yeah. Oh man, I miss them. I miss them too. Yep. You had Rick Laird on bass for Mahavishnu. Uh, Jerry Goodman on um, violin. He was incredible. So, if people don't know, and Jan Hammer came in later and started doing keyboards in addition to Billy and McLaughlin. If you do not know Mahavishnu, man. Go check out the Firebird Suite, um, hmm. you know, and well, also Birds of Prey and Birds of Prey, the Inner Mounting Flame, Inner Mounting that Flame. That's the one. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And um, the other one to check out too would be um, Return to Forever. Yep, with Al Al and yep. Electric Warrior. Man, yep. so good, man. So Camel. Good. Yep. Camel's not really Camel's a great prog band, but I wouldn't put them in the the. That square, I wouldn't put them in with the Mahavishnu and no, and they're they're way more prog. They're yeah, more they're, yeah. Mahavishnu and and um, uh, Return to Forever, very very fusion man. Very weather fusion. weather report as well. Weather report is Joey Zuano, who was with Miles for Bitches Brew. Yeah, man, you know so Bitches Brew coming up, gonna be doing a Bitches Brew thing too soon. So, all right, uh, Jimmy. To you, sir. Oh, I didn't ask. I don't I, like. Yeah, are you guys ahead. not grading them? Oh, um, oh, it, it's a solid four and a half. Boring oh, yeah. on five. It's, like it's it's yep. an amazing album. Yep. 
I I think it's I think it's fucking musical genius and and the progression in their fucking musicianship coming from you know ninety one to fucking ninety three holy shit yeah man pretty, pretty crazy but you could tell on the ninety one demo that suddenly something had kicked in that they were practicing a lot well, not right. so much Sean but 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 Paul. And then obviously, you know, Tony, Tony Choi no slouch on the bass. Dude's a fucking monster. Sure. But Sean Malone just had this melodicism oh. in his playing, the fretless stuff that he it, did. Man. Very unique, very unique. It's stuff. so Try pretty. It. All right, let me cover my camera here for a second. Let my <laughs> hold on. Go. Yeah, Malone. Um, I mean, it's crazy how they got him into the band because he. Uh, Yep. He was just like an, he was just like an engine. I think he was just like an engineer at more sound and like, they didn't have anybody. And they were like, well, check this guy. I and mean, that was just like a marriage in heaven, you know, to find Malone to do the pace. It was like the perfect guy. Um, yeah, man. I mean, like if, if I know you guys probably got the question before, like what's your favorite album of all time. And that's like a pretty impossible question to answer, you know, because we, I mean, I know you guys, I know the amount of shit that you guys listen to, um, you the know, we have so much hemispheres. Stuff. The answer yeah, is well, <laughs> maybe, maybe you can easily say it. Um, I'm, I'm on, just certain days, on certain days, I might pick that, but yeah. I mean, if you had to hold my feet to the fire, I could probably easily pick this as my favorite. Yeah. Um, just because hmm. it's been in my life for so long, and and uh, you know, like I was kind of you know, I was talking about how we got into the band, you know, in 10th grade for me. Uh, this was such a I remember at the time, like. I instantly loved it. I, I had a hard time with the vocoder at first because uh, it just was a little weird, but I got it past it, you know, because everything else was so badass that it didn't really bother me. I was just like, yeah, that's what it is, whatever. Of course, eventually come to love it. And it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, unique to this album in the way that the vocoder sounds. Um, but uh, just I, for me, like, and I've talked about on the, like Marty's thing, like escapism, this was like the ultimate in escapism mm -hmm. for me. Uh, as, as, a, as a high schooler, you know, I went to Catholic school, all boys, you know, uniform, uh, this record, especially, you know, all the other stuff around the time. But I mean, this was just that album that allowed me to just like kind of let my mind wander and, and kind of leave, you know, this plane of existence sort of just as a young person. And uh, that that had a profound effect on me, like kind of going forward. And, uh, you know, not only that, but just like this time, I mean, this time was so special uh, not just, you know, the fact that this was so much different than everything else that was coming out, but just so many classic albums and just a feeling like to go to the store and buy the cassettes at the time and get into all this shit. It was everything was so like, like not not just cynic. I mean, this was just like the icing on the cake for me, but like all the bands at that time, you know, getting into things like Carcass and Death and, you know, all the bands. Uh, I mean, all of that stuff was just so like otherworldly to me i was like it, it didn't feel like this, these were like human beings doing this stuff like listening to necroticism like i just remember being like what is this man this is just unreal and like the, there's melody and it's just like it's real musicianship you know this isn't just like some bullshit you know and then you have this this is like accomplished amazingly accomplished at the time i was you know i was sort of a drummer at one point and like you know hearing reinert i still to this day listen to certain stuff on this and and can't really quite picture in my head how he's doing I, like some of the hi-hat stuff he does john i know you're yeah. a drummer and yeah and, uh, here's the thing here's the thing paul is 22 when this album comes out reinert's 21 right think yeah well, ridiculous. think about yeah. that i mean it's in i mean at that point they've really like completely developed their musical voice at so young mm -hmm. and like but you know just like going back to reinert i mean i think Overall, the band obviously created a unique style that's never been uh, never been replicated, I don't think. And that's what's so amazing about it, even though you you do find bands that take a lot of influence have never really quite hit what they feel like. But um, just but like going back to Reinhardt, I mean, like, I think he used like a combination of like acoustic drums and there were some electric drums and electronic drums in there as well. Uh, like he had some pads. I remember seeing pictures back in the day where he had the, like the big pads set up. Um, but like, man, the hi hat shit that he does, like he developed, he he took all that jazz fusion stuff they were listening to, and really like developed his own like voice for the drums. Um, you know, just like the, I mean, the hi hats are are the, are the are the most notable feature of his drumming. But like the way he like kind of moves around the kit, like moving around the toms, like mm -hmm. all the like how he kind of bounces back between the toms and the snares. He's got this way that he does that that uh, I just never really heard drummers really replicate that even today it's just it's just wholly unique to his you know his tony play. williams have you ever 
Do you know okay. Tony Williams? Tony Williams Lifetime? I don't think so. You got to listen to that album because I hear a lot of Tony Williams in him, man. Just that mm-hmm. effortless flow. There's a flow to the way he plays. Yeah, real. There's a lyricism. There's a lyricism to the way he plays. It's almost like he's playing the drums like a melody, like a vocal melody. And then yeah. well, and then the ghost notes and all the accents and stuff like that. Crazy, crazy. I think I think he and Gavin Harrison took notes from the same book. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Gavin, Gavin Harrison play. Yeah. Like, Gavin's a monster. You, you're yeah, right. Have you? Do you ever watch? Um, the uh, you're, I'm sure you've YouTube Sean Reiner. There's not a lot of stuff out oh. there, but if you go back to, um, like, um, when he did Carbon Based Anatomy, there's a a bunch of drum cam footage from that record. Have you seen where his hi hat sits? Yeah, it's like it's right not there. like yeah, it's like right fucking there. Like instead of sitting off to the side, he's not playing like crossover. I think having it where he had it in relation to his fucking snare drum, I think helped with a lot of that. Just for the yeah. positioning. I don't know. That that's yeah. always been my guess. No, and I think I think what he did there is he had the double bass, uh, like the double kick uh, pedal, like in, and yeah. he had the hi hat pedal, like in the like sort of to the right of the left double kick yep. pedal. So he yep. like right in the middle. Over. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I think it would make that switch over a lot easier. And I think just having it there without having to cross over and being able to go you know left and right hand with it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that would help a lot. But I mean, yeah. he he, Jesus, man. Yeah, I mean, his uh, hi hat work is on. we got to move on because we'll be here yeah. all night. Uh, <laughs> just just uh, alone. Let's <laughs> go. Um, Sorry. Yeah, dude, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I could I could talk all night about this album. I mean, it's just uh, it's pretty much perfect from start to finish. Let um, me guess yeah. 10 out of 10. It is, man. I, I wouldn't have anything out of I would not change anything about about this, you know, more so than other 10 out of 10s I've said, you know, but like the fact that they like, and, and the other thing is, is like, they, you know, you know, they disappeared right after this. You're talking about like, it wasn't uh, really marketed. I mean, it, it stood the test of time. It came back, people <clears> discovered <throat> it. I mean, think about it. They were, they tried to tour and they were sandwiched in the middle of cannibal corpse and sinister. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I don't know. Yeah. There's, there's, there's so much uh, to be said. Uh, about this album and and what they what they accomplished with it, but uh, yeah, man. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, cool, cool. I um, I'll go through a a quick rundown here. Um, I recall when I got this album, like I said, when we started out, I just didn't quite get it. I got the musicianship, but in a weird way, you know, this is nine ninety three. So I'm trying to remember when did Dream Theater's Images and Words come out 92. I think that was like 92 or one. Okay, yeah. 92, 93. Yeah. So this comes out right around awake or right around images word. And I was I was totally into that, right? I was totally into that crimson glory. Uh, you know, all that shit. By the way, did you know Midnight died, Nick? I don't know. Oh, yeah, no, I, I heard about that. Uh little, little he's been dead bird, for think, almost like called a starling, 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 spark, something like that. I don't know. Anyways, um, so I was into that stuff, but the vocal stuff was still a struggle for me. I was still, you know, acclimating to the the vocals. And I will say, Tony Teagarden's vocals on here really like them. They're cool. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, I don't know whatever happened to him. Did he go anywhere else? What did he do? Monstrosity? He did some touring with Cynic. I, he, I mean, he did all the growls and the keyboards for them for a while. Okay. If you watch, if you can look, you can find all those old shows on. Uh, okay. On but I just didn't know if he was still around or with anybody or what happened to him. So. Um, didn't look that up, but, uh, but he's great. Uh, the guitar playing, man, holy fucking shit. Mm-hmm. Paul and Goble, man, Jason, holy fuck. This, this is a potent pair. This is not obituary. This isn't cannibal. I know cannibal are good and they're technical, and everything, but they're not this good. Um, this is, this is almost like having two John Petrucci's in the band. Um, it's, it's pretty, now, granted, it may, except for tasteful, they're not playing 8,000 notes like Petrucci used to do back then, which a lot of that I still like. But um, just an incredible, incredible, incredible combo there. And then Sean Malone, man, just the secret sauce. Him and Reiner playing together, the Sean's just, you know, it may, I don't know. I really don't know that there's a better, uh, that there's a better rhythm section in metal or death metal at that point true magic man yep yeah really the anchor of that band yeah like yeah yep. and the thing that allowed them to allow paul to do is he 
he was able to ex uh, uh, explore kind of different sort of arrangements. Not all these songs are not verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. They're not like that at all. Yeah. But Bail Maya might be the most mainstream song that's on the album. Maybe. That's why it. I have a hard time calling this a prog album. I mean, it is a prog album, but it's like it's it's not like Wankery. It's like it's not like ten minute songs. It's no. just right to the point. Nope. I mean, it's good songwriting. It's streamlined. Yeah, you know, streamlined. like that. That's a that's a balance that's difficult to pull off when you're going to be progressive, but one hundred make actual good songs and and like the, the the solos are like true like melodic, you know, soaring you know parts that you know you don't even think of it as a solo. It's like a it's like a vocal part or something. Yeah, no, I fully agree. I fully agree. Um. Real quick, I'll do my thing here. Uh, let's see. So we got Bail Maya. Bail Maya. Very, very cool track. Very catchy, actually. Um, once you're acclimated to the vocoder, you, you you really can go anywhere with this album. You can, you know, like I said, the vocoder was a weird thing for me to acclimate to at first, but not anymore. So Celestial, man. Ooh, that's a banger track right there. Swirly mind-blowing polyrhythms by Reiner. Snappy intertwined staccato riffs. Now, one of the things you hear a lot, and you could almost maybe say, well, that's a little bit of a formula is that Paul likes that that sort of that kind of riffy thing where it's not core, where he's not playing a lot of like bar chords. It's a lot of single note mm -hmm. uh, staccato picking. It's not um, it's not, uh, you know, black metal where it's fucking, you know, tremolo picking, but it's this. It's kind of a style of tremolo where it's more like a staccato sort of thing where it's a start, stop, start, stop, kind of riffy chug. Um, to, again, Tony T. Carden, great on there. There's uh, the other thing I really like about this is I hear a lot of clean Alex Lifeson tones on this album. Mm -hmm. The clean guitars are very Alex Lifeson y, man. <clears throat> and you know, I kind of like that dude a little bit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Equal Nature, Sean Malone, need I say more? Like, he's fucking destroying that track the vocoder yeah. vocals now work so well for me that if i heard these songs without them it, they wouldn't sound quite right yeah. um sentiment more of a jazz crossover ambient piece very cool love that kind of shit uh i'm but a wave the playing is staggering just amazing you bore it holy shit again staggering times 10 uh the demo rules, but this is top tier shit right here. Uh, you can tell this was done in a proper studio with more sounds and more money behind them to do what they need to do to flesh the tracks out. And then you get to textures, man. Textures reminds me of Passion and Warfare era Steve Vai craziness. There's the, the guitar tones is very, very Steve Vai ish on that, that track. Uh, also, a little bit of Holdsworth on that one as well, too. And then how could I kill a closing track again, setting the bar higher with otherworldly musicianship. Uh, my final notes. I recall totally not getting this album <clears throat> when I first heard it in approximately 2001, mainly due to the vocoder vocals. And I should have loved it given the fact that I love prog fusion, jazz, instrumental wankery, but I just didn't get it. I honestly <laughs> hadn't put this on in years. I liked it better after a few spins over the years, but it got, you know, it, it, it made its way into the dark echelons of my, or the dark recesses of my CD rack, you know, and it just didn't come out like it used to. But after listening to this yesterday, I was like, God, what the fuck, man? Like, mm -hmm. really? Did I really, really like, why did I put this away for so long? Um, I think a lot of people you. did, dude. Yep. You know, a lot of people didn't like it when it first came out, yeah. you know, and became later converts and, you know, it, it had that effect on people, you know. I mean, that's why it took them 16 years to come back, or whatever it was. <laughs> well, Nick made Nick made the point that Roadrunner didn't know what to do with these guys, and even Monty Connor said when he got the rough demos for Focus, he was like, "Whoa, what is this? Like, this was not the band I signed. This is like mind fucking blowing what they're doing here." And I, like Nick said, I don't think they really knew how to market them or what to do. Plus, they had the mm -hmm. added, you know, fuckery of dealing with the now you know infamous seattle scene taking over and killing hair metal and kind of killing death metal and all metal in a lot of ways you know with the exception of maybe pantera you know and some new metal that came on but um i'm gonna go th this blew my mind this album blew my mind re-listening to it yesterday late, late last night actually and i i just was like every track i was just like 
what what <laughs> like, what am i hearing here it's just a musical dad, genius Jeff Wagner. Mm -hmm. what's that musical genius that's what you were hearing yeah. <laughs> and to go back to what Jeff Wagner said, man, <clears throat> this band didn't follow a tried and true rep uh, roadmap to what the other guys did. This, you know, what everyone was doing at that time, the obituaries, the deaths, all those bands, they didn't do that. They forged a completely unique path and nothing really sounds like it. And the guys that try to pretend to sound like it now, they're good. Don't get me wrong, man. I love alkaloid. I love, I'm not as big into the, the more, you know, necrophages and stuff like that, but they stole a lot from what these guys were doing. There's no question at all. They set the template. I give it a 9.9 .9 out of 10. And the reason I deduct a tiny little bit is there's that one little synthesizer at the beginning of how could I, it's that, 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 that sort of, it sounds like a Casio's keyboard. That's the only thing I didn't like. <laughs> that I was like, "Fuck, man, that that ruined everything." No, I'm just kidding. That's the only, <laughs> that's the only little uh, piece I had an issue with. So, yeah. uh, mind blowing shit, transformative in sound. It sounds like nothing of the year. Plus, it was absolutely influential. Masterful album, man. Masterful. Well, and also did, the production too, man. The I mean, yeah. like Scott Stunning. Burns, stunning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he nailed that sound. The sound yeah. that yeah, I think they were looking for. Everything. He nailed. Yeah, he's a genius on everything he does, but this, yeah, man, just unreal. yeah, he really made that shit work. I mean, yep. Yep. I can't imagine I how it, hard it was. <laughs> I don't think it could have worked had it not sounded as good as it did. Yeah, yeah. Now, here's the other thing yeah. too. Uh, we forgot to mention that the reason that uh, they were signed in '91, the reason this didn't come out to '93 was because of Hurricane Andrew. Oh. That flew in and it gave them literally it, it destroyed Goebel's house, I believe, his family's house. It also destroyed their rehearsal space, and they were in survival mode. And then when they started to reconvene, it was like, do we really want to go in this direction? Because had they put the album out in 91, it probably would have sounded like Obituary or Death or more like Death, yeah. probably, death Human or something or Spiritual. So that was a big reason why this focus became what focus became. And we can all be thankful, not thankful for Andrew, but thankful for that extra time, obviously. So um yeah, we ready to move on. Um, real quick here before we do move on, though, we got to talk about a disbandment. So the band, as as um, Jimmy spoke to, went out on tour with Cannibal and uh, Sinister, right? Yeah. Sinister. And they really were, a, you know, odd an oddball. While they knew all these guys and were friends with all these guys, they were the sore thumb in that whole arrangement there, clearly. And they started to write for their second album, and they just – I don't know the history there. There isn't a lot on it. Do you guys know anything about what went down there? They just no, decided that like, it wasn't working. I, I kind of do. I mean, well, the portal tapes were, were the next thing. And they. Right. I don't think that they were planning on calling it Cynic. I think they were planning on calling it Portal. Um, so we may as well talk about it. But, uh, mm. but yeah, because they did this pretty pretty soon after, um, after, you know, well, I guess it was, I don't even remember what year, but it's a year or two 95. after. 95, 95, yeah. yeah. I mean, so they this was what their next project was going to be. Uh, you know, it was going to be under the portal name, and they produced this. And I don't know what happened, just there was no interest in it, and it's just kind of went into the ether. You know, nobody hey, before really... we get to that, though, guys, I wanted mm -hmm. to do one quick mm -hmm. thing. Let me do this fast. So, I don't know if you guys have seen this, I'm, I'm assuming you probably have, but I hope this doesn't. This dude doesn't get pissed. But. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you guys hear that? Yeah. Yep. Yep. There's Tony Choi. This is Atheist. That's Rand Berkey. Choi. Jesus. So this is 91 after he leaves Cynic. Tony Choi. Kelly. Great song. I want to show you something weird here. I'm gonna go back here. Watch watch Rand Berkey where he's playing the solo. He's he's playing he's left handed, obviously, right? Yeah. But look at how he's playing the solo and tell me what you notice. He's 
playing a right-handed guitar upside down, strung. I was going to say, like, feet. wait a minute, that doesn't look right. <laughs> Which I've never, ever seen. The only person I know that does that is Eric Gales, the blues guitarist. He plays it upside down, plays a strat, plays a right-handed strat upside down like Hendrix, and plays it your high E up top and your low E down low. That means you're, you're, you're inverting your chords are completely different than what you would play them on a for a right hand bizarre never seen that before yeah but that was tony Choi. Uh, <laughs> when i said to kelly that i texted him i said hey when you borrowed tony Choi, he said no man he was just uh he found out you know he knew roger died and and you know we were already moving on we had a record contract and he wasn't he didn't have that with cynic so that's kind of why he came over there and then while they were in the studio doing the uh unquestionable album uh patrick mamelli from pestilence basically stole him remember that he told yep. us the story and he said to this day i can't fucking stand when anybody talks about that band and that guy in the same conversation with atheist and my band and all that stuff and so that 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 didn't go so well but um anyway so that was that, and we're moving on to, uh, uh, yeah, actually, uh, Jimmy, I'm going to, fuck, how'd that get out of the... We want to talk, look, okay. Yeah, I'm going to let Jimmy show his album. I'll come back to you in a minute, um, dude. So, this is Portal, what, what, and if I'm incorrect here, I believe Portal was actually going to kind of become maybe Aeon Spoke, right, essentially? I guess that's kind of what it eventually became, but right. it really is not. It's really quite different than it's Aeon's totally Spoke. Thing, yeah. I think Aeon Spoke kind of went more like an indie rock kind of direction, where this right. was just like ethereal kind of progressive rock. I gothy, guess. I mean, goth, gothy rock sort of kind of. I mean, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really go gothy. No, I mean, this is very, very melodic. Very, uh, just. Uh, I don't know. For me, this is essential. I think. Uh, a lot of people didn't really like this. Um, I, I, I don't know why, man. I think it's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful album. Um, yeah, I kind of hear Collide and Lycee in there, dude, which are kind of yeah. goth bands. Yeah, I do. If you listen to them, you, you might be. I guess, yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't I'm really not talking know. Like, but... I'm not talking like goth like The Cure. Oh, but okay. it's definitely got a goth. It's got a, a retro goth sort of vibe to it, I thought. I listened to it. It's good. I like it. Yeah, um, it's it, it, it's a grower for sure. I mean, yeah. uh, I've, I've listened to this thing so many times because it's, it's kind of become my, uh, my, my, uh, my album at the end of a night out camping, like in the middle of nowhere, when I need something to feel kind of comfortable, <laughs> uh, you know, in the dark, I'll put this on and it just works every time. My wife loves this album. Uh, you know, it wasn't really, they, they released it as cynic, but it's not, uh, well, season of Mist put this out way later. Uh, yeah. I don't even remember. 2012. Which year. 2012, yeah, and they put it under the cynic name to sell it. To make money, to sell it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it was never really intended to be a cynic release. But I think nope. it, again, it just it just kind of they did it, and it just didn't. I guess they didn't get any interest on uh, behind it. And I mean, it's it's mostly it's Masvidal, it's uh, Reinert, uh, Gobel, and they had Chris Kringle playing. Chris based Kringle, on that's the dude yeah. I was thinking of. See, yeah. I told you, I He's thought real. I was it insane. Yeah, and they had. Uh, let uh, me read this real quick. Let me read this quick, Jimmy. Gobel Masvidal, <laughs> Reinhardt, oh, Go, Gobel Masvidal, Reinhardt, and Chris, bassist Chris Kingle, and vocalist keyboardist Aruna Abrams formed yeah. the Short Lived Portal in '94. The band's music featured slower tempos and very few dis distorted guitars compared to Cynic, but still had a complex layered sound, which it does. It's very layered. There's no doubt. A total of ten tracks were recorded as pre-production demos, which were never officially released till 2012 when it was released as the Portal Tapes under the Cynic name. Masvidal and Reinhardt released an album with a more recent project, the Indie Act, and spoke on SPB, and Kringle also played with them, touring the UK in 05. The members of Cynic loosely reunited playing with Bill Bruford. I didn't know that. Steve Hackett and Jim Matheos on various tracks. Oh, hmm. on Gordian Knott's second album. Oh, I have that too. I oh. forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's an official release under the Cynic banner of songs that Masvidal and Reinhardt worked on as a side project uh and yeah so that's that and that came out march 23rd 2012 uh in europe and march 27 2012 uh and that's on who is it on uh Season it was of on Mist. Season of Mist. I mean, it was recorded yeah. in like 94 or 5. Right, it was. Like yep, yeah. yep. You got to love that picture, too. They're all very, very dreamy looking. <laughs> 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 all right, prom photo, guys. <laughs> Chill, man. 
All right, real quick, let's touch on this fast. Let's not spend a lot of time because it's not really a cynic album. But Jimmy, you like it? You said you dig it. I, I love it. I love every song. I mean, it's just I love the I love the female vocalist. I think she really really makes it work. Uh, I don't know. It's just it's 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 kind of an outlier kind of album. I mean, it's not really the type of like you know music I'd normally listen to. But uh, as a cynic fan, I think any cynic fan would enjoy it. it does, there's no metal. It's it's very just just slow kind of ethereal dreamy kind of progressive rock with uh you know mostly female vocals uh, uh paul sings a little bit on it um but just great melodies i mean and they and it's it's very i think it's very mature sounding and very uh like well put together you know if you go read the reviews of it they'll they'll say otherwise which is kind of interesting to me it's like did you even listen to this but um, um Kind yeah. of night jump. <laughs> right, Nick, Nick's not feeling it. He told me earlier he's not feeling yeah, it. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I think I'm kind of in the minority because, I mean, most people. I, most I liked it. Seen, I liked yeah, it. Really I don't crazy. know that I'd run around and get it, but certainly if I ever found it in a, a used bin or if I saw it somewhere and it was relatively affordable, I'd grab it. Wouldn't yeah. grab the vinyl on it, but I'd definitely grab it. Um, yeah. Nick, you can go ahead and pump it. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, the dreadful one has entered the chat. So is heavy metal with G Marty and also What's up, Marty. What's up, Rick? Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm more, I guess, of the majority where I don't know. Like, right, there's great musicianship. There's always great musicianship when these guys are involved. Um, but I found a lot of these songs like musically talented, but kind of directionless. Like it was more about the vibe and the atmosphere. And this felt like music built for like bigger, catchier choruses and honestly like you really don't get that the songs kind of just they kind of float and you know i suppose that's cool for the vibe and you know the, overall the sound is really cool uh especially you know doing it on a kind of a smaller budget but um oh, the female vocals like i really can't get <laughs> into they're very asmr <laughs> it's it's very breathy she, she doesn't seem like she has like like that much range. And I feel like there's like a limited amount that they were able to do with that in terms of like melodic hooks. Um, the guitar playing is way more atmospheric. Like you do get some heavier wrists, but they're really in the background. Like the synths are the thing that are way out in front in this. And again, this is just more of an atmospheric listen, but yeah, I, I, I come back to this one every now and then. And it came back to it for this one just because I had some extra time and was like, yeah, no, it's just, it's still, not for me like but it is a cool collector's item just in terms of like yeah this is what might have actually followed cynic if they actually like fall through with it and they garner some interest behind it but eh, it's uh it's yep <clears throat> on it right over here <laughs> in other words yawn apparently it's, it's yeah John, we uh, got did you get a chance anything? to listen to this one <laughs> no nope. i can't this? even answer this one i've actually Not. never heard it like i said okay. i was Ill prepared for this. I don't have a lot to say either. I uh, I caught it last. It was the last thing I listened to when actually Nick said, "Oh, I'm going to listen to Portal Tapes." I'm like, "Fuck! Wait a minute! Did I miss that? What was that?" And then I went and looked, and I'm like, "Oh shit! I did write a. I wrote this in my my outline, but I I skipped it. I wanted to get all the the cynic we listened to. I liked it. I like Karma's plight. I like Circle quite a bit. Um, I like Mirror Child. That was pretty cool. I like this kind of stuff though." You know, I like, um, I don't really give a flying fuck what you say, but I fucking love Enya. And it reminded me a kind of like a little bit more of a mainstream sort of Enya. Yes, I like Enya. Kiss my ass. I don't give I a I feel fuck. like you should be burning incense and looking at quartz crystals right now. Sail away, sail away, sail away. Anyway, um, but yeah, I dig this stuff. But would I, again, would I rush right out and get it? No. I do hear a little bit of Lycia. I definitely hear the band The Sky Cries Mary in this a little bit. Check them out. If you don't know, Jimmy, you must check out The Timeless Turning by Sky Moves, uh, Sky Moves Sideways. That's a different <laughs> band. Sorry. That's a porcupine tree band. Um, yeah, This Time is Turning by The Sky Cries Mary. Really fucking cool band out of Seattle. I'll check them out. A little bit more techno-y and trip hop a little bit in there, but this is, uh, this is good stuff. You know, I, I, I want to pay a little closer attention to it. It was the last thing and I was rushing to get a bunch of other shit done. So I didn't focus on it really good, but, um, all right. The band re, uh, reconvenes, uh, traced in air was released November 17, 2008. 
I'll get there in a minute, Nick. Uh, Nick uh, on season <laughs> of myths followed, uh, followed by Robin Zylehorse being added as a touring bassist. The band played at Vakin Open Air, the Traceton Air Tour Cycle. Why? Wait a minute. What am I doing here? Sorry, I'm, I goofed it up. I have them backwards. Sitting disbanded or fell during the fall of '94 while working on a new album. On January 17, 2008, Cynic resumed musical activity and Paul Masvidal, because remember, in the interim, they did the portal thing. And then, am I wrong, but did he do Aeon Spoke in there, too? Um, I know Masvidal did Gordian not. Masvidal. Mm-hmm. No, not Masvidal. Masvidal. No, no, was it Reinhardt? Malone. Reinhardt did Gordian. Malone. Not. Malone. Okay. God, Malone. I always am fucking confused. Yeah. And I think, I'm not sure if Reinhardt was on that or not. I can't remember. I have it, but um, the first Gordian not on Laser's Edge, I know that's a Malone thing i believe john meung is on some of that too um but yeah they were doing all kinds of other stuff in there and i thought for sure aeon spoke kind of came up i could be wrong um but they disband they come back together resume musical activity and uh they do the reunion tour it was originally believed that cynic would be working with jason sukoff of kafarnam fan i think he just died didn't he jason sukoff no no that's not him Different dude. Sukov's the guy that does um make, he does Death Angels albums. Um yep. they ended up, yeah, he's a producer. They ended up work, working with Warren Riker, who did down, and um they added Timon Crudinier as announced as the high replacement for uh guitarist named <laughs> David Senescu, which I'm not sure where he came in. Maybe he was a touring guy earlier. Um Crudinier also handled the Death Grouse for this album. Yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't really add in the Dave Senescu guy. I don't know. I, he was a touring guy, apparently. On July 19th, Cynic announced through YouTube that the album's name was Traced in Air. Uh, the release date for Traced in Air was pushed back to November 17th in Europe, 2008, and November 25th, 2008 in North America. All the album artwork was designed by Robert Venosa. A remix version of the album Traced in Air remix was released September 27, 19. Remix was produced by Adam Nolly Get Good. I think he's in Periphery, Periphery. right? Yep. Yeah. And the remix, I'm sorry, uh, and featured new bass tracks from Sean Malone. The growl vocals of Crudinier were mostly removed from the remix versions. We'll talk about both these real quick. Uh, real quick, Sean Malone said, or I'm sorry, Masvidal said, I'm sorry, Sean Reiner said, Retrace is an experiment for us, an opportunity to, to turn four songs from Trace and Air inside out and share something new. Uh, so we'll get to that in a sec here. But again, November 25th, 2008, Trace and Air comes out after they've reconvened. It's out on Season of Mist. It was produced by Warren Riker and Paul Masvidal and recorded at Broken Wave Studios in Los Angeles. And by the, by this time, they'd all, well, at least Paul and Sean had moved west. They're in L.A. at this point. So, um, all right, Nick, you're up. Actually, let uh, let John go next. I need to pee. Oh, okay, John? <laughs> I, I can go last. And, uh, yeah, I'll be you right back. One, so go for it. Well, I mean, this is where I was introduced to Cynic. Um, we, we talk about 10 out of 10 records. We don't give 10 out of 10 ratings at Thralls, but if I had to give a 10 out of 10 rating, I would give it to this album. Um, I, I think, um, you know, not that, that Focus wasn't a great record, but I think they managed to trim off whatever fat there was on that record and then make it 10 times more awesome on this album. Um, the, the lyrics for me, the, the, I mean, the, the vocals overall are more catchy, I think. Um, not that I didn't like the death growls, but I like that they sit a little bit further back in the mix and they let Mastival do his clean singing, which is amazing on this album. Um, the space for this evolutionary sleeper dude, evolutionary sleeper has probably one of my favorite guitar solos out of the cynic career on it by far. Um, the, the drum work, um, an integral birth dude, Reinhardt's drum work in that song is amazing. Um, I mean, really overall the musicianship at this point, they're firing on all fucking cylinders. Um, yeah, I love this album through and through. I mean, this is the, this would go on the list of my favorite albums of all time. I don't know if I could, you know, of course, give you a, a uh, full synopsis of what all my favorite records are, but this is definitely one of them. Um, real quick note on this: they it starts with nunk or nuke nunk, however you pronounce that. Nunk wins. Yeah, and then you've got nunk stands as the end, 
and nunc i believe means now and it's the belief that time itself doesn't exist that any distinctions between now before and the future have either fallen away or don't exist so there's no this album is kind of like in a timeless void it apparently was the kind of the conceptual bit behind it i guess from paul uh and uh sean so um any anything else sir john oh just that i love this record <laughs> Cool. Um, yeah, Sean Malone's bass playing at this point in the game is, I mean, you can't, the, there's nobody out there, there's nobody out there still that I think can play bass like this man played bass, and especially playing a fretless bass too, I mean, Jesus, <laughs> Les Claypool. <laughs> I was going to say Les, there's Les. Colin Edwin from Porcupine Tree plays. Victor Wooten. Victor Wooten, I mean, there's a lot of good players, but Sean was melding a lot of different things and playing in a genre that you're not isn't really known for fretless bass so much right yeah um, it was really this band that kind of created that that vibe in a lot of ways that moved into that more progressive thing that you know jocko and stuff like that were doing you know with bass playing sean was definitely unique he was a a super cerebral guy too very the schooling of writing music was very mm -hmm. important to him like super important um just flows like fucking great. butter yeah and uh yeah right. and like the, yeah. the mix of this record i think i think just the way everything sits in the mix like you can just hear everything the way i i think the way that they heard it like it just it's everything sits in there so nicely so yeah i could gush about this record all day but yeah it's top notch for me Cool, cool. Jimmy, you ready? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, my copy's the – I've got the original pressing on the CD. I think I got the same one that, that Nick's got, and this is the the, re, the, the remix. Um, yeah, what to say, man. I mean, like, you know, for me, like, uh, having been such a big fan when this came out, I mean, like, I was I was uh, anticipating it like hell. I uh, just couldn't believe that Cynic was back together and about to release a new record. Uh, it was just an amazing, uh, you know, kind of like a circle for me. Uh, and – you know, it's 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 interesting to hear like just how like they didn't even really have to they didn't it, this album just feels like effortless to me. Like they didn't even really mm -hmm. have to try that hard. It's just like they just could just belt this out. Um, you know, like they didn't have to like progress. They didn't have to all they had to really do is just come out with a killer record. And I mean, mm -hmm. I love that it kind of follows the focus suit in that it's like it's not overly long. It's it's I love how it's bookended. Like I mm -hmm. think from start to finish, like I hate to keep given 10 out of 10s but like you know most of the deep dives that you bring me on jeff are the bands that i like love the most you know what i mean so, and if you want to believe if you if you don't believe that i don't give everything a 10 out of 10 just go watch our opeth uh marathon and you'll oh, see that's that right I wasn't, I wasn't very kind to the later day opeth records so no one is. Uh, but, <laughs> well, I got into a yeah and uh, you know but, but yeah i mean like it's it's uh it's it's amazing it was amazing to see them come back and just really kind of just with a with, with a bang you know and mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. making you realize that like god where why did it take so long for these guys to come back with this um and, it's, and that's a whole interesting story in itself how they came back but um but yeah i mean just just uh, well, actually about, go into that a little bit go into that well i mean like you know uh, yeah i mean it was it was uh, kelly schaefer had a had a huge part of that and he told you know they were touring atheist again and they uh you know he was he was telling paul like hey man they want cynic i mean people love this you know i don't think paul even realized the extent to which uh the focus record was that much appreciated at, as time had passed and that, that there were so many bands that were influenced by focus. And, and the fact that they were going to come back was, was, you know, so many people wanted it, you know, I think they had done some shows and then they, they, they felt the pull and they, you know, him, him and Sean had been doing Aeon spoke and not really doing a whole, not really gaining much traction with that project. And I don't think Paul had a, Paul had a, a, a you know, a small career doing like soundtracks. He was, he actually did work with Jim Carrey and did some, uh, I think he did some like, I think that remember that uh, show Thirty Rock from the Sun. I think he composed the music for that. You know, yeah, he done some, uh, two for you know, some, yeah, some some film or yeah, he, you know, he and his he and his partner have a, a, a an L. They they do like jingles and things huh. like that. You know, yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind of how he, he was surviving and making good money. I do yeah. know too that Paul worked Paul worked in an AIDS clinic with AIDS patients that were, uh, you know passing and it had a lot to do with the writing of this i believe it was this album with the concepts behind it and how time is kind of a 
it's a static thing, you know what I mean? And yeah. that how he watching people pass. He also he also apparently invented some sort of a voice thing that allows people that can't speak to or or can't write. I forget what the deal is, but it's like a speech to. I, I don't know. It's, it's some kind of invention that he did. So yeah. I mean. You know, he didn't have to come out and start doing this, but you know, no, he, he was, was making great. a living. I mean, yeah, was, was, you know, yeah. they were, I think they were doing Aeon Spoke just for fun and as well, you know, but even Reiner, I mean, I don't think he was really, you know, I mean, they, you know, he went on to do, you know, the Gordy Knot stuff and things like that, right. but, uh, you know, he wasn't, uh, as, as, as known as he should have been, like, still at the time. And, uh, you know, to come back, I mean, look at it, dude, they brought back the Robert Venosa artwork. I mean, they did everything that any Cynic fan could have asked for and then some, you know, with this. Yeah. And, and it just came out with a, <laughs> You know, the, the, it, you're hard pressed to find uh, comeback records that are as strong as as this. Um, you know, at the time, like they were full fledged, man. They, they 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 toured. I saw them, I think, uh, three times touring for T Trace the Nair. Once with Meshuggah mm. and once with uh, they they did the the Between the Buried and Me Devin Townsend tour. Yeah, that one was that one. did y'all go to that one? Yeah, dude. I, mean, I didn't get uh, to go to that one. Nick makes fun of me all the time for that. That's oh man, that was shit. and that was back when Devin Townsend started touring again, you know, he wasn't really doing much. So that was like a big, big show for me. I remember, uh, but like, uh, man, as, as far as the record, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like I, I could go real deep into it, but, uh, you know, th there was the, the original release, which, you know, I think adding those, those guys from Exivius was really cool. You know, time on and, and Robin, uh, Jeff, I, I fucking miss Exivius. Yeah, me too. Oh I mean, my God. And, 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 and that's the one band that kind of like, they were very obviously highly influenced by cynic, but I mean, like, if, if well, you go check those two Exivius records out, Jeff, if you haven't, because they're really, really good. And, uh, uh, yeah. was on them. Oh, yeah. And, and you, talked and about, you talked about the Gordian Knot thing. Just We were talking about this earlier. Nick, you're right that Sean Reiner was in it, but it was mainly Sean Malone's Sean Malone, yeah. project. But he had like Trey Gunn yeah. from, and Bill yeah. Bruford from Crimson. He had Matheos on <laughs> doing acoustic guitars. Chapman Stick by John uh, Myung. Bru uh, I said Bruford. Ron Jarzombek. Yep. Steve Hackett, um, Jason Goebel, and Paul Maz uh, Masville and Sonia Lin. So there was two albums, which I know, I believe I have, I know I have the first uh, original, but I don't know if I have the emergent one. I'm not sure. Oh, man, that, they're both essential. I yeah. Mean, I, could yeah. Talk, I mean, Gordy and not, that's, I mean, that's, yeah, that was Malone's band, you know. But, Crazy uh, good shit. Crazy good but, shit. Um, uh, but yeah, real quick. I mean, like, uh, so I don't know which one I like better. The, the the original, I like I like the production on both the original and the remix. But like, the only problem with the remix is they got rid of the death vocals. Mm -hmm. um, and I, at first, I was really pissed off about that. But then I could kind of see sort of why, because maybe, you know, like maybe they had just put the death vocals in to kind of keep that cred in, and maybe it would have worked better without it. I don't know. I like both both versions. I feel like the new remix, it, it's a little louder. It's a little punchier. It's a little uh, just just more you know pristine more polished i guess and i don't know i think either one sounds really good you know you can't really go wrong i think malone is a little bit higher in the mix here mm -hmm. whereas i felt like he was a little low on the on the original um but um yeah man i mean they you know every song on it king of those who know come on i mean that's yep. god yep. it's so good i mean that's such adam's a great murmur. man oh adam's murmur i mean yeah. uh and reinhardt's just fucking destroying on dude this thing. I mean, he unreal. man um, yeah, I, I would kill for drum cam versions of this entire record. Oh, my you know, God. there's a there's a couple you can if you go look out his uh, his his YouTube page, which obviously, you know, he's deceased. Right. Uh, right, but right. He does have a couple of playthroughs. I think there's a playthrough of Adam's murmur and uh, and maybe it's uh, it maybe it's evolutionary sleeper or one I, of the other. Yeah, I've seen the, the couple of them. I would just like the record in its entirety. I mean, I know that's obviously yeah. impossible now, but I mean. Man, some of uh, man, some of his best work ever. Is oh yeah, there. and he really brought back the feeling from the first, you know, the high hats and the yep, yep. man, and like, and I think he didn't do any of the electronic drums. I think he just stayed strictly acoustic. But it just yep. man, it was like, beautiful. It's, you guys are nerding on drums again now. Come on, <laughs> man. And you have to when it comes to Reiner, dude. Yep, yep. agreed. God, right. you know, I got a little problem. Uh, Nick, you're gonna have to talk for a little bit. I gotta go get my fucking glasses just broke on me. The old oh shit. Oh yeah. shit! So I can't see without him. So talk. I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> All right. My turn to absolutely stroke this fucking masterpiece. No, no don't be stroking anything, master. Oh, master. oh come you're, on you're, now. Like, well, not while you're away. Um, <laughs> no, uh, 
I actually did a video forever ago about like one of my you know like my favorite comeback albums. And this was one of the first albums I thought of. This is one of my favorite comeback albums ever. And this is oh, by by a slim margin my favorite cynic album. Uh it, it is yeah. glorious from start to finish. I just think there's so many elements on focus that I think they kind of did a little bit better in here, namely the vocoder uh vocals yeah. i think are so much better in here <laughs> and he generates really good vocal hooks more like before yes. it was kind of a spacey effect like it added to the whole spacey weird trippy vibe but this time there's like legit attention to hooks like i mean evolutionary sleeper yep. might be one of my favorite songs they've ever done when yep. you get to that clean break where he just he does, he <laughs> says evolutionary sleepers like oh my god that's so catchy but it still sounds so weird <clears throat> but everything on here is jaw dropping. I'm like every time I come back to this album, I'm just as spellbound as like the first time I've listened to it. It, it blew me away when I heard it. The first track I ever heard, God, it was back when like Metal Edge was putting out CDs in their uh, uh, magazine, and then they had Integral Birth on there. I was like, oh my God, new cynic and jammed. I was like, wow, this this is technical, but there's like way more attention to melody on here mm -hmm. and. You know, where focus may have been jarring to some. Like, I think, you know, focus had plenty of time to percolate, but coming to this, they just kind of, I don't know, like focused it down uh -huh, to make it even more catchy and accessible, but still dazzled the living shit out of you with some of the most impressive musicianship. Uh, Yo, the, by far. The, the, the nuanced writing, like one of my favorite bits is the opening to the space for this how it starts off very clean and somber mm -hmm. and like the spacey clean guitars and then you get that da, 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 and then bam you're into that just wicked riff the awesome hi-hat accents that reinhardt is doing like there's so many things you can just pick out of this album and they're all done unbelievably well mm -hmm. um one of my favorite drum performances probably in metal is this album like this is like kind of like the holy bible of prog drumming at least in mm -hmm. my mind like again the smoothness how this album flows it even bookends with the nunk is it nunk nunk we were talking about that earlier yeah nunk 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 whatever uh stands and fluens like this this flows like an album like it, it it's bookended with really cool moments that kind of cap off the album and start it off like you have that cool tribal build up but man like Dude, there's so many good peaks and valleys in terms of like the moods and everything. Like just everything about this album is amazing. But yeah, I mean, King of Those Who Know uh, might be the best track on here. I don't know. I'm still really, really partial to Evolutionary yep. Sleeper, yep. Space for This, mm -hmm. Integral Birth, Adam's Mer oh, the whole, the whole fucking thing. The whole thing. Yeah, yep. this this for it's me is a five star album. Five yep. stars, kind of easy too. Uh, yep. Not only is it technically impressive. But in terms of like songwriting, feel, emotion, uh, hooks, like just just flat out simple hooks. Like there's some stuff in here that, you know, you strip away the techiness. You could have like kind of a classic like Beatles like hook to it. And that is important. They found this perfect balance in terms of writing technical, you know, music that is challenging somewhat. But they found a way to make it unbelievably catchy and memorable. This album is pure gold. Yep. And, and, and I fucking love it. Yep, and to put all that in such a short space too, like you've got these beautiful, masterful songs that you know, prog bands. When you think of prog, you know, you think they like to make you know ten, twelve minute songs. You got these guys squeezing in just amazing music in like five minutes. Yeah, the longest and track it, on here is King, and it's six minutes and eight minutes. seconds. And yeah. it covers all the fucking bases. Everything. Like, yeah. Yeah. So there's a term that I saw bandied about with this band that I think with this album really comes into focus. <laughs> like ah, zing, and zing. what I what I think it I think it accurately portrays what this band is. Everybody here on the panel is familiar with the term shoegaze, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This sound that they've created on this album and going forward quite frankly is something I would I saw a few people call breath gaze as in breathiness and the gaziness of shoegaze with the breathiness of space 
There's a lot of space in these tracks. Even though there's a lot going on, it doesn't overwhelm you with the dream theater thing. You don't have the Jordan Rudess, John Petrucci. You don't have that. You have, I like that. That was pretty good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have this breathiness, this space of, of, and I think Paul's clean vocals. Now he still has some vocal order. There's still a little bit of synthesizedness to this where he's affecting it, but now they're opening up more. He's becoming mm -hmm. more, Dare I say, there's two, there's three singers, four singers, that I kept going, who does he sound like? Why, why am I, why do I want to compare him to someone? But I kept hearing Tom York. I kept hearing the guy from Ocean Size. I forget his name, but I sent you a track. I didn't get a chance to check it yeah, out. Yeah, you got to check it out. I forget his name. I'll have to look it up. Ocean Size. Anybody that doesn't know Ocean Size, get the fuck busy on that because that everyone into position. Massively killer UK band. Um, the other uh, two, shit, I lost one of them. <laughs> Can I name one? Oh, the dude from Muse, Matthew Bellamy. I hear a little bit of Muse in his voice. And then I hear this guy named Edwin that was a singer for a Canadian band called I Mother Earth. There's when When Edwin is singing softly and mellow and isn't doing his more raspy like you know Ray! you know that when he's going up like that paul doesn't sound anything like that but when he's singing his mellow songs like uh there's a song called, i think it's called gently so we go off their first uh, album that is fucking killer and his voice he sang on he sang on alex lifeson's solo album see it always comes back to rush but edwin is that's his name his stage name and paul's a little bit of edwin going on there so i hear yes. i hear one more Who's that? Uh, Stephen Wilson. Nah, I don't hear that at all, dude. <laughs> mm, more from his solo work. I, dude, I, I know Stephen Wilson like the back side of my ass. I don't hear that one, but that's cool. If you do, I, that's cool. I just don't. I just don't hear it. Um, what do you do in mirrors? Steve's, Steve's very, <laughs> Steve's very English sounding most of the time. Then when he tries to actually sing like a rock star, dude. I think he fails miserably, whereas Paul has this Paul has this breathy delivery that feels like every time that he's putting a lyric out there, it's like he's exhaling a breath. And it's just that the, the lyric the, the 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 tonalities of his voice just hang. Now, the funny thing about this is that if you would have and I don't know this to be true, but I would bet on it a little bit, Paul is using or was using some bit of auto tune in here. Oh yeah. It's not a it's not a straight up share, you know, do you believe in love words? Blah, 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 and it sounds robotic. But he's definitely using some auto tune inflections in there. And normally I would fucking hate that. Normally I'd be like done, gone, out of here. But with him and the way he manipulates it, the way it sits in the mix, the way the vocals affect the overall song structure. It's just a beautiful thing. Again, breath gaze is what I, this guy, I read his review. I'm like, dude, that's it. Breath gaze right there. So real quick, none flu fluence, tribal, intensely spiritual, visceral, the space for this really complex track, especially rhythmically and super melodic mixed with the, the, br the brutal sections a little bit, which you, you don't hear as much of the death stuff on this as you do on the, the first album. Um, mm -hmm. Paul's vocals, very delicate at times, super technically challenging as far as, all the stuff going on around it with regards to the basic tracks. Ev Evolutionary Sleeper, again, that staccato thing, that digga 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 dig. Uh, complex rhythm, rhythms, mix of high synth affected pitch shifted vocals. Mind blowing guitar on this one. The tonalities are just, they're their own thing. Paul's mm -hmm. discovered his tone on this album. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, Integral Birth, which I think is an older track, right? It's a, or, or was it an Aeon spoke track? I think. Yeah, it's, I an Aeon spoke, it's an Aeon spoke track. That's another banger. The vocals are very effective here with Paul doing some of the higher falsetto notes, which he does that falsetto. Maybe that's what you were talking about, John. The falsetto. Mm -hmm. the, that mm -hmm. might be a little Steve. Yeah, the, the upper register. His upper register cleans, I think, play yeah. into that Steve Wilson. Little yeah. bit, little bit. I fucking hate the fact that Steve Wilson sings 18 songs in falsetto now, though. Don't get me started. <laughs> go, watch, go watch my Steve Wilson. How about it, Jimmy? Go watch my Steve Wilson rant. 
Um, <laughs> where, where am I at? The uh, unknown guest. Cool intro. Jazzy fusiony section. Lots of, of suspended chords in there. The suspended chords are, you know, those chords like Alex likes in like, I don't know if this thing's in tune, but. You hear that? That is suspended. You have ringing notes in it, you know. Um, and he uses them to great effect on that song. Uh, again, staccato, the, the, the suspended chords underlie the staccato single uh, note riffs. Angular start and stop. Acoustic guitars underneath. Killer solo on that one. Adam, Adam's Murmur. That's probably the poppier proggy track on there. It's got a little bit more of a could it go on radio? It probably could vibe to it, but it's still it's great. Um, probably as close to a single as Cynic will ever get. The King of, man. Uh, what's the rest of the track's name? King of? Those who know. Those who know. Man, what a You clearly that. didn't. Huh? <laughs> the King of Those Who Know. You clearly didn't. And I clearly didn't, yeah. <laughs> Why make fucking... I put the track listing above that I make... I just put one letter or something, and I couldn't remember that one. Um, and you're right. I clearly didn't. Super jazzy, fusion-y, killer bunch of filler solos. Great interplay uh, interplay of the harsh and clean vocals. Uh, this guy has a distinct vibe, kind of like Max Phelps. He sounds a little like Max. Max sounds a little like him. I think this is the Timon guy, I believe, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, which I don't know where that dude came from. Sounds like he's from overseas somewhere. Um, yeah, he's Dutch. playing Xavius. Dutch, okay. I see why Max, Max was actually chosen to do this gig, because he's a fucking monster guitar player, and he's got the vocal timber that that uh, or timbre that uh that paul's looking for to do those those songs um let's see what okay uh the jazzy fills at the end of that song are so goddamn cool man because i'm a guitar nerd so i love jazz all the time and i love when people play jazz guitar and this really really good stuff um and there's super cool drumming wicked as always nunk stands instrumental intro outro kind of menacing at first has a bit mm -hmm. of a martial sound to it, kind of King Crimsony at a point, and it's really super cool, man. Haunting, ethereal, just just a beautiful track. Um, the combination of technicality, brut brutality, melodicism, along with crazy good musicianship, make this band very unique, uniquely singular in their sound and approach to sonic textures, textures and songwriting. This is another gem that sounds like no one else. It just mm -hmm. doesn't. Sound like anyone else. I'm going 9.75 out of 10. Just because. Mm. I can't give it. I can't be like Jimmy and give everything fucking 10 out of 10. Right? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> hey, it's a 10 out of 10. It's a 10 out of 10, man. That's well, it's a 5 out of 5 on my scale. So, but yeah, I give, no, I, I, give Jimmy very, yeah. Right. I give very few records perfect 10s, but this is it. Uh, so I'm the odd man out here. So yeah, this is fucking peer pressure, man. Yeah, quit being a I'm dick. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to Retrace, which came out on May 17th, 2010, recorded in 2009. Seasons of Mist, Paul Masvidal, uh, Masvidal and Sean Reiner, producer. Retrace is an EP by the technical metal band Cynic. It's composed of four reinterpretations of the song from the album Traced in Air, as well as one new song that was released on Seasons of Mist, May 17th. The new song is called Wheels Within Wheels. No Sean Malone on this. This is Robin Zielhurst that plays on this. Go ahead, Nick. Um, I'm all right. This is for me kind of a collector's only one. Uh, all right, the reimaginings of the songs. Uh, the first one I heard, I believe, was integral. It was on a compilation. I was like, huh, that's different. They really stripped back, and I mean, I, they did reimagine these songs. They are predominantly more electronic sounding, like a lot more synths, some drum loops here and there, more uh, restrained, like. I would say all of the heavier aspects to the originals are kind of stripped back in favor of more atmosphere and kind of radio headish. Um, uh, all right. I, I gave Trace and Air like, you know, five stars for a reason. And I'm, I'm a firm believer you really can't fuck with perfection and make it more perfect. So you got different versions, and that's cool. But would I listen to any of these different versions over the originals? No. I wouldn't, but okay, uh, Wheels sure. Within Wheels is Killer a track. really good song, really solid song, and 
it definitely sounds like this was the direction they were progressing towards with the next, you know, offering they'd put out. It's a little bit more soft and still like guitar oriented, but um, it sounded more like Cynic than the other tracks. The other tracks, I, it, it, it's like, <laughs> all right, it's, it's a step above like a Fear Factory remix album, but it kind of oh, has yeah, the yeah, same yeah, vibe. Yeah. Like it just feels kind of unnecessary. Like, all right, this is like a padding out release. Like, hey, we got to give them something. Well, it, we... could have, it could have been that, but it also may have very well been that you know Paul was discovering more with regards to software, and he was he was making these tracks much more ethereal and dreamlike as opposed to the ones that are on the album. That's what I hear, See, and I I disagree. I think it's I think it's kind of essential after listening to. It. I loved it. Loved it. Uh, I don't know because I think there's plenty of dreaminess and etherealness on sure. Trace and Air. There is, yeah, yeah. I, I you know, it, it's like for me, a collector's only one, like it's not terrible. Like, I mean, I'd still give it probably a three, but uh, in terms of being like absolutely necessary, you must own this, uh, you know, and not, not necessarily, but yeah, wheels within wheels that was that was worth buying it. Quick question, uh, Jimmy, in particular. Because I, I don't think Nick's gonna get it. No offense, Nick. Wheels within wheels. What is that? What's that conjure in your head? Fuck. You know, and it's funny because I didn't. This is the one that I didn't listen to leading up to this deep dive. And I'm not necessarily talking about the song. I'm just talking about the title. The title. Wheels yeah. within wheels. Wheels within wheels. Fuck, man. It's not coming to me very quickly. Are you ready? You ready? Mm-hmm. Let's see. Wheels within wheels in a spiral array. Oh, uh, okay. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Complex. I bet yep. you any money that's where that came from. Oh, guaranteed. Now that you said it, I did. Yep. Yeah, I never. Yeah, put I saw that, that right away. Like, boom. Like I said, people, it always comes back to the Holy Trinity. Rush. Yeah, always. <laughs> and that would kind of forget also, that shit. Well, and what's interesting about that is it would also inform what's to come next. But we'll get there. All right, John. Did you listen to this one? Do you know this one? I didn't. I didn't listen to it. My yeah, assumption, well, my assumption was, is that it was just a, a redo of some songs, and much like Nick, I stand by the "you can't fuck with perfection." So I didn't, I didn't really want to hear him reimagine it. I think they're very different. I think they're very different and worth listening to. So you guys all suck. I'm just saying. oh, <laughs> bitter old man says mean things. Not bitter old man. I'm just saying, <laughs> fuck off. And it's, they're good. You didn't listen to it either. You missed that one. Well, I mean, I've, I've got it, you know, it's, I, I don't know where my copy is, but yeah, it's been a while since I've listened to it. I mean, I, I, you know, I have to have everything to have, but I think it's a cool, uh, you know, sort of experiment, just kind of reimagining for experiment. Different ways, you know, uh, I, I'm kind of in, pretty much in, you know, completely in agreement with Nick that it's kind of like, if, if I'm going to listen to those songs, I just want to hear Trace and Air. Um, I think it definitely is worth having for wheels within wheels. Cause it's a cool song and they were, uh, the, I think the I think it was like the fourth. I got to I got to see Cynic do uh, the uh, what was the tour called? It was Cynic, Intronaut, and Dysrhythmia, and Cynic Man. was the headliner. And uh, they what did. A cool uh, that would have been. Yeah, and it was the first time they 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 did the whole Focus album, and then they uh, I think they had just released uh, Carbon Based Anatomy, but they did play. Uh, wheels within wheels and max phelps was with him and uh, it's just a cool track it was even cooler to hear it you know with the full band um but otherwise yeah it's just kind of kind of just like a like a, a little uh you know a little a little nugget for the fans you know just a little reimagining yeah. kind of thing it's very cool i like i like the way that they sound and how they kind of stripped it down to more of a you know kind of just a, an acoustic uh just uh singer songwriter kind of feel to the to those songs but uh, but yeah, for me, I mean, I, I prefer, yeah, I'd rather just listen, listen to Trace and Mare, but, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely worth having if you're a huge fan, but it was just kind of a little in between kind of thing to warm you up for the, for what's to come, you know? I didn't listen if they had, the. Uh... can you hear that? Yeah. I don't think they have that in there. I don't think that's in there. That me- no. Right. Yeah. That is. Anyways, um, that's way out of tune. But yeah, yeah. So I really like this. Sorry, I'm going. I'm going with the nine and a half out of ten. So fuck y'all. Uh, I think it's that good. I think it's well worth having. And I think the actual Jimmy hit it on the head. 
they experimented with the sound on these tracks because they don't really sound exactly like case in point is king uh the king of the the one who knows that's a stunner it's so beautiful and serene yet engaging ear candy when the drums and bass enter this track blossoms but only for a few moments till it moves back into a completely new vibe it's it's, it's incredible how they reworked that song uh evolutionary evolutionary sleeper another beautiful reimagining of the album's track very killer these are this is where I heard the breath gaze. This album really, really epitomizes the breath gaze. Um, the first one, Space, um, the, they did um, evol uh, not evolution, what's it called? Damn it. Oh, uh, space, this space for this. It's glitchy, man. There's like some glitch going on, electronic. So, yes, it's a lot more electronic uh, influenced, but see, I dig that shit, so that's why I dug it a lot. I feel like it's like. Yeah, like kid a worship specifically yeah yep yeah. that well you said that yes they, yeah i agree uh wheels within wheel oh i liked integral because that's a completely different reworking it's all on nylon string guitar and it's very flowing and it's it's you know paul definitely sounds very very tom yorkish on that side like if you closed your eyes and didn't know it was cynic you'd think it was radio uh wheels within no allusion to natural science here huh uh, only new song, Killer Opening. Man, those guitar tapping sections that they, they're using, like the rolling tapping section. So cool. A little bit of delay on there. Uh, insanely badass uh, playing uh, by Sean. Absolutely amazing. It's a killer track, man. So I love this EP. I would take a dozen more tracks like it. I'm not going to lie to you. If they could have done the whole album like this, I would have loved it. Um, love the ethereal, spacey, gorgeous, dense, experimental versions. Is it critical to have? Guess it depends on what you like. I would say yes. You guys are saying eh, not really. So, um, okay, what do we got here? We're moving on to 2011, and we got Carbon Based Anatomy, which is another EP. Uh, this came out on Seasons of Mist again. Sean and Paul. A lot more experiments. This one includes um, six previously unheard tracks. However, the song Carbon Based Anatomy is a reinterpretation of an older, unreleased Aeon spoke, spoke track. Called Homo Sapien. This was also done on Cynic's last LP, Traced in Air, as the track Integral Birth. That's it. Was an adaptation of an a uh, Aeon spoke track when the sunrise skirts the moor. The artwork was done by Venosa again, the artist who was responsible for all previous Cynic artworks. Venosa died shortly before the release release of this. Three of the six tracks are short, ambient-oriented pieces, pieces amidst the coals, Bija and Hieroglyph and represent an unprecedented musical direction for Cynic. Since the two previous hired musicians, Time and Crudenai, or whatever it is, sorry, Time, and if you're watching this, Rob and Zeohors were let go by Masvidal and Reiner. All guitar parts for this EP were Paul Masvidal. Bass parts were composed and recorded by Sean Malone, who had recorded on every Cynic release with the exception of Reed Trace. So go ahead on this one. Uh, la, la, la. John, how you doing on time, buddy? <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> what, do you want to do? what do you want to do? Um, I can finish this one out. I would love to stay for all of it. Unfortunately, I work at five in the morning. So, all right, we'll uh, try to. Let me see the next thing up. Why don't you stay through Kindly Bent? We'll rip through this one, fine. stay through Kindly Bent, and then we'll get you out of here. You can give your take really quick on Ascension Codes and Roll, okay? Sure. Uh, Nick, we'll make it quick. Um, all right, this was not the follow up I was expecting as far as like studio uh songs like even the stuff on here is uh more different than uh like even like uh, uh wheels and then wheels this is way more restrained lots of middle eastern mm -hmm. or uh like maybe ethnic, like west ethnic, yeah west ethnic. indian world music i guess world. you could say yep. um especially in like amidst the coals biha and hieroglyph um as far as like the songs I really dig in here, mostly it is the title track and uh, Elves Beam Out. There's a lot more giant choral stuff going on, like in terms of like, you know, a big vocal swells stacking, and stacking such. Vocals, mm -hmm. Stacking vocals, yeah. Production is a lot different. The guitars, there's like a lot of the crunch is gone. Like this is more of a flat out rock tone and it's not the main thing driving it. Again, it's more about the atmosphere, which I guess is kind of carryover from retraced. Um, going back to this one, like I was kind of scratching my head when I initially got this and listened to it. Like, you know, 
it just has a totally different vibe to it. Like, I don't know, like a progressive, like Peter Gabriel album in terms of all the world music in there and being maybe a little bit less technical in some regards and more technical in other regards. It's a very different direction. And honestly, it's kind of a standout because even the next album is a little bit different than this one. But uh, it's it's kind of an odd EP. I, I like it, but I'm, I'm not like in love with it. Uh, this would be like a three, three and a half for me. I think overall the music is well composed. It's just vastly different. And just, again, like the direction, the direction feels like it took like a really sharp turn and it kind of writes itself or I don't know, it found another like path to go down after this. Cause I mean, it's cynic, it's progressive. They do what the hell they want. And I generally, I respect them for that. But yeah, this one's always been just sort of an odd one out for me, but I, I still really dig it. It has a very interesting vibe to it, like the whole feel of it. I don't know. It feels, I don't know, sort of welcoming. I don't know, like more positive, more bright, I it's guess. Right, and it's, but it also has its real mystical vibe to it. Yeah. I mean, and mystical. It, and it's more electronic based still. Like, yeah. Retro. Well, I mean, there's still some really solid, like, natural drum work on here. Yeah. With the Hart. title track. Yeah. Yeah. The, his drum work on Carbon Based Anatomy, again, yeah. those are that's some of my favorite drum work that he's ever oh, done. The lead in, the lead in's beautiful. Dude, the yeah. the Tom work, the the Tom. I just want to interject one quick moment here, yeah. John. Um, when I was talking about Dream Theater, Nate, um, you know, I love Petrucci, man, and I own every Dream Theater album up to Dark Clouds. I kind of bailed then because what started to happen for me was the 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 boat race between Petrucci and Jordan Rudess started to get maddening to me. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're ridiculous musicians, but I just got sick of the call and response thing. And I fucking hate, I fucking hate a lot of Jordan Rudess's synth patches that he's come up with in the last, they're all Disney. It's yes. Like Disney shit. So and, fucking Disney. Yeah. And I can't fucking take that shit. I know how great Jordan is. I've met Jordan. He's a sweet guy, great guy, a wizard on the keyboards. John Petrucci, super fucking cool guy. Met him a couple times. Super cool guy. Master of the acts. Just mind blowing. I can play. That guy wastes me with four notes. And he plays very heartfelt solos a lot of time. They got to knock the fucking call and response shit off or I'll never come back. I'm just tired of it. So <laughs> that's that. And plus, I really can't take. Uh, James Labrie anymore. I used to love him. Can't take can't take him. Anymore. Yeah. It's just that eh, I can't do it, man. I can't do it. <laughs> anyway, that's that. Um. Uh, sorry, but go ahead. No, you're good. I was just uh, wanking about the the drum work the on carbon base. Go ahead. Carbon. Yep, that's oh. it. <laughs> oh no, you go ahead. I mean, you're on now. If you want to yeah, talk about up. the you're up. Oh yeah. yeah um. Up. I mean. I think I've always just liked the EP for Carbon Based Anatomy. Like, Box Up My Bones is kind of cool. Uh, the, the, uh, Elves Boom Out. I mean, the the I, I like the vocal hooks on those songs. But, I mean, overall, as a, a cynic record, it's, it's all right. There's just not a lot to it. And, like, the like hieroglyphs, that sounds like something I fall asleep to. <laughs> I, I think this is like where the where the early fans and the more metal fans kind of get a little bit alienated, a little bit. I I yeah. just didn't find it overall as entertaining as the certainly the record before it. So, yeah. well, Jimmy, what do you think? Oh, you're mute. You're, you're muted. muted. Sorry. Um, yeah, I love. I really love this one. I mean, I, I, do I feel too, like. Man. I feel like it kind of, uh, you know, it's interesting because like after the statement that was traced in there, they sort of had to, I don't know if they felt like they needed to like kind of uh, like, you know, they kind of came out with an album that, you know, everybody, it's not like they were, I don't feel like they put traced in there just to like appease the fans. I, I felt like that was a very natural album for mm -hmm. them to do. But I think at this point they, they were kind of riding on a high that like, okay, we're back. You know, they've done a bunch of touring, you know, people are embracing them like they never have you know so now at this point they can maybe like kind of uh inject a little bit more of their uh you know like kind of obviously like you guys were saying like they moved you know they moved further away from metal i mean i, I mean that's 
kind of was natural for them, I think, because they never really were, you know, even wanted to, to continue in more of a metal sense, you know, and I think this was kind of the sort of departure from, from that, you know, if there was any of that on Trace and Air, there's, it's pretty much non-existent at this point. It's all, you know, all about the mass, but all, you know, clean vocals. And, uh, but I think, I just feel like it kind of exists really nicely as a little EP. That's, you know, I don't feel like these songs really, uh, you know, fit anywhere else. Like it still kind of retains like the cynic that I know, but kind of builds a little bit in a different sort of direction, you know, like a little more airy, I guess, if they can get any more airy, uh, you know, uh, but like, it still retains all the things that I love about them. I mean, like Reinhardt's on point, like crazy. I mean, I love box up my bones. I love the way that that song just like, oh, so do I. Like, the, the way like he comes in with the hats, man, just the slow, you know, that it's just a, it's just a really, I don't know, really effective and, uh, you know, come on elves beam out. I mean, that's just, uh, you know, it's, it's all about Masvidal's like journey through the cosmos. I feel like at this point, you know, with his, you know, it's, it's, it's all about his, his, uh, his, his, his spiritual trip. trip. Yeah. And at this point, like when you're seeing him live, he's doing yoga poses and having the audience do this and that, you know, and, uh, it's kind of goofy, but it, yeah, it kind of works also, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, if anything for me, like as a fan, when it came out, it was like, I wonder where they're going to go from here. And I was pretty concerned that this was, you know, kind of marking a departure from, you know, and kind of ushering in the new cynic, wherever, whatever that was going to be uh, with, with the EP. So, but uh, I don't know, man, I just, uh, yeah, I mean, when I, I, I like that. It's just what I always like about cynic uh, releases that we've talked about is that it's short and concise. It's to the point. Yeah. So it's not, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't have a bunch of overbearing mm -hmm. bullshit that I have to get through and decide whether I like it. It's just like, they don't go on and on. No, and on. you know, that's why I love it. You know, in, in, in a, in a world at this point, maybe not even at this point, but like even today, like we got so many bands that, you know, 10 to 15 minute songs. It's like, dude, you know, what are you guys going to like fucking strip this shit down? You know, we don't have hours to listen to these records. And I love that they've always kind of maintained that sort of really concise uh, statement, you know, mm -hmm. with the music. So, but um, yeah, man, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's not my favorite, but it's, it's, uh, I still feel like they're kind of on top for me at this point. And, uh, you know, seeing them live and do some of these tracks agreed with uh, what John said. I mean, you know, Reiner on the first track is just like, he's pulling his Tom, He's just yeah. all over it. He's like an octopus, just all over this Tom rules, and just, it's just like he, the way he like reverses it, like each time yeah. he does the pattern. <laughs> it's, 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 and if you see him when you see him do it, it's like he does it so naturally. It's just like how, did, you know, it's, it's, yep. it's, it's pretty mind blowing. But um, yeah, man, and you know, I also feel like Malone was kind of back, you know, because when they did Trace and Error, like they got Malone to do the bass, but he it didn't, you know, he wasn't a full fledged member, right? I mean, right, like, he wasn't touring. And they got the Exivious guys. At this point, it feels like Malone's kind of back, you know. And I think uh, Malone was teaching too. Wasn't yeah, he teaching yeah, and he was always. Really... He never really toured with him. He always did the right. recordings, but it just right. to me, it felt like he was more involved with this. Yeah, um, at yeah. This point, you know, um, and he sounds great on this, just like he usually does. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, ten out of ten. I love this thing. Fucking mind blowing! I hadn't listened to it in forever, and the song "Carbon Based Anatomy," uh, "Carbon Based," yeah, is that it? Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> oh man, god damn! This it says it's an older Aeon spoke track, Homo Sapiens, just monster intro drone with fucking terrifying drumming. The drumming on that track is just—it's <laughs> like it's otherworldly, man. Super fucking killer track, <laughs> mind blowing track. Love it. The breathy. In interlude the the amidst the cold with the Asian or Japanese I think it was Japanese singing super cool tribal world interlude with Bija I love that shit man I love that stuff they could have been longer I know a lot of people hate interludes it's like ah it's such a waste nah for me it helps set I know you're that guy I wasn't gonna say it you, you owned it <laughs> I feel I attacked it but that's fine I've heard you say it before so but like for example when when I saw Gorgots down in Philly the other week a couple weeks ago. They had these nice droney interludes that were so cool to set the mood to go into the, you know, getting fucking punched in the face over and over and pummeled. It was so cool. Um, box up my bones, man. The fade in is stunning. Just so badass. Another monster track full of breathiness, ghosts, tr ghosts of happiness and sadness, the human experience all wrapped up in that song. It's like, like you said, Jimmy, it's Paul's, or I said spiritual trip all in that song there. Um, this track just hits so hard, man. So beautiful, crazy good, and then that solo near the end, it's, and that it's just so angelic and evocative. 
beautiful, beautiful song. Um, Elves Beam Out. This is kind of like almost a radio track on the album if there was one. But it's still, it's proggy, but it's yet still accessible with lots of very cool textures. And I think that's the thing we need to start looking at is this band is getting more and more layered and more and more textured. And, and it's whether it be synths or counter melodies on the guitar or the vocal harmonies or whatever. They're stacking and they're getting more and more complex as they go. And the weird thing is it all sounds so rich and good, you know. Um, hieroglyph, fade out ambient lushness, ethereal cosmic vocals, blend with the synths to drum the EP out. Uh, the, the spoken word speaks about the universe. That's what I kept hearing. Like the un she was speaking about the universe. Again, a very global sort of feel to this thing. Yes, it's an EP. Could I have done with maybe 10, 15 more minutes like this? I could have. And it would have been maybe a full-fledged Cynic album at that point. But it would have been very different from Traced in Air. But not really. Would it really be that far removed? I don't... The thing that I keep coming back to with Cynic is they sound like Cynic. There's no one else sounds like them. And therefore, whatever they do is always going to sound like Cynic. And you're either on board or you're not. That's kind of how I look at it. Um, maybe that's not the right way to look at it. But... Stunning, uh, full, full of some great. The three songs are fantastic. The interludes are cool, <laughs> cosmically ethereal, truly sell, stellar songs. 10 out of 10. Uh, I wrote this, I'm, I'm being ironic and a little bit weird here, of course, but because I think very strangely now in the times with what's going on with me. But I said, I want this to be played at my funeral. Dot, 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 party. <laughs> See what I did huh? there? It could be at my wake or my funeral, but also have a fucking party. All right, um, kindly meant to free us quick here. John, we'll let you go first. Um, this came out on, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, you want to show it? Season Miss. Go ahead, show it real quick. <laughs> yep. All right, cool. We'll let John go first, though, so he can jet. Uh, came out February 18, 2014, recorded December 2012, May to 2013, Perfect Sound Studios in Los Angeles. Out on Seasons of Miss, again, Sean Reiner, Paul Masvidal, and Sean Malone produced. It's almost like, I don't know how to explain it. This is from Paul. Masvidal, sorry. Yeah. I, it's almost like I don't know how to explain it, but if I had to put it into a box, it's more sci-fi, futuristic, and alien, but at the same time, very song-driven. It's kind of like, to me, coming into Cynic's body more. It feels very modern. At the same time, it just feels really cool. I'm big into space. It's definitely new. Or no, I'm big in, mm -hmm. I'm big in the space. It's definitely new. It's not like anything we've done before. It's a new color, a new space. I think people will really take note of even... The guitar stuff, I'm really shifting gears guitar-wise. I'm trying things in a different way and the way and the way that I play stuff. It's a new space for Cynic for sure. It definitely sounds like us, except completely new. Go ahead, man. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I bought this record when it came out. <laughs> the day it came out, because I was stoked to fucking hear it. Um, I like how this record is more... I, I guess free flowing overall. Like, I mean, there's definitely more of a, it, cause it is, it is a little bit more songy in parts, yep. but it just seems like it's like, it just, it flow. It's more of like a free flowing thought. Um, I, I find it to be a lot more mellow and I like more mellow parts of cynic too. Like I like the, the really spacey jammy jazzy shit from cynic as much as I like the heavy stuff. Um, I like that it's pretty, I don't want to say relaxed, because there's still some heavy parts, uh, obviously, in, in the title track, most notably. But it seems just a little bit more laid back and a little bit more airy and a little bit more spacey. Um, and a, a prime example of how powerful just a trio can be. Like, three-piece bands to, to fill out sound and space. Like they, I thought they really did a good job of, like, making sure there were no holes in the sound. Um, what else? Uh, Sean Malone really lays it down in this record. Like, th this record could easily be titled Cynic Kindly Bent to Free Us, featuring Sean Malone. <laughs> His bass work on this record is tits on a bore. Just like every every song. <laughs> yep. That sounded yeah. like a Chris. That sounded like a Chris Metalomania moment there. <laughs> Love you, Chris. If you're watching, <laughs> love you. Um, 
but yeah, I I just really like this record for how relaxed it is. How about Ascension Codes? You want to get uh, your two cents in on that quick? Um, Ascension Codes, I never really fully jammed all the way through. I did listen to the instrumentals. Um, n- not that I'm not a, a, a fan of, of it lyrically, but when I saw they released it as an instrumental record, I wanted to check it out. Um, yeah, I like it. I didn't really get through it a whole lot. Again, like I said, kind of ill-prepared with the accident last week. So my apologies on that forefront. But uh, I need to spend more I need to spend more time with that record for sure before I give you any synopsis on that. Yeah. Cool. cool. Well, John, listen, I want to thank you for being here, man. I know you've had a rough couple a couple days the last week or so. Yeah, man. Um, that sucks. I, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes, but um you'll get it all worked out. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, and yeah, for sure. Good, good support around you, and um, good people, good family. Thank you for having me. It yeah, man. Fun. Congrats on the whole uh, promotion, new career thing. I guess if that's what you're digging into. Yeah, dude. I mean, it's just something I always wanted to do. You know, I've, I've been to hundreds, if not probably close to a thousand shows, and I was just like, man, I wonder, I wonder how this is done. I wonder, you know, because who doesn't sit around and go, man. I would love to see this band together and this band together and this band together. Like I could make a fucking perfect lineup. And then I figured out why not try it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, Denver death fest seemed to work out for us really well. And I know we're going to be doing that again because it was insanely popular. Cool. But uh, you know, the opportunity arose to do something like that on the home front. So I figured I'd try it out and we're having fun with it. So yeah, for sure, man. Well, good luck with that. And um, thanks for popping by and you know, We'll see you. I'm sure we'll see you soon. Yeah, man. You'll you'll see me. We'll we'll uh you know, I'm sure life won't be crazy all the time and uh you know one, the, one of these days one of these days Nick might even invite me to come on thralls. Maybe I doubt it, but maybe uh, you never know. I don't know, <laughs> man. Maybe uh, so we'll we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. We're not gonna talk about it. oh shit, I'm not muted. Okay. We'll talk about it. John, we'll talk about it. We're not gonna talk about it. Just tell them we're talking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll uh Metamorphogenesis, uh esoteric. I don't know, who knows? Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, Jeff was talking about doing suffocation as a deep dive at some point. Oh yeah. I could do that. I just don't know the dive. material. I'd have to, you know, I'd have to I'd have to do it and not hit a deer or anything like that. You know what I mean? I don't You're drive right, much. So oh, dear. A chance that. Funny oh, you dear. say that, though. The last time, one of the last times I drove extensively, I live up near a river, and it was the winter back around Christmas, before Christmas, and I took off back this old road that goes way back out in the middle of bumfuck nowhere. And I'm driving, and I'm late. I'm going pretty easy because my eyesight's very fucked up from my disease. I, I see, like, like, I'm looking through binoculars sometimes. I'm driving along. Come around this corner and right in the fucking middle of the road, walking down the road away from me, is about a twelve point buck. I mean, if you were a hunter, you'd have been like creaming yourself. And I'm like <laughs> laying on the horn, and he's stopping, and he's looking around at me like, "Fuck you, man!" I'm. I was basically I'm walking he just, here. <laughs> he just stood there for the longest time, so I kind of went at him a little bit, and then he finally took off. So, but there's deer all over here, so I know that's a terrifying yeah. thing. And I I hit a herd of deer once in a minivan, a large minivan, a Dodge Caravan, and totaled my fucking car. I thought, yep. and I hit once right in the me- middle. He went up and over me. I went looking for him. I never found him. I don't know if he died later or, yeah. Oh, yeah. This, 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 this 100% totaled my car. The, 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 the What made it funny was is I was dropping my girlfriend off to get her rental car because her uh, engine blew a rod <laughs> like a day before. So I was dropping her off to get her rental car. And I was like a half mile away, and then bam, hit a deer, total my car. So, <laughs> well, yep. Good luck with that, and yeah, uh, thanks, thanks for popping in, man. Okay, and good luck at work tomorrow. Sorry. Yeah, man. Thanks yep. for having me. Yep. Cheers, right, John. You guys. Good to see, see you, bro. You mm-hmm. Yep. Later, man. Later, buddy. See you tomorrow. I'll, yeah, I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right. Cool. Cool. All right. So we're at. Um, hang on a sec. Kindly bent to free us. Hey, you got some. Uh... What the uh, fuck? Some trolling hey, Wes, going on there. Mm-hmm. Hey Wes, here's the thing about Jesus. He doesn't exist. It's never it wasn't real. But I really don't give a fuck what you say because uh I'm saying goodbye. See ya. All right. Um mm-hmm. now back to uh Cynic. Yes, Kylie Beth Free us. Roll with it. Uh I hadn't listened to this album in a while because you know, once again, I was hoping for like the True Blue sequel to Trace and Air. Who the fuck wouldn't want that? But 
Uh, initially, I was kind of man on this like of course once again super talented musicians they know how to write great songs the playing is always marvelous but i wanted heavy again but coming back to this this is a really unique and interesting album in their discography and i i really dig it um the vibe on this album is completely different everything is more bright and warm warmth is like kind of the big thing on here this <laughs> it's, a happy album. it's a happy album it's it's happy but it's also i don't know it's like like a really proggy stoner metal album in spots <laughs> okay. like the, the the guitars have like a, a nice like sort of like organic fuzziness to them like it's not like your traditional kind of crunchy heavy it's again kind of fuzzy uh the riffs again being a little bit more bright a little bit more like major chordy i don't yeah. know it kind of has that sort yeah. of vibe like Oddly enough, I was comparing this to like, you know, like I feel like I know I'm listening to Cynic, but part of me also thinks that like Queens of the Stone Age were in the same studio at the same well, time. Here, let me ask you this. You just brought that up, and that's interesting you note that. The Lion's Roar, that's probably the most Queens of the Stone Age rock. Yeah. It's a rock riff. It's, you know it's I mean? catchy. It's, it's, it's R -A -W, rookie, yeah. It's R-A-W-K, rock. It's just that almost like a radio rock riff, which you don't. You haven't heard out of them before. Yeah. You know? and, and even like the, the heavier moments on here are not necessarily like metal heavy. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you definitely get some on, I think, was it Infinite Shapes? Uh, get, get in Yali? Get in Yali? Whatever. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Holy Fallout, Yali, which is though, yeah. probably like a little bit more of a proggy jam of a song. That's a prog metal song, that one. Yeah. Jelly, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, again, like it's it's metal, but kind of like still more of like a prog rock jam. Like, I feel like this kind of harked back to like, again, like, like more King Crimson and stuff like that in terms of like the proggy side. But again, warmth, happiness, um, I don't know. It's like a positive introspective journey. Like you're not, you're not, covering all the bad shit you know in your psyche you're like yeah no i did that really well yeah i remember that day it was pretty fucking cool yeah like yep. that's that's kind of the vibe and it's interesting because everything else they do is like very like all-encompassing let's take in the world universal. and analyze it's the, it's more the space yeah mm -hmm. this is uh grounded i mean you know the the brain's got roots the brain tree whatever it is it's it's an awesome cover i love it yeah but uh yeah it, it feels more organic feels more like grounded i feel like the synths kind of take a back seat on a good chunk of this like i feel like this is a little bit more like kind of riffy just driven and, and lots of like just fun swingy grooves another awesome performance yeah, way more groove on this yeah. Album before, he, yeah he's just kind of kind of like you know bouncing along on this and it, it's maybe like a little bit less technical in the drum play but again it's so tastefully done it, it just you you kind of just groove along with this album and yeah uh, again of course yeah Sean Malone absolutely fucking whoops ass in here I, the the bass tone again another layer of like warmth on there but yeah um coming back to this one like initially I was kind of like eh on it and coming back and listening to it, it was like I don't know what the hell my problem was this is this is really good yeah um yeah this would be a four for me four out of five cool. pretty easily um yeah I, I think the songwriting is excellent it's different but it's it's different in a different way than carbon based anatomy was different and this feels like it was going to be the start of a whole new chapter you know with the band they seemed pretty excited about it at least in the press releases i do think this album kind of sparked some division between reinhardt and mass with all maybe a little bit later i don't know because you know stuff that came out later they seemed like they were a little bit at odds in that but yeah, sometimes I, when the know, fans I, at odds I, I want jimmy maybe jimmy knows about that i yeah. didn't Spent a lot of time looking into that, but I remember in the press there was some, there was dissension there. And I think even up to the point when Sean died, when he left the band in 2017, there was uh, there was some dissension about what was going on there. Maybe Jimmy knows more about it than I do. I, I honestly don't. Um, I think, um, but the one statement you made there, I'm kind of curious about. The first thing you let off with was, I was looking, I, I'm paraphrasing. I was looking for the – it wasn't what I was expecting as the follow-up to Trace Denaire. Yeah. I mean, is that basically what you said? Like nice, 
Well, no, I, I, I saw the EP Carbon Based Anatomy as like more of an experimental kind of like one off thing. Right. Like, no, I really wasn't sure that was the direction of the band. It very well could have been. But, but what, was the like, statement, what was the statement you made? Because I wanted to challenge you a little bit on it. It was basically. Oh, I was looking Trace for the sequel to Trace came out And you were looking for the logical conclusion, the next album. No, I, I, I wanted like something that was in the same vein as Trace and Air. So but you wanted like, Trace Air Part bigger. 2, is what you're saying. Or part three or part four, <laughs> part eight, part ten. See, I, when people part say that, 35. I gotta go, well, what does what does that mean? Because with a band like with a band like you expect that with a suffocation, right? You expect that with a cannibal, you expect that with an obituary. Like suddenly if obituary put out a fucking enslaved like album, you'd be like, What is this shit? You know what I mean? But well, it would also come down to whether or not they did it good. And I you know, I get that this is like a constantly evolving project. Exactly. That's and my that, point. It's, that's awesome, you know, in terms of like prog bands. Like, I, I think that's a really cool aspect. But the thing is, you know, I, I bring it up a lot is different isn't always good. Sometimes different is just sure. different. Sometimes yeah. you miss the mark. I this one was different and good. Yeah. And initially I was a little put off by it, but coming back to it, you know, I, I've given this album a lot of chances. And with each one, it's kind of grown on me a bit. Yeah. And I don't know, it stands out as like a kind of a fun, unique bright warm proggy album that's maybe not the heaviest but it's just really good it's just really fucking good yeah i think my whole point to that was challenging you a little bit was more to to speak to the point i think jimmy you'll agree we as fans of a specific band we get we get in this mindset kind of where we don't want a repeat of the exact same we don't want an exact repeat of the last album but holy fuck don't go too far outside the coloring lines because if you do that like i i just i don't know what my head will explode i don't know what i'll do you know it's like it's it's kind of like that i that's always made me wonder like why people think that way or say those things because the reality of it is that you've got you know, you, you've got usually in a band, there's one or two creative forces. You rarely have a band where all four or five guys are all writing because it's just too many cooks in the thing and they can't agree on anything, you know. So in this band, it was primarily Reiner and and Paul Masvidal were driving maybe the creative force. But Sean Malone then, when he was involved, would also shape it. And I think because you have kind of a three-headed monster here, it's always going to evolve. It's always going to sound like cynic in one way or another, but it's always going to evolve. And, you know, I, I get, I completely get what you're saying, Nick, and I'm not arguing with it at all or even giving a shit about it. I'm just saying, I, I just wonder though, when people say that kind of thing, like, it's so, you know, I was expecting part three or part X, but then if you get that, it's like, Man, they just rewrote the same album over and over. They're doing the they're they're doing the fucking Nickelback thing. You know, it's a, I mean? it's a slippery slope. I mean, I get it, but like when it comes down to like, there's a certain level of comfort and familiarity yeah. you still want every time. Yeah. So yeah, like again, it's a precarious ledge to that every on. artist yeah. walks. Yep. Unless hey, you're Jimmy, Nickelback, then you don't. Jimmy's care. right now thinking. Fuck, man, he's doing the Opeth thing again. He's getting into that again. He's... <laughs> Uh, I would be on that same page, but yeah. quick hello. Uh, we had Mike, Mean Metal Mike popped in. He's going to see who was it? Metal oh. Church. Metal Church is playing near us. That's right. Possessed is playing uh, Friday night. Mean Metal Mike. Nick just went to see him. Said uh, Jeff Becerra's voice was a little rough last night. Um, also, real quick, we got E Bauer, the Uplift Mofo Party Machine, is here. There's a slight little red hot chili peppers reference there. Uh, we've got Malia was here a little bit ago. Hi, Malia. If you're gone, sorry. And uh, Frederick was in here, but we're not talking thrash. Thrash, so Frederick didn't stick around. I'm sure. He might like uh, the first album. Go ahead, Jimmy. Talk about uh, Kindly Ben. Um, I mean, yeah, I think I think Nick hit on some good points. I think uh, you know, it's it's where do you where do you uh, you know for a band like Cynic who's uh, progressive? I mean, like. Like I would have been happy with a Trace and Error Part Two as well. I mean, like I think that they exist in a space that they already are so unique that they could have just, you know, kept writing just good songs and 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 keeping the same kind of 
I don't know, formula or whatever. But and it's also interesting that you found, uh, you know, the whole wheels, the wheels beyond wheels uh, thing, you know, like the, cause they did, they, they kind of went to a power trio here. So I wonder if right. there was some, some influence from rush to kind of like strip it down a bit and like, kind of just, I think that artists of this nature need to, uh, you know, such as uh, the members of Cynic need, I guess maybe they need to feel like they're able to, you know, uh, kind of go somewhere else, you know, and do, do something a little different. Um, and at this point, even further away from carbon based anatomy is that they're, uh, really back, you know, for good at this point. And now they need to kind of, uh, you know, take the band to another place. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't really like this record either when it first came out, I was a little like, yeah, uh, it, it was, it was like, I like happy music every now and then, or, or just if you want to call it happy, but like, uh, it, this was just a little too, um, you know, it, I like my cynic a little bit more, you know, like, older stuff, like, yeah, just more Space. otherworldly. And yeah, yeah, where this it felt to me like they were being more of a kind of a rock band. And that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Just at the time, it's just like, that's kind of what I want out of my cynic. I want, I want to be, you know, I want to be swept away to the cosmos. I want to be, you know, I think like, that's what Nick was trying to say more or less. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. so like, but I think it's kind of cool what they did because they took the, you know, the, the core of the band, you know, the, you know, the three members, which are the most integral of the band and, and put, that's kind of cool, you know, that's that. And I remember thinking that was a cool thing to do. Um, I just didn't really quite warm up to it uh, when it came out. It just wasn't. Uh, and I was and, and we're also talking about a time where we thought, you know, Cynic's back. They're here to stay. You know, maybe it's a record. They kind of went this way and the next one will be kind of, you know, a different way. That's going to kind of pull me back in. And, uh, but over time, uh, it, it, you know, I, I didn't really uh, I probably went years and then I went back to it and it, grow on me a little bit more i like that it still maintains the the short and to the point idea even though like you know they've done that really wonderfully with you know progressive music now they really did it really good with rock music that they were just be able to just strip it down in these these short songs i felt like the uh the album was a little inconsistent like it like what i love about the previous records is that they were just like the book ended feeling of it like it was it was perfect kind of from start to finish and everything felt like in place whereas this um you know like I mean, I feel like it's a little top heavy, like the first half of the records, uh, like everything up through like Moonheart, like Moonheart Sunhead, great, great song. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, great, yeah. great, Mal great Malone moments on that, you know, I mean, everybody shines, you know, musically. Uh, but after that, you know, like uh, it, uh, the last three tracks kind of start to kind of like, you know, they're not bad or anything. They just don't, uh, they, they don't feel as strong as the rest of the record and don't give me that same, uh, you know, joy that I get out of getting to the end of it, especially like, endlessly bountiful the last track is supposed to be like the big you know they, they do the the closing kind of ambient uh you know spoken word thing that's supposed to like kind of really elevate you and it kind of for me just kind of just went you know so just just kind of straight you know it didn't really kind of go up or down or anything uh but you know and i think just the overall vibe of the record like is what kind of threw me off a bit you know but i mean because you know it's cynic and they they all again they all sound great they all the performances are really good it just wasn't really quite what i wanted but uh uh still it's 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 interesting to see them kind of kind of do this and i think maybe it did I, I don't really know to what extent reinert was not like really all about what they were doing here i i think the fallout really kind of came with you know they were they were they were starting to tour more malone was actually touring with them and i so pissed i never yeah. got to see play with malone playing live but yeah um you know i think uh i remember reading some interviews with him saying that he didn't feel like him and paul were on the same page in terms of live performance like they weren't rehearsing enough and he felt like uh you know and then you know i think reiner struggled with some issues i don't want to really you know like based off some of the things I, I i read you know i think i think there were some uh some demons that he was dealing with and uh you know especially with his relationship with, with paul um I think that it was a very, uh, it, it seemed to be a very positive thing for him uh, to leave the band. Like, I think that, I think he needed to leave and which was, you know, to me, like Cynic is not the same without Reiner on drums, but. I'm trying to remember something. One, let me interject one point. Mm -hmm. This was 17, right? Or no, when did this come out? 14. 14. Was yeah. this, was this around the time that they both kind of came out publicly? Yep, same year. That's yeah. what I thought. That's what I thought. Yeah. I'm wondering if, there was a lot of tension over that and, and the fact that, you know, they're both, they both were gay. 
I don't think they were ever in a relationship that no. I'm aware of. I don't think, but they, you know, they, I don't know if one wanted to make it public and the other didn't, or, you know, what the story was there. I didn't dig that deep into it, but it seems kind of weird that right around that time, Reiner starts to drift away, you know, that there's, a yeah. drift, there's a rift there. And from what I understand, it didn't really get repaired. I don't think before Sean died. That no. I'm no. Well, I mean, like, I think, I think they, they came to some understanding, you know, and I think it was just kind of, uh, I don't, I, I, I would be, you know, probably completely, uh, getting it wrong. Cause I read, I mean, these are interviews I read six years ago or whatever, yeah. you know, but like, I just remember thinking that like, yeah, they obviously were not on the same page anymore. I know Reiner was in a, rela- a long-term relationship with somebody. Yeah. Yeah, he was married. Yeah, he got married. yeah. I mean, I don't think that they were, uh, you yeah. know, I, who knows, you know I mean? But like, um, I, I don't f- I don't necessarily feel that there was any tension when you no, listen to the music in this. I feel like you know when you listen to this record, I feel like it, it seems like they were all on the same page. Like this is what you know was the next thing. Um, but you know, um, yeah, I mean, going back to it, it's still a good record. I still really dig it. It's probably my least favorite, but um, I like that they kind of just tried something a little bit different. Maybe Masvidal was a little bit. I, th- I feel like he was a lot heavier on this. Like it was kind of his direction, and I feel like you know, like maybe his vocals got a little too, um, maybe just a little too. Ha- I hate to say too happy. I don't really know what else to say, but it's just a little, um, a little more happier than I than I feel like it, it, in a way that it maybe was a little forced, and, and I don't know. Well, it may have been um, that you know, like for example, the song, um, the song. Uh, the lions roar really sounds like a radio play and, right. and it's a good song man. it's a good song it's a great I mean, song great really riff song. but i think you're right about the vocals there's a lot less etherealness to yeah vocals on this he, he stripped off here. almost all of the vocal order effects like you, right. you could like again well it kind of works with how the album sounds it's a little right. bit more right. organic warmer and, and more yeah. organic yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, more it's, cynic, it's cynic power trio rock yeah. kind of, you know yeah. and that's cool that's cool in a way you know it just yep. Yep. it just wasn't what i want out of cynic and you know, I mean, again, like Moonheart Sunhead, I mean, that's great. I mean, that's probably my favorite song on here, but the, the opening track, I and mean, still a lot of the title track's great too. I mean, it's, it's yeah. good, good stuff. It just, it just kind of falls off a little bit toward the end for me. Like it just didn't feel as concise as like, you know, what they've done previously. And I mean, this is a band that, I mean, this is only their third record, right? I mean, which is uh, hard to believe three yeah. records mm-hmm. and two EPs. Now they were doing other stuff with AI yeah. Smoke and with Portal, but I mean, still, it's pretty crazy. The, the great cover art though man yeah Amazing. oh they're, dude Fun they're not awesome. exactly the most prolific writers but the thing and they weren't even i don't know what their tours were like but i don't think they went on like constant they weren't constantly touring i know that i think but, they probably toured the most like for trace snare like yeah between that and carbon based they were they were touring a lot and it was mostly when they had the exivius guys with them you know and then they then they that kind of fell off i don't know what happened with those guys but um, then yeah. they were kind of like starting to having to get guys. And then Malone was with them for a bit, you know, and if you go look, um, if you go look on YouTube, there's the final show they played uh, as, as Malone, Reinhardt and Masvidal was in Japan. And uh, you can kind of tell in that show that it wasn't quite, um, if you go watch it, I mean, everybody's, it, they still sound really great, but there's, there's a few fuck ups here and there. And it just seems like they weren't quite on the level that oh, you know, I remember wow. Reiner talking about how he didn't feel like, we're not rehearsing enough and we're not really prepared for this. And him and Masvidal just weren't on the same page. I think Reiner was struggling with some things. And I think maybe some of those things might've contributed to his death. I don't really know. I don't really truly know what killed him. All we, all you read about is that it was a heart, a heart failure or a heart condition yeah. or something, yeah. but he was, and I don't know if you guys remember, but he had kind of gained a lot of weight. A lot of weight. Time. And, and, uh, and then he like kind of lost some. And I remember seeing interviews with him when he was saying that, like, like he felt like he was in a healthier place. And then he kind of disappeared. He was like doing, he was doing a project called perfect beings. I think it was called. And then all of a sudden he died, man. And it was just like, man, what the fuck? Yeah. That was kind of weird. That was I weird. remember Reinhardt bringing up uh, finances and how the band was managed to like, I mean, th- those, those sorts of conversations and arguments are all too frequent in bands too. But yeah, I, I don't know. Like I, re- I really wish they'd suck it out, but you know, I mean, if Me it too. wasn't, if it wasn't working, then it wasn't working. You can't force that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was a weird, you know, thing to see that Masvidal was going to continue it with a new drummer, you know, even when Reiner was alive, it was like, yeah. man, that's just, uh, God, it's just impossible to, to imagine, you know, uh, but I don't know, man, you know, it's just, 
these things, I yeah, mean, like know, this, we, this band has had a weird trajectory. We, uh, we yeah. forgot to mention one big thing uh, in the, oh, fuck, what year, what year was it? 93? When did, yeah. human, when did human come? 93. Out? 93. So, you know, they, they didn't really get busy on their follow-up after that because Chuck came in and said, oh, I need you to come play for me. And I need you to come play for me. And Malone, I don't need you. But I, <laughs> these other two guys I need. And then they went out and did a bunch of touring with him. And we all know how that was an interesting thing. Because anybody that went out on tour with with, with uh, the mercurial, let's put it that way, mercurial Chuck Schuldiner that... You just never knew exactly what was going to happen to an extent. He so, fired him over the phone. Like, which is that's why they still... didn't, Yeah, which is why oh. they, didn't, they didn't stay. So, uh, But many would argue that's the finest hour of death. Um, so, uh, yeah. Are you done, Jimmy, or are you good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not a 10 out of 10, though, I'm sensing. Oh, no, no. I mean, it's, again, I still enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's my least favorite Cynic record, I think. But it's – and, again, you know, there's – it, going back to it, it grew on me over time, but it just, um, you know, so an eight it, and a half, a nine. Yeah, I'll give it an eight. eight. How about eight. an eight? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Still, still really good. I mean, it's fucking cynic, you know. And we have, we have very few cynic records, and um, you know, I, I mean, I, I mean, just for Moonheart Sunhead, I'd give it an eight, you know, because that's, I mean, that's my own great song, yeah. brilliant, you know, but. I don't know, man. It's uh, yeah. I, I again, like I, I really appreciate it for what it is and what they tried to do with it. Even if I didn't really quite like it at the time it came out, and even if, like, I would have thought, like, it, because at the time I, I learned later that I have to, you know, I, I was happy to appreciate it a lot more, knowing that we just weren't going to get a lot more music from these guys. You know, like it, it was kind of short lived. You know, and, and yeah. what we get, and uh, maybe maybe that's not what we yeah. felt when even it came out. Number, uh, Ninety-one, my bad. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Nate is right. It was '91. It was late '91. Um, that also played a role in getting Focus done, I believe, and getting yeah. it out. Um, yeah. But they it didn't last long. They did a couple of tours, and that was kind of it. And they went back to doing what they they did best. And I think, from what I gather, and I don't know, I, Paul, if you're watching, I've been trying to reach out to you. I've sent you numerous emails, Kelly will vouch for me. I'd love to talk to you about all this stuff, but I get it if you don't want to do it. But um, the uh, it'd be very interesting to hear what went down there and during that period of time because I know that Paul Paul even lived with Kelly for a short while or the other way around. Kelly lived with Paul and I think that um, those two were very, very tight. Um, I don't know. I don't think the same level of friendship dynamic was there with Chuck and, and that commitment to that. I think they were more committed to, to their own project. So I, it's always I'm pretty sure that's right. I'm pretty sure Paul and Sean, like I've, I've, I'm pretty sure Chuck wanted them to stay and they wanted to just keep doing they they wanted wanted to do to, their own thing. Yeah. They wanted to get cynic going. And, yep, yep, yep. Um, uh, yeah. Malone would have been sick. Although, Stevie D's not not a oh, not dude. The second yeah. yeah no 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 slip yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no slip in there a cynic without Reiner yeah I well you know what I I agree with you yes I don't know that they're trying to be like the cynic of old but I think this guy this guy's in there now is it Nate is that his name uh Matt right Matt Matt that's Matt it. sorry Lynch? that's it yeah. Um, I think he's pretty fucking good, man. I think he's pretty fucking good. Yeah. And um, yeah. we're going to talk about that in a minute here. Let me rip through Trace, and uh, we'll get on to the final album and get everybody home time for dinner um, at 12.30 a.m. <laughs> so, yeah, this uh, this album is – it definitely has a slightly different vibe to it. There's no doubt. Um, it's funny that – Paul kind of talks about it as more futuristic and alien and sci-fi. I hear that more on Ascension Codes. I don't quite hear it on that this one. Um, I hear I don't hear a band trying to be a modern rock band, but I, as rock as in rock, you know, like hard rock or but I do hear there's a it's a little more stripped down. You guys talked about with the, the trio thing. 
Um, there's a little less, well, no, quite a bit less of that etherealness that kind of is in every track prior to. Now it's a little bit more earth tony, I guess is a weird way of putting it. You know what I mean? Um, it's just got that vibe to it. Uh, true hallucination, super cool proggy fusiony guitars, angular note choices on this one that uh, flows, uh, constantly flows, moving, busy bass backing as usual, crazy drumming. That it's got a very catchy chorus and a stellar soloing by Paul. Lions were probably the most rock like riff Paul has ever written in a long time. Still, it's a very cool track. The chorus is super badass, most radio friendly track by Cynic ever, frankly. I think it's their most radio-friendly track they've ever done. Uh, and yet, it's still a ripper. The bass and guitar interplay before the section that gets all shoegazy. Super amazing. So good. I hear a good bit of Muse in this track. That's what I was hearing, like Black Holes hear a Muse, which isn't a bad yeah. thing. Muse, yeah, no. Uh, Kindly Bent to Free Us, killer track. The melodies and playing on another level in Malone playing is super sick all over this track that's a fucking badass track man infinite shapes another amazing track love the guitar tones very alex lifesing on this big sustained chorusy washy chords uh and the chorus itself is, is i love it um and then moonheart sunhead lots of solos on this one as well as some spoken word about consciousness very emotionally moving song as far as how it moves from movement to movement very cool track Black and blue and smile. At, I love this. Black and blue and smile at fear. That's a line they use in there. Man, dude. If there's anybody I know that's black and blue and smiling at fear, we won't get into it, but I know it. I live it every fucking day. That really hit me hard. Um, enough that it actually made me tear up. It, just that line resonates so intensely with me. Killer detailed stuff going on in the background. Like the chant like vocals that come in and move, they they sweep through the uh through the mix. You you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's like that chanting almost like a not like a monk chant, but almost like a Middle Eastern sort of uh, almost like a maybe an Indian sort of chant of sorts. Something they kind of carried over from carbon based, I think. Yeah. Love that. Uh love that on the musical landscape in the final minute. Super layered. Katanji driving intro with super Pachucci like guitar note choices. Droning chords with pedal tones until it hits the vocal section. Very straightforward for a cynic saw, but very proggy, prog metal to my ears. I kind of agree with Jimmy. The last three tracks don't do it as much for me. Holy Fallout, it's a great track, although probably my least favorite on the album. But since I really like them all, that's not saying much. Very Vi meets Holdsworthy and on the, the solo on this one. Earth is uh, endlessly bountiful. Paul sounds so much like the singer from Ocean Size on this one. I can't say it enough. Ocean Size, Ocean Size, Ocean Size. Um, gorgeous guitar ending to that song. It's got a really cool guitar sort of fade out where Paul's doing some uh, almost like some jazz like chords at the end, playing uh, in the outro of the song. Earth is my witness. Very King Crimson y intro. Those synths have the beginning of um, in the chord of the Crimson Kim where it goes ah, ah, ah. ah. Those chords are kind of underlying. They're not Mellotrons. It's just the synth chords. Um, and then nothing like them at all. Nothing like Crimson at all. But it gets into this unusual synth that reminds me of, of again, at the beginning there of King Crimson. Cool track. Another monster album of killer songs, killer melodies, stunning playing. You could argue that there's a wee bit of a formula, except all the songs are just so killer. Who cares if there's actually a formula? 9.25 out of 10. And the only reason I deduct a little bit is because this one didn't speak to me quite the way traced, focused, and this next one we're going to talk about. Um, so there you go. So anybody got any final thoughts on Kindly Bent? We good? Um, I think pretty covered there for me. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> yep. um, this guy, King Igor, who jumps in a lot of my stuff, knows jazz. Lion's Roar is Buddhism term. KB2FU is Buddha Cosmic Prog Metal. Okay. Hmm. Didn't know that. That makes sense, though, because I think Paul's a Buddhist. He goes on these retreats and stuff. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Tell me Lyle Gruber didn't rip a page from Kev. I, I don't know what you're talking about, Alex. Yeah, I'm sorry. Must be some other. Hmm. Yeah, must be some other combo. 
Sean was weird because at the time he dug death metal, and when he jumped in, he made the cats rethink how they approached the set all the while wanting to play other shit. Studying jazz, Prague one. Okay, I got you. Got you. Um, Nate, final comment here. Love how Holy Fallout ends, especially the drums. Yeah, I like the end of this song. I'm not. I think it's a little weaker early in the track. But yeah, the I, end of it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, Ascension Codes. Anybody got that one? Okay. Nick, let me do a couple quickies on this. Came out November 26, 2021, on Seasons of Mist. Artwork uh, by Martina Hoffman. Drums Matt Lynch. Graphics design, Travis Smith. I didn't know that was Travis Smith. How about that? Um, guitar lyrics by Paul Masvidal, mastered by Andrew Mendelson. Mixed by Warren Riker again. Music by Cynic, producer, Paul Masvidal, Warren Riker. And then synthesizer and bass synthesizer are Dave Mackey. Again, we've got no bass player now. Uh, Sean Malone has passed. I think there was some existing bass tracks that, or did he lose those? I don't know. I think, I think he was, was working seven. on the album with Paul, but I don't know that they ever recorded anything. Yeah, um, either that or else he lost. He had a, hard, a bunch of hard drives stolen. Uh, somebody broke into his house and stole a bunch of his hard drives or something like that, all, from all that stuff. Um, real quick on this, lots of intros and interludes that thread things together, all ethereal and dreamy. So I, on mine, I'm only noting the standout track of the actual uh, almost fully realized songs. For me, uh, go ahead, Nick. What do you got on this one? Well, we did bring up how much I love intros and interludes already. So <laughs> <laughs> naturally, the version that I listen to doesn't have all those because I think it's it's a little overboard on this one. Even as far as like intros and oh, I you know like interludes go, I get that they are themed to tie it together. You have a lot of ambiance and uh, different languages spoken, different things said. I'm sure it ties the album together, but I wanted to really get down the songs, and uh, I dig this. This is really good. It's it's different. It's different for a lot of ways. Immediately, the first thing that I was going to judge was the drum work, and Matt Lynch kills it, but he doesn't try to just play like Sean. In fact, his drum style is vastly different in a yeah, lot of ways. So yep. A lot of faster playing, a lot of... Uh, like kind of like breakbeat sort of stuff. Like there's like drum loops peppered in, but he'll match them. His uh, snare fills are wild all over the place. Like kind of the same way that, you know, Reinhardt loved to use the hi-hat. He likes to do all the ghost notes on the snares, but his drum style is very energetic. And I think that really kind of propels the songs. And the songs are, all right, this is kind of like <laughs> a perfect little balance between Carbon Bass Anatomy and Traced and Air. You have heavier riffs again, a more metallic tone overall to the guitars, but it's very spacey once again. Like, in fact, yeah. I think these are the most effects like, layered vocals that Paul might have ever done. Like, maybe bordering on too much at some times because you kind of almost lose his voice and all of the layers and the sweeping synths and vocorder filters and such, but that does contribute to the atmosphere. And I think the synth work on here absolutely rules. It's yep. really fucking good. I do miss the fact that there isn't an actual basis on there because, again, Sean Malone had such a great melodic touch to everything he did, as well as mm -hmm. supplying the fucking low end and you know rhythmically. I mean, yeah, he he was half of again one of the best you know rhythm sections in metal ever, uh, but. You know, the bass synths do their job. They they hold it together. I, I understand that that was probably kind of a, a necessary fix in order to get the album done. But uh, it is something that I feel kind of hampers it a little bit. But overall, I like this intensity on here. It's, again, still a wash with atmosphere. It feels more, again, metallic in spots. But again, I don't know. It, it, feels, it feels very familiar. It feels familiar. It feels like Cynic. It doesn't feel like Cynic experimenting as much. Like they're like, all right, we're gonna do a Cynic album, but we're gonna make it stand out. But this is gonna be immediately recognizable as Cynic. It doesn't. It isn't gonna sound like Kindly Bent to Free Us or really anything. It's going to be a unique Cynic, uh, a unique Cynic album once again. And I dig it. I gave it three and a half stars initially when I reviewed it, and uh, I don't do like three and three quarters, but. I don't, it's it's closer to a four now. 
like going over it and again stripping out all the interludes because they do get to be a bit much in fact uh one of these tracks on here God, which one was it uh is it the one with all the ai stuff in it yeah, yeah i think there's oh i forget which one that's like the only the last couple of minutes of the song is the actual song and the rest of it is like essentially a long interlude i think uh, that's a dna activation. dna activation yeah, DNA, yeah 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 I fucking that love one, that. I think that's super cool. I think it's cool, but you know, when they get down to the song, which is kind of like it kind of you know uh hooks back up with uh, uh was it uh wings where are you got these tracks are all over the place here? Architects and consciousness. Yeah, yeah, the winged ones. It kind of links back up with that in terms of, like the melody. Oh, you're talking about oh yeah, well there's recurring mel melodic motifs in here. Yeah, yeah. and, and I think that's recurring. a good way to tie it together. Yeah, like you know, you get stuff that's repeated, like revisited, and then they slightly tweak it. But uh, yeah, this album's really fucking cool. And again, another one that's kind of unique in its own way. But you, once again, you have maybe more familiarity than you've had on uh, some other albums. Like it's immediately sounds closer to like the older Cynic. But uh, yeah, dig well, it. I would say. I would say this has more of a trace than air vibe to it. Yeah, I still get a lot of the atmosphere, like the atmosphere the itself. Atmospheric part. The atmosphere itself really reminds me of carbon based, but mix that like with trace because trace had some intensity to it. It was uh, definitely a more metallic album. This has some more metal moments, but there's also a lot of atmosphere. And again, there's like atmospheric elements that play a huge part that kind of push the guitars back. And this time it's really cool synth work. And yeah, the synth work in this album is fantastic. I, I fucking love it. Like an extra spacey wow. Emerson Lake and Palmer. Well, there's an are you guys familiar at all with uh Pliny? Do you know Pliny? Pliny Australian guitar. Pliny. I love you know, I love I, Pliny. Yeah. Huh? Lo I love Pliny. Okay, yeah. I hear a lot of Pliny on this album. Well, he's and, on this album. Huh? He's on this album. Oh, does he play the solo yeah. in the okay? That's that's what I thought when I was listening. As Nate asked who played the solo in, um, uh, where's that shit? Uh, oh. Where'd you where'd you put, where'd that go? Anyone know who plays the solo in the Winged Ones? Is that what the one he's on, Jimmy? I think so. I know Plenty is on this record, and Plenty is very much like Animals as Leaders. It's like, but he's a little like less a lot aggressive. It's a little more worldly, like and more like it's it's more like uh song. It's more song based and yeah and, and melodic. Yeah, and, where he's uh, using the guitar as almost like a voice. Yeah, yeah. Great, I've seen plenty. Great I stuff. Saw, I saw plenty and intervals open up for animals. That was a crazy fucking. Night. I saw that tour too. Insanity yeah. guitar shit. Like what the fuck, man? Yeah, but I but I I think if anything, plenty. Was influenced. His sound was influenced by early Cynic, and he's now kind of become an influence for yeah, an influence for Paul music. maybe to feed off of. Uh, does it say in there, Nick? Uh, I can't find the specific track because once again, like <laughs> Cynic yeah, likes to be uh, very strange about they <laughs> who's the playing this. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> they have him listed as two uh solo scape plenty. Uh it doesn't say what are, tracks. Yeah, no. Uh guitar codes, artifacts, dark, uh crystal bowl attunements. It's Michael. Who uh, else who else played on the album? Is there anyone else? Uh oh, Amy oh, Carrera no. does the female vocals. Let's see. Who else? I'm just gonna there's go. There's not to a lot of guy. info on there's not a lot of info out there on it. Uh, well, I mean, Max Phelps does some additional vocals. Well, I know yeah. that. I knew, I knew Max. He, he's the only standout other guitar player that I can see on the line. Yeah. Notes. I'm he's wondering, I'm wondering if Max did some of the solos too. Wouldn't well, they have him listed as Reptilian Collective. So, what? Yeah. <laughs> Max Phelps is a uh, Reptilian Collective. That's what. That's a, yeah, that's that's what the liner notes say. Yeah, reptilian collective. And it says <laughs> for funny. plenty, it says two solo escapes. So I know he's got solos on this. I just you know I think if if 
if you if it's what you're talking about, that's definitely him because he's got a recognizable sound. Yeah, uh, Plenty definitely has a very recognizable yeah. sound. Then I would have like, guessed. I would have guessed that too. It was if you, if you, you know, those are the codes. That. I guess. Can't read them. I see here it is. Guest musician, guitar co codes, artifacts, dark reptilian collective, <laughs> DLB meta terrestrial. No idea what that means. Two solo. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's either Max or. Plenty, and my guess is it's plenty on that. I, I think your third eye also needs glasses because I totally understood all of that. You did? <laughs> cool beans. All right. Um, uh, where are we at here? Uh, Jimmy, Ascension Codes. Uh, man, I, I love the, the little tribute that he yeah. put there for uh, yeah. Reiner and Malone. Um, the fields. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, I mean, and like, Nate has a good point here. Plenty plays, uh, plenty, uh, yeah, plenty plays. I believe he plays the Strandberg, right? Uh, yeah. Nate, I'm pretty sure it is. And, um, uh, Paul Masvidal has the Masvidalian signature model Strandberg. So, yeah, headless guitar. Crazy. Jeez, he even kind of looks like Paul. Wow. Like a younger one. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? Pretty weird. It's kind of haunting. Yeah, season of mist uh, spared no expense when it came to this uh, vinyl press. Wow. Hey, yeah, Logan really popped like... in, man. Logan popped in. What's up, Logan? See if you're right. Is that a colored uh, vinyl or? Yeah, this is the. Uh, you don't often yeah. see a trifold jacket like that. Holy shit. Yeah, it's uh, kind of clear. Ooh. 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 Spam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jimmy, my birthday was like a month and a half. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Let me let me go look and see what other shit that I can part with. I'll send you some stuff. You know? <laughs> I'm just kidding, but um, yeah, I, know, I know you are. Um, so yeah, man, yeah, get into it. Um, it's kind of like uh, a little bit back to the cynic that I I like. You know, in terms of the, like what I want to hear from the band. Like you know, leaving Trace and uh, Kindly Bent. It's more kind of back to that more otherworldly, ethereal kind of sound. And yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting because like it's it's like it's like Paul tried to compose like a, uh, like a soundtrack, you know, which is, that's to me is Super what the cinematic, right? Super yeah. It's very cinematic. cinematic. It's, you know, that's the difference here from like previous albums is that it's like this, you know, like this epic kind of just, you know, I, I, I always feel like all cynic records are, are meant to be listened to, you know, start to finish and, yep. and you have, you know, like have that, uh, that feeling, not necessarily like a soundtrack, but like, Whereas, you know, Conley Bent like moved away from that a little bit, but this one kind of really truly brings together that, uh, that idea of like, this thing needs to be kind of listened to as just kind of one big epic piece. Um, I feel like it got a little out of control with some of the interludes, like, because like, I feel like he was trying to make a point with, with the interludes rather than let the interludes serve the music. Like, whereas like they've always done so great with things like interludes, uh, that it really truly served what was to come and it 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 works okay like in, in certain parts and it's not like overbearing enough to where like it, it takes away you know because all the interludes are pretty short they're just like you know 20 seconds or whatever kind of just a little the little uh you know middle piece to the next piece yeah but um I don't know. It's kind of just interesting how how they sequenced uh the songs on this record because it kind of takes a little while for it to get going. It feels like, like it, you know, it, it it's, well, I love the, 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 the first track is just an instrumental track and it's really, really great. It kind of introduces uh, the new drummer, you know, you're kind of getting an idea of what you're getting into. It's, it's, but even like when the vocals start to come in on uh, elements, yeah. Elements, you know, I, I just, I feel like the songs themselves, like take a little while before they start to really kind of, get to where they need to be i guess you know like it still feels like you're in soundtrack mode until like halfway through the record um and then like the songs start getting really you know a little bit more uh poignant i guess like more stand out um i feel like uh the interesting thing about it is i feel like as it goes it gets better and better all the way yeah. up to the end of the record you know like uh i think the last uh truly uh you know actual songs on here are the best songs on the album. Um, the Architects of Consciousness. Uh, oh, man. Like, if you look at the back here, they're all, like, out of order. I know. That, <laughs> I had to go on my fucking... Yeah. Dude, dude. But the, but the dude, last... The, the intro uh, to Aurora... 
Oh, great. That fucking melody on the guitar. Oh, it's just massive and gigantic and sucks me in so much. Well, where I truly feel like the most, I mean, the strongest songs on here, I feel like are the last two songs in a, in a multiverse where Adam sing and diamond light body. Oh, Those two songs, diamond light body is beautiful. Diamond light body is amazing. Uh, as is in a multiverse where Adam sing, I love the way that comes in. It's just, uh, it feels like classic cynic, but like, um, overall, I mean, I, I really like the record. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's again, like, I got to feel like this is the end. I mean, I don't know if it's the end and if it is, I'm okay with it. If it's not, I'm a little concerned. So, but like, I don't really, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, you know what he did with this, like, as you know, I do feel like it's a tribute to the fallen members in a way, but like, I really don't, I'm not a huge fan of the bass, what he did on the bass here. Like, I just feel like, it was it was kind of a I don't know I don't want to say it was like a snap decision but it was just like you kind of went with man how many bases could you have picked to like come in and do like a killer bass you know kind of thing he could have gotten he could have gotten Stevie G in there oh. e in there and, or something you know and just come in like guys that know what Malone does and, and like give give us a true bass guitar I feel like the bass synth is kind of just a little bit too much because there's already a lot of synth going on on the record you know so it's yeah. like. It that's blends me, the like, background. Yeah, it yeah. kind of turned it into like this uh, a little too unnatural feeling to me. Like, you know, it was just like, it was like you kind of had to uh, quickly figure out what you're going to do here and like, you know, and, and say, well, I don't really want to replace Malone, but you had to replace Reinhardt as well. So why not, you know, bring in like, fuck, get Linus from Obscura or, or fucking, you know, there's a lot of, you know, killer basis I'm oh sure. beyond creation uh, i can't think of that dude's that name. dude yeah or even the guy that got torn with him now probably could have done done something cool you know or I mean, yeah uh, well like you know with sean he, he put such a signature on the songs and you know generally you think of basis is just like you know like, hey they're, they're there to anchor the rhythm right not really do a lot to accent stuff but sean was fucking incredible like he added different melodies to it yeah. You know, melodies you could pick out. The the bass sense are it's pretty much like kind of a, a root note affair. Like, all right, here's that. Yeah, here's it, the it, bass. Yeah. Yeah. There it yeah, is. It's not, it's not, I mean, like, I think he could have brought just like he did with Matt Lynch, who who does a wonderful job. You know, the guy comes in, like he he adds his own flavor. He's not like he channels Reinhardt. He does like he does play to the cynic style, but also brings his own sort of personality to the drumming and he's an amazing drummer and fantastic fit oh. uh you know but I, I i just feel like he could have found somebody to do that as well with the bass but you know who knows what he was going through to try to get this thing happening yeah like, that's you know, the other that's the other side of this thing he may have been battling a lot of shit you know yeah. you gotta keep in mind he started alone putting, died not long before this was all yeah i was gonna say he's trying start to put this stuff together you got to believe he's probably one of the first people that gets that call about yeah. Sean from his parents or his friends or whoever, whoever found Sean. I think it was his parents, I believe. Um, yeah, just, I don't know, man. You know, he, he lost two people that were integral to his life inside of 11 months. I, and, I would be surprised if, 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 if Paul said, hey, man, if I'd have had the time, I would have gotten, you know, fucking, you know. Right, urine from the the first you know obscure record or you know like it just you know things probably just didn't work out that way and he kind of did what he what he had to do to to make the re record yeah. kind of fruition and it's really not that big of a deal I mean like it still is fine and like with everything else that's going on in the music it it still you know doesn't detract from it it just no. wasn't quite what I was hoping but overall you know uh, this being you know the the, the post uh, Malone Reiner. And, and, uh, knowing that, you know, I don't know, it just like, for me, like, I, I can't really see how he's going to continue. Like, well, I'd be totally happy that, if this let's was Let's leave that for the last topic. Let's discuss yeah. that. Oh, okay. For the last yeah, topic. no worries. So, mm -hmm. um, cause I do want to ask a question about that. So, mm -hmm. although I think Nate has a good point here, um, that he said real bass would have been cool. I do really like the bass lines that were played via the synths though and i'm assuming that paul wrote them with malone in mind and i wouldn't be surprised with that either um because paul would know that that writing better malone style and of play better than anyone else in the world that's you know out there right you know we all know it as a signature sound paul knows it like 
nobody's business. And we don't even know if there were existing rough tracks of Sean putting, you know, some stuff together for this thing. You know what I mean? So um, I'm going to hit it real quick and then we'll, we'll wrap it up with a final. I'll be story. back in just a bit. I got to pee again yeah. and grab a smoke. All right. So, uh, you know, as I said, lots of intros and interludes here that thread things together, all theory on dreamy. So only noting the standout, standout interludes and the actual tracks themselves. The winged one, man, what a killer instrumental. It is. Searing leads, heavenly melodies, just fucking insane. And it kind of recalls like textures in a way, you know? Uh-huh. It kind of recalls yeah. textures, you it know? Does. It does. Kind of yeah, it very much away. does. Very much a mixture of those two. Although on the winged ones, I kind of hear this almost like anthemic uplift, uplifting theme in the guitar, which kind of goes throughout the whole record. There's a couple of those, right? Um, Elements in her inhabitants, those recurring melodic motifs from the winged ones. It's there. You can hear them. Uh, so ear catchy, unforgettable. I fucking love, love Mythical Serpents, man. I fucking love this song. It's so good. The playing is insane. The musicianship is mind-blowing. Again, I hear Pliny on here, so I probably was right. I think I heard Pliny play on there. Yeah. Maybe where Pliny got it sound. The vocal sections on Mythical Serpents. They're just fucking staggering, man. They're just uh, unbelievably amazing. Six-dimensional archetype. Again, jaw-dropping textures. The amazing attention to detail in the mix. The ambiance. Again, breath gaze at its finest. DNA, cool. Uh, DNA's, what's it called again? D. DNA something? Fuck. DNA activation template. That's it. Yeah. Uh extremely oh wait where'd it go oh it almost sounds like an ai driven robot speaking it's a woman speaking but it's in a robotic tone and just it sounds like a robot dreaming sequence that's what i kept thinking of very cinematic very blade runner i kept thinking blade runner throughout this album a lot you know what i mean um and it's actually it's, it's actually ironic because the uh, i watched yesterday late last night probably like one o'clock till three o'clock before i started digging into some of these albums after taking a break i watched event horizon for the first time you ever see event horizon oh Hell yeah and i'm like this some of this music would be just so apropos for that movie you know what i mean that part where he's like this place is a tomb which reminded me of a frontline assembly song um anyway uh yeah architects of consciousness Smoking incense, playing by the new guy on drums. Uh, he's just unbelievable. And searing leads by Paul. Maybe it's maybe it's Max. Maybe it's I, Paul can play fucking blistering solos though. So it, you know, it could have been him too. It doesn't sound like Pliny on that one though. Um, Aurora. Oh man. Yeah, Aurora's great. Oh, that intro sequence. <laughs> Man, it's so amazing, dude. It's just, oh, it's just so heart wrenching and warming at the same time. Uh, those guitar melodies are mind bending, so killer. Probably my favorite track, along with Mystical Beast, so killer. Those vocal harmonies are badass, so gentle and lilting, but then massy, massive proggy guitar lines that get in your head. So good. In a multiverse, probably my least favorite track, to be honest. It's almost too over the top happy melodically and rhythmically and vocally but i do like it but it's probably my least favorite track which it's one of your favorites so there you go but diamond light body man oh what a monster especially the final minute of that song and those chords that wash in oh so epic and uplifting sounds like the opening of the heavens whatever that means um i know a lot of people hate interludes and feel they had nothing to or take away from nick where are you you're not here uh, but I don't agree. This album is cinematic in scope. It's glacially beautiful, cold. Now, check this out. This is what I hear. See if you hear this. It's glacially cold and robotic from the outside, yet warm and comforting inside the crevasses of the music. Once you you you, you allow your brain and your ears and your head to get inside the, the meat of the songs, they're just... They're just like a big fucking warm hug. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's well said. Um, it's a 10 out of 10. Easy 10 out of 10. Really? 
And I'm not going to lie to you. I've only listened to this twice. And the reason I did, because I didn't really even realize, I knew this came out, but I didn't really know it came out because it came out in 21 when I was getting very sick, right? So yeah. in 2020, I'm going through fucking mind-bending withdrawal. I'm only starting to come out of it around this time. We're in pandemic. We're in lockdown. There's too much going on sens sensory-wise for me. A lot of times I had to shut off from overexposure to noise and visual stimuli and all that shit because I was so not well. So I missed this. I kind of missed this album, right? And But to me, this is a stunning return and one I haven't checked out much like an idiot because of what I just told you about until this week for the deep dive. I must own this album. Like, I... I must own this album. Um, it's sad that Sean, the Sean's were not here to share in this. And I'm not sure what the stress was between the guys towards the end. I think Sean and Malone and Paul were working together and they were cool, but there was definitely something happening with Reiner and Paul. Um, and I know Paul put up a big post finally after nine or 10 months, he put a big post about his, feelings about everything, keeping it relatively, he kept it relatively close to the vest in terms of what was going on between them, but that they were, I believe he said they were in a phase where they were getting things worked out pretty well. So who knows? Um, who knows? You know, Paul, Paul Masvidal has been through a lot, man. He's been through a lot of pain. I, I don't, you know, I'm, how do I put this? Um, I have a few really close friends, right? That are like friends before I met all you guys, right? But I have a lot of really close friends from doing this the last almost three years, right? You two guys in particular. But there are other guys, Rick. And, you know, I mean, I don't want to get into naming names because it'll get fucking weird. But, like, if something happened, like one of you guys took your life or something like that or, or something, it would... It would fucking devastate me. It would really affect me hard, right? And I can't imagine what it's like to be Paul to lose two people that he loved deeply, right? I mean, those guys, he loved them deeply. As friends, as brothers, as... Paul's a very ethereal, you know, sp spiritual dude, right? So everything is... Everything is one. We're all we're all one big organism that functions together, right? And and so you surround yourself with the things that make you happy. And you know, I, I can't imagine what he had to go through to mentally accept one guy dies suddenly out of nowhere. We don't know if there was something involved or not, but allegedly not. And then the other guy takes his own life that you were super close to in many ways so like a brother so it would be it would be f fucking devastating for him to put this piece of work out after going through this is pretty i hear this as a as an astral connection to those two guys this album yeah does that make any sense sure no. like no. it's his way of connecting to two of the most important human beings in his life. And, you know, there's a great podcast out there. Paul, I really want you to come on, please. Please, please, please. Um, I know we'd have a killer interview. But there's a good one out there on the Cali Death podcast. I've referenced them a couple times. And they talk to him for about four hours. And a lot of it is about the music, but then it gets very esoteric and very spiritual and very you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, flower powery kind of sort of, but you know, Paul just seems like a beautiful human being, right? And sure. uh, <laughs> it, it just had to have been pretty devastating to go through this. So, as I said, this is a masterpiece tribute to both those incredibly important artists. So, I, I fucking love this album. I just amazing, man. Just amazing. Yeah. Well, I know how it affected me, man. I mean, uh, you know, it's like it's interesting when you love a band so much or you love somebody's music so much, even if you don't know the person, you know, when they pass, you know, it feels like you really knew them well and it affects you that way, you know. And like uh, when 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 Sean Reinhardt passed, I mean, like that was, that's my favorite drummer of all time, you know. I mean, that touched everything that I could think about the art of drumming and, uh, 
you know, like, and then when, yeah, he died not long after Peart died. They died in the same year. Remember that? And, uh, yeah. Neil Peart and uh, you know they like yeah, that's was, right. it was like Neil Peart died and then Reinhardt died. Yeah, like, Reinhardt died a few weeks later, later, right? It was like fuck, dude, I can't handle yeah. this. You know, but, yeah, um, man. And, but then Malone passing was like fuck, dude. What the fuck? I mean, and I remember, I remember when that that news broke and it was nobody was talking about what had happened. Steve DiGiorgio put something on his Instagram. He just said. Depression sucks, and I knew right away. I knew, yeah, right away what happened. I knew. I remember it. that. And I, I, I even said something like, "Dude, please tell me it's not so." And he just liked the comment. He didn't say anything. And well, I, that was I, the thing, man. I'm I mean, sure like Malone, those guys were good friends, right? You know. Oh sure, and I mean Malone wasn't a very public guy, you know. So no. it's like, and 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 like, I also felt like he never was recognized as much as he should have been, you know. And oh, like, for sure. I know that he struggled. I. I think Paul wrote about how he kind of struggled, you know, not feeling like he ever truly like reached the potential, which is crazy to me, um, you know, because I think he was a ve very well respected, uh, you know, teacher and, uh, you know, uh, yeah. not just a teacher. I mean, I think he, you know, he was a university professor, yes, I mean, he uh, was. you know, and like uh, and he put two great, great, three great records out, you know, which like and I, we talked a little bit about Gordy not, you know, but. You know anybody watching this? If you're not hip to these records, I mean, these were like the the these were like okay. what held me over when Cynic was not around. Yeah, I have. I don't think I have Element. I have the blue one. I def, I got that way back when that came out on uh, Jimmy. That came out on Laser's Edge, right? <clears throat> yeah, both of them. And and yeah. man, definitely get Emergent because yeah, it's just I, as good as this it. one, if not better. And it's got Bruford on it. It's I mean, like really good songs. In fact, uh, all the members of Cynic are on this one. Like uh, you right. know, this one. I think Masvidal was on, but this one, uh, Gobel came back, and um, and but also uh, you should seek out uh, Courtland. Uh, what I don't is know it? If you guys, this is uh, Malone's uh, solo record, Courtland. I don't know and that one at all. This is uh, this is Malone and Reiner, and uh, it's it's straight jazz fusion. Like whereas like uh, uh, you know Gordian Knots, like it's jazz fusion, but it's got a little bit of the metallic edge to it. And a yeah, it's dark. Of it's got some darker. Sort this of is just straight jazz fusion and like they even do a they do some coltrane covers on here and it's really fucking, really good yeah they do giant steps but they, they reinterpret it um oh. definitely go seek this out um if you've not heard it and uh, it's 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 you know it's just fucking more malone brilliant actually you know? sean malone played on uh john wesley's one album uh the last i think yeah. it was the last one or the one before john wesley who was a porcupine trees touring guitar player and has a solo cool solo yeah. uh stuff and i know he was working on a gordian not three I, that yes. just never never well, that's the shit that yeah. got ripped off i think that's the stuff that disappeared. really yeah because that would have been amazing because yeah. this is so good man i mean just yeah ken, you know, it's ken, not like it's ken it's, golden owns laser's edge he's on pete pardo's show that prog thing that they do every tuesday night ken golden he's the, the ball-headed jersey guy it's pretty pretty brazen Ken and I had a moment once a long time ago. It was not very pleasant at a uh, near fest thing, but uh, he knows his shit, dude. He's the guy that's signed Spiral Architect. He's been trying oh. to get them. He's been trying to get them to do another album for twenty some years. But uh, Ken, Ken, Ken also knew Sean very well and spoke incredibly highly of him. So hey, anyway, even, even like the Gordian Knot stuff, it's this is not just like instrumental wankery. It's very well written. Good. Yep. I mean, just uh, memorable, like uh, heartfelt, thoughtful music, you know, in, in the guise of like, you know, jazz fusion, you know, bass dominating. You know, there's a lot of Chapman stick on here. We didn't talk yep. about, you know, Sean doing the Chapman stick. I mean, like there's a lot of that on, on this stuff. All right. So here's what we'll wrap up with. Um, we don't we don't really know where this goes does mm -hmm. right now cynics out touring they just toured south america they did a tour prior to that i believe i don't i think it might have been european tour or uk uh they're coming around the states with atheist on this dual thing that i've been talking to nick about for how long dude i'm like dude they're going like three months ago i think i started telling you yeah like, like, do, 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 do. Like, 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 like. don't tell anyone but um, Kel, you're the only guy I did tell, actually. Um, and I didn't tell anyone. You didn't tell anyone. That's true. I don't even know if I told you, Jimmy. I think I told you. No, you told me. 
But uh, yeah, not way back. <laughs> did I tell you? Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, Kelly's like, don't tell anyone. Okay, I won't tell anyone. Just but I didn't tell him. I, I this dude and this dude, and that's it. No, I think you guys were the only two that I told. Um, maybe Rick, probably Rick, <laughs> but yeah, maybe Brian. Yeah, who knows about 14 other people? <laughs> I'm kidding, but yeah, man. So, you know, I don't know whether I'll be here in July to be very blunt with you, but I say that a lot, but things are not, not going well. But I'm curious to know. You know, this looks to be a pretty big thing. And then they're going to Prague Power in September. They're doing a big 30th anniversary, I think, of Focus, because that's coming out in July. They're doing Refocused. It's going to be a remix, remastering. And from what I understand, it's fucking killer. I heard one track. It sounded pretty amazing. Um, clearly, they're doing this big tour. And I think they're doing more tour dates than after Prague Power with, I believe, Atheists. What are your thoughts on the continuation of a cynic without Sean Reiner and without Sean Malone at this point as far as recording and touring? And any anyone? Give me that's you. I, I mean oh. I, I think I think uh you know I I don't know, man. I mean, like, hey, he proved a lot with the Ascension Codes. It's a great record. I mean, uh, I think if if he, I trust that Paul, you know, if he feels that it it's worth continuing and that there's more to say there with new musicians, then I'm totally open to it. But at the same time, I'm also quite content if this is the end. You know, I mean, uh, I, I I I'm putting my trust in in Paul Masvidal. In deciding what to do, and I'll go with whatever he decides. I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm very, and, and this is, you know, coming from somebody that is hard pressed to see a cynic without Malone and Reiner, but we've got it, you know. And uh, I don't know how much input Malone had on writing this record, or, or um, I'm not really sure what Masvidal would go on to do if he didn't keep doing cynic. Um, I don't really expect him to do another band in the vein of cynic, so it's hard to say. But um, I, I'm I'm putting myself in a position that I trust whatever he decides to do, uh, and I'll I'll open my heart to whatever it is. Yeah, I think. And if, and if it's the end, then I'm you know like I I got a fucking tabletop for this show coming in Denver, you know, for me and my wife and some friends, because I just went all out saying, look, if this is it, you know. What do you mean? What do you mean tabletop? What's happening? Well, I got I, I bought like the you know the 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 like the VIP table, like, oh, he did. and you, you know, yeah, just, oh, wow. yeah, I don't usually do Is that. that a meet and greet? Are they doing mean? I don't think they're, no, doing no, it's just, it's just, it's just the seats are really, really great. How and, many uh, times have you seen them? Eh, four, four or five. Have you, have you like met that. any of them? Yes. I've met both Paul and Sean. Okay. You uh, talked to them? Yeah. I talked to both of them for like, I've yeah. got pictures with both of them. Uh, they were amazing. Uh, and Nick, you've seen him or you haven't seen him? I've seen him once, and that was a tour with uh, BT Bam, Devin Townsend, and Scale oh, yeah. the Summit was the opening right. band. Right. Summit was the opening. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they, they were they were killer too. That whole show was spellbound. But Cynic yeah. was my big highlight. Yeah, like, somehow I've I've missed them, and I'm not sure how or why, but it just has happened every time. So, what are your thoughts on continuation or no? I'm I'm kind of in the same boat as Jimmy here. Like, all right. If, if this is the close of the chapter right here, I think they closed it well. And, you know, they made an album that definitely honors, you know, both the Sean's in terms of just making a cynic album that just kind of recaptures a lot of the sound and even adds some stuff to it. Um, at, at the same time, I mean, like if, if Paul chooses, he could keep the cynic name and keep going with it. I mean, it's, an established brand it has a loyal rabid fan base and <laughs> like it's connected to a lot of people like i mean that, that's probably kind of like part of the esoteric goal or whatnot to connect people with music and sound and cynic has definitely done that at the same time paul could just you know call it paul masvidal something or other you know kind of like what devin townsend does and i'm i'm a hundred percent sure this fan's gonna flock to it it's you know he i think he's gonna make music regardless right because that's that's what he does and he does it so damn well and he has carved out a like unique niche in music for what he does 
So regardless of what you call it, I, I think he's going to continue on. And, you know, uh, maybe without the cynic banner underneath it, it kind of frees him up to experiment even more. But, you know, with it, there, there's, you know, um, a certain amount of like respect and love that just comes with it because this band is, again, just carved out a unique fan base. Like, you know, the, the people that I know that are fans of Cynic are probably as rabid as us. You know, we, we talk about this band passionately for a reason because, you know, there's a ton of prog bands out there, but, you know, this band kind of just connects in such a different way just because it's unique. They, they really are kind of a standalone in terms of their style. Uh, regardless of what they do, I'm, I'm, I'm there for the ride. I'll, I'll, buy, I'll buy the shit. I'll go see them live. You know, uh, I, I, I see no reason to, you know, abandon this band if they don't call themselves cynic, if they call themselves a totally different name, I just want to hear the music. Like, yeah, you know, that that's the main thing. And I think, I, I think he's going to continue. I don't, I, like I said, I don't, I don't know if it's going to be cynic or just Paul, but I think it's going to continue. And I think that's the main point. And I think, you know, uh, I mean, I'm with Jimmy. If it closes here, he's he's closed on a high point. You know, that's honestly what you want to do with a career. Like, yep. you know, don't end on a low point. Like, yeah, I shit the bed on this one. I just want to quit. He didn't. He, he he made a fucking marvelous album, and yeah, if, if that's it, I'm I'm cool with it. You know, I'll still be bummed because that's me, but I know he'll continue on because I think Paul just again wants to make good music. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Well, you know, I think we're all in the same boat here. I uh, I almost feel like a, a bit of an imposter fan because, you know, I didn't really follow the last two albums that much. I didn't really know Kindly Bent or Ascension until the last couple of days. So it kind of makes, that kind of makes me sort of like, a, you know, a cynic fan light, I guess. But um, what I hear here is, what I hear in these albums, what I hear with this band, and Paul is clearly a driving force in this, um, is something truly unique. Um, no, no offense to Max Phelps, Max, if you're watching, love you, buddy. But exist probably wouldn't exist. <laughs> See what I did there? Without <laughs> the influence of, of Focus and Trace and Air, um, and and anybody that doesn't know exist. You really ought to get on that shit now. Go get Ego East. Great Cut. band. The new album is coming. Looking uh, forward to that. Their, their final mixes, I think, just went down, and Max said he is super stoked. I just talked to him the other day via Instagram. Um, and they still retain a little bit more of the death edge because you've got the harsher vocals in there, but you've got the insane playing. And, uh, just, just, just get on the exist existence. Yeah, that last one was fucking great. Fucking phenomenal. Um yeah, Paul is the last man standing and Paul, you know, if I was the last man standing and Cynic was my brand but also my life's work, there's no way I would just stop because as a creative person you generally can't stop, right? You you can't. Um we do it even as just this little Nietzsche thing that we're doing with the videos and the reviews and things like that. It's kind of like this imperative, this biological imperative where, you know, you, you got to do something. Now, some of us like me uh, and Nick have more time on our hands because, you know, my, me because of my health situation, Nick, because he's just got the opportunity to do that. And a lunatic, so, you can say that too. What's that? <laughs> a lunatic, you can a say lunatic, that. Yeah, too. you're a little bit loonier than I am, actually. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I wear out a little bit quicker than you, but I got the excuse. Um, yeah, we do this thing because even if, you know, the other night I was, I did a Miles Davis thing, a live thing, and I was kind of a little pissed because it was Mother's Day and hardly anybody showed up. And I'm like, why the fuck am I doing this? Nobody cares about this. And then I laid back and I was like, well, you care about it. So just keep doing it until you can't. And that's kind of like like that. I think that's what I think is going to happen with Paul. He's going to do <clears throat> what he has to do. Yeah, he could become, you know, the Masvidalian or whatever. I mean, he could do whatever he wants to do. But 
I'd be surprised if he doesn't do another Cynic album with, um, damn it, what's his name again? Matt? Yeah, oh, Matt, Matt Lynch. Lynch. Yeah, with Matt and maybe, I get where you guys are coming from on, on the bass thing, but, and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of basses out there that would be more than happy to uh, take that spot. Um, and so maybe that happens. But uh, this last album is truly breathtaking at times. It really is. And as I said, it feels like a nice warm hug when you're listening to it. You, you missed that part, Nick. Um, you know, it's you glacially, it in the comments. Well, it's glacially cold. I, I, yeah, but I'm the one that said it. Nate, Nate, Nate said he felt the same way. Uh, it's glacially cold from the outside, you know, big picture, right? Then when you kind of move in on it and you dig down into it, it's just like this nice, it's like that feeling you get when you pull a blanket out of the dryer and it's, you're cold or you're a little cool and you throw that thing on and you're like, oh, I just want this to stay like this forever, you know? It's kind of like that. And um, yeah, I hope there's, I hope there's, there's more like this because this this hits a sweet spot for me this album and you know just just an amazing man i'm glad jimmy kind of you know brought this up a while back and and we we skirted around it for a while and the main reason i skirted around it was because i hadn't really listened to him in a long time and i felt like all right man you're kind of an imposter fan here you know what i mean um because i don't own anything but this i only own focus that's I kind of should just see myself out right now. I mean, I think, I think Nuno only owns three, so you know. Minimum three, own ownership of three albums. Out, out you go. Uh, <laughs> but you get an OG one. You get an OG. I do one. have an OG. I do have an OG. Yeah, it's kind of cool too because it's got the DDD signature, like digital, digital, digital. Remember when <laughs> they used to be like a. They put the little boxes, AAD, like analog yeah. recording, analog mixing, digital, you know, mastering. This is a DDD 93. <clears throat> um, yeah, man. Well, first of all, I want to thank both you guys. Thank John for me for coming in when he did. I felt Will bad do. for him because he kept having to apologize. Said, oh, I'm not prepared. Man. Yeah, well, a deer. Shit happens. Shit happens. <laughs> um, anybody that's thinking about getting into Cynic, stop thinking. Just do it. Um, is there a good place to start? I'd start at Focus and or and or Trace and Trace, go back yeah. or forth, mm -hmm. you know, wherever you go. Um, I'm gonna tell you if you're coming here as a death metal fan, you're gonna kind of be disappointed because they're not really yeah, you can go to the demos, but you're you're gonna be disappointed overall because they're not a death metal band. Uh, they came from the death metal sphere of influence but they're just not there's something much more elevated and i don't mean that as a criticism of the death metal bands but as many said what other band could you kind of put on the same plate with them maybe atheist but not really you know atheist is their own little thing too surprisingly they have a little bit more akin in relationship to some of the real death metal bands down there but even atheist just doesn't sound like all those other bands and again well, that's, that's not a that's not a cut on those bands it's just that's an interesting band. thing because like you know the, you said that jeff like I, I i'm not really seeing a lot of new bands like doing like or trying to do you know be the new cynic or whatever maybe i'm you know i mean there's definitely a lot of bands that take a lot of influence like you know especially in death metal i mean or you know technical or progressive death metal or taking nods from cynic but i don't really see anybody like trying to be like the you know, the next really, except, you know, I mean, exist, you know, things like that. But I mean, like, it's not like it's a, it's like a burgeoning, like a sub genre or anything like that. You know what I mean? Well, are you talking about for Cynic, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, do you know Alkaloid? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, Alkaloid, Alkaloid has that. Well, that's my point. Like there's, there's death metal or, or like, you know, technical death metal bands that take a lot of influence from Cynic. Yeah. But and my point is, is that, like, I don't see like the next like burgeoning Cynic. Oh yeah. no, 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 you know what I mean? Like, um, uh, exist, uh, exist would be about as close yeah. as it gets to me. Um, I mean, mostly I hear that, like in terms of like, like telltale cynic sound, I hear a lot of like cool, like proggy, 
death metal with a lot of fretless bass out there, like Void Ceremony. Yeah. I hear like you know Sean Malone's influence on bass playing and prog, you know, like progressive death metal a lot. Right. But in terms of like the the whole encompassing sound, like yeah, you get moments here and there, and you know uh, certain bands. I think you know again uh, Beyond Creation is is definitely one. You get moments, but it's not the entire sound. Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. It's not like there's a movement of like, you know, bands that are trying to like do cynic, but there aren't like emulate, emulate. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like that are just like trying to do like a more just a prog ethereal kind of thing. Like, they're, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I think, yeah. I think to some degree that's because a lot of that's locked in Masvidal's head and was in Reiner's head. And that's, you know, that is a challenge though. You know, I, I, I personally think. Paul's got more of Ascension code in him. In other words, I think there's more to come. But Paul's never been one to just be a rinse and repeat sort of artist where every two years, got to put a new album. You know, it's more like the Gorguts thing where it's like, you know, how long has it been since Colored Sands? Fuck, 10 years, right? Yeah. God. Was that yeah. long ago? Betty's Dust was 2016, yeah. I'm so, sure. you know, it's taken... As Luke said in the interview, you know, he's not moved by, he's moved by the create creative process, not by the, he never made any money in death metal. He didn't, you know, none of these guys do. I'm sure Paul makes some money when they go on tour. They make money. Of course they make probably pretty good money. Right. But it's um, not constant, but, it, but it's not, it's not you too money, man. It's not fucking, you know, God smack money, that kind of shit where they're playing arenas. They'll never play arenas. But and I'm thankful for that in a weird way. Not for his sake, but for our sake. I mean, if I get to see them in soundstage in July seventh, I'm gonna be fucking hopefully I'm walking and, <clears throat> but I'll be like giddy as fuck to do that, you know. I mean, but it's just uh it's sad that I haven't seen them. It's like crazy. You know, or atheist either. I never saw atheist either. That's you know. It's just how it worked out. Never saw death either. Did you hear you guys see death? You saw no. it, right? I thought I you did. Neither of you? Saw death at all. I, I had the opportunity to see death, and I fucking missed it. It was death and Hammerfall. It was probably the last tour they did. Like the, yeah. One of the last tours they did in the States. And I, I was, fuck, dude. I was living in Mississippi, and they played back in New Orleans, and I could have fucking made it. And I just, I fucking slept on it. And That's, that's one of those bands... You know, along with probably my top three misses, and two of them I'm never going to get to do is ch is Chuck Death, right? Okay, and David Bowie I'm never going to get to see, and I'm never going to get to see Queen with yeah. Freddie Mercury. You know, those are three huge fucking misses, and I had opportunities for both Bowie and Queen. Death I I never knew about them till after. Not Chuck. Well, wait a minute. When did Chuck die? Two thousand one. One, yeah. So I didn't really know about Chuck. I knew about the band, but I didn't know about the band until Chuck was gone, you know, which is sad. So, yeah, I think it was like 99 or 2000 when I had the opportunity to see yeah. him. But you'd been young, man. How, you'd been pretty young. Yeah. I mean, that'd have been early 20s, whatever, yeah. you know. I mean, but like when I, when I grew up in New Orleans, like a lot of the, a lot of the tours didn't come to New Orleans, you know, like they really? actually came. Yeah. There was one club in that, that had the occasional death metal show. And we had to drive to Houston to go see shows, which oh, was like a five hour wow. drive yeah. because for whatever reason, they just didn't come to New Orleans, you know, like every now yeah. and then you get some Slayer didn't even play in New Orleans until like 98 for the first time. Wow. Ever. It's just like, yeah. I mean, but, seems uh, crazy. You'd think they would, but you know, I know Houston, they get a lot of the big acts. It's just a weird the way they, they book stuff. Like New Orleans is kind of like this jazz music town and like, they just never like, they didn't yeah, have the like, big clubs that, had, or mm -hmm. there wasn't really a big enough scene. Even though, like the, you know, the New Orleans scene, like the bands, you know, like Soylent and you know Crowbar and all these things. I mean, there was a lot of classic bands that came from there, but it just for whatever reason, it was just weird how it worked out. They didn't have, you know, the the you know the the backing to have like all those tours come through there, you know. But Frederick. Death are not thrashy enough for you, sir. They're just not. I know you. You're, oh, no, like, come on. Scrim Bloody Gore is kind of thrashy. All right, a little bit. He'd be like, Frederick would go to the show and say, anything past, anything past leprosy. No, mate. I'm not down with it. 
All right, man. Well, okay. So um, uh, King Igor says, I think it's cool there's no bass on AC. The synths are – yeah, the synths are amazing, man. The synths on that album are, like Nick said, yeah. just, just you're, they're immersive. They're immersive. You feel like you're inside swimming in it, you know. Um, very cool. So, well, listen, I want to thank everybody that popped in tonight. Um, Nick, we're, we're going to get to the death thing soon. Uh, where are we at? Oh, nice. By the way, I wanted to say one quick thing. It is the 18th, right? Yeah, yeah. it's the 18th. Do you know what today is? Uh, the 18th of May. Yes. 20, what happened 20. on the 18th of May six years ago? Hmm. It was warm? Chris, Chris Cornell hung himself. Oh, oh Jesus, right. man. Really? It was that long? Shit. Yeah, and I gotta say, that's the first time I I broke down. I broke down and cried. Yeah, about two days, two days afterward, it hit me fucking hard, man. Like hard, like because I, I met Chris once and it was super cool, and I saw them way back on the Loud Love tour and a couple of, on the Super Unknown, and I think Chris is one of the greatest singers. This planet will ever ever hear yes. in the story sure. one, of the, one of the greatest songwriters ever um yeah it's fucking today it's i remember that. hearing the, it happened in detroit yeah like, that's right about an hour away from from where i am um yes so chris man we miss you dude you were a fucking legend you are a legend lane too i don't want to minimize lane and you know kurt I, I don't kurt's way back when was that 94 was it right 94 yeah i think that's right man the road is littered by a lot of a lot of fallen heroes that's for sure yeah, man andrew wood you know there's so no, many no. dude so many uh so rip sean and sean you guys are dearly missed and you guys were stellar fucking musicians and uh Paul, I'm, I want you to keep going, man. I mean, if you put out something as good as this last album, then it's I know you got a lot more goodness inside of you. We're there. I'll pre-order it right now. Oh, yeah, I will too. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I know you both would. Yeah, that that's cool. Uh, uh, Jimmy, you have all vinyl for everything then, or no? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, this is, I mean, this is like, you know, top five band for me, you know? So top five bands, I have all the vinyl, you know? I mean, top uh, five to ten bands or whatever. Yeah, speaking of know. top five bands. Plus, it's not like a crazy discography, you know. No, like, you're right. Uh, yeah. Like I, yeah. These are easy to kind of own. <laughs> not excessive. I got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. We got to talk to Serbs and figure out a day for Alcest. Um, I thought you wanted to do it next uh, Wednesday. I th I, did I say that, man? Because I'm getting a little yeah. bit confused. Yeah, I thought Let you said you wanted to do next Wednesday. or. Yeah, I think we Ooh. talked about it. Let me double check with Serge. Let me see what I can do because I, I do need – today's what? Thursday. I got to get – I got an interview tonight. I forgot about this. Interview tonight at 7 p.m. my time with um, ALN. I know his first name, but I'm not allowed to say it. Uh, ALN from Mismore is coming on. Oh, cool. cool. Yeah, and he um, – very cool. We're going to talk about some cool stuff. He and I have some parallel – things that we've experienced in life that aren't pleasant that a lot of people are probably not real comfortable talking about when we're going to talk about it. Um, cool. And uh, so, yeah, real quick, tomorrow, tonight, 7 p.m. is ALN from Mismore. Friday, I was going to do the, the Jethro Tull thing. That may still happen, but it might not. But that's only a, a half-hour thing with the first four uh, book box sets. Everyone hears me talk about these. These are the book box sets. They're like a book but it's a box. Oh, cool. so, yeah. cool. uh, we're going to talk about these because they're fucking amazing. Value for money if you're into Jethro Tull. We're going to talk about the first four. That may happen tomorrow night. Uh, Saturday, 3 p.m. my time, Eastern. Daniel Mensch, sound sonic manipulator. Um, we're going to talk Sunday, I think 7.30 or 8.30. One of the two. I didn't look it up. Uh, Hawkwind, first 10 albums. And then Monday, Andrew Lyles at I two or wait, no at noon. 
Andrew Lyle's uh, interview. Uh, again, sonnet manipulator, sound experimenter. So those are the things upcoming. And then Jimmy says, uh, maybe Al says next Wednesday. Wednesday. I think I can yeah, do that. We'll talk about it. Yeah. How many yeah. albums? Uh, what, five, six, six albums? I think. Six, I think. Yeah. No, EP, no EPs? No, well, there's you know, there's the first EP, and then there's six albums, I think. So we should be able to do that one relatively quickly. But honestly, man, if, if you can't make it next Wednesday, we'll you know see what uh, happens. Let me, let me see where I'm at. and Because um, I, I got a lot of Hawkwind to listen to and prepping for those three interviews. Yeah, so we'll just see. let me know. And then last two things then would be the death stream, which is formulating – it's it's i've got it in my cauldron it's brewing up um and that is the 27th i believe it's 7 p.m and then the 30th tuesday i think uh boards of canada that's the plan those are the plans we'll see what happens got a couple other people i've got feelers out too for interviews we'll see if they happen or not but um you guys want to pimp anything real quick um i think i <clears throat> pimped everything i had to pimp in the beginning okay yeah jimmy too. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, go watch, go watch Jimmy's uh, Scottish Highland Adventure, man. I'm gonna it's, check that out. It is so cool. ruins in Scotland. I hope you guys enjoy it, man. I yeah, it's so cool, man. It. So, yeah, it's it's cool. I hope you. Yeah, it's, it's, it was music, a lot of fun to shoot. And, yeah, the music really, really fits a lot of the. the yeah, I, I don't get to put a lot of videos out too often, you know, because like that's kind of just the way my channel is. Like it's you know it's outdoors oriented, so I only get to do it you know, sparingly. So when I do, yeah, when I do put a video out, it's, it's to, to me, it's, it's very meaningful to get something out there for people to see. So, you know, if, if you dig it, I hope you, I hope you do. So, um, you going back to MDF, Jimmy, I don't know. Are you guys going? Uh, I, I want to go. Tickets. Oh, I, I just, I, I really want to go. So we'll see. Um, yeah. And we got some time. Yeah, so who's, like, uh, who's headlining it? I mean, they got bloodbath and dismember and that was enough for me, but I mean, yeah, uh, Wait, this member's in? Yeah, this member's yeah. in. Yeah, they're oh, yeah, they, yeah, Vomitory, uh, Gorguts. Yeah, Gorguts. Gorguts. What uh, is this? What is it? Uh, next year, Memorial Day oh, weekend. it's next May. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Ar Arturus, Ahab. Yeah, uh, you know me. I can't even yeah. I can't even think beyond June, to be honest with you right yeah. now. Um, I'll yeah, let man, you know, no, for sure. I was thinking one other last thing. Maybe if we do, Al says, maybe we... Take it over to your channel. Promote Maybe. it on mine, but do one on yours that a little something a little different. Maybe we'll think that over. We'll, we'll kick it around. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Um, yeah, for sure. I'm gonna jump, guys. I, yep. I gotta. Get I'm gonna up early do the work, thing but, too. Uh, you guys rule, man. Thank you so much for doing the Seneca yeah. deep dive. I think this was uh, really important, meaningful. So uh, oh, yeah, is, and we had uh, we had over 20 people at one point. That's pretty cool for as late as we yeah, started on our heat night. Yeah. yeah. I love you guys, man. Thanks so All much. Right, for this. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks for everybody, everybody for watching. watching. Peace We're, out, everyone. Uh, check it out. Peace. All right, hang on. Oh, oh okay. Good.